successful in producing marvels of unity and shape, Armstrong, Morton, Basie, the Mesrobish Aladni or Pickup Band. The classicism which business thus imposed on jazz had its advantages, for recent LPS show that jazz players, when left to themselves, are often tempted to run on especially on instruments which lend themselves to continuous monologues, like the saxophone. Still, whatever the advantages and disadvantages of the three-minute straight jacket and Ellington for one never felt quite happy in it it illustrates the musical repercussions of purely technological or business considerations. The more general effects of the structure of the jazz business on the music are less easily described. The simplest way to tackle them is to consider aspects of jazz, the problem of musical education, the problem of style and repertoire, and the problem of musical creation. The jazz business deals in the distribution of an available product, musicians. It does not deal in their production. Like all show business, it has always assumed that saleable players will just appear on the scene. Nothing like the conservatoire, or the classical ballet school, has ever existed in jazz. Musicians have got their elementary education in playing instruments wherever they found it and their secondary and higher education by playing with other musicians. The production of a steady supply of first-class and fully mature players therefore depends on the existence of commercial bands which also happen to be sound educational institutions. Consider the career of a jazz man of universally acknowledged finish the sort of man whom any band leader is prepared to hire, who can be relied on to turn out an admirable mixture of technique and feeling with any combination, or on any session, the trombonist Vic Dickinson, not a genius but the type of player without whom jazz could no more flourish than the theater could flourish without the first-rate character actor. He was born in 1906, began to play commercially at the age of 16, and got his education in the bands of Zack White, Blanche Calloway, and Benny Moten and Claude Hopkins. In the 40s he established himself as a highly individual talent, and he has since been the foundation stone of a wide stylistic variety of small combinations, studio bands, and superb recordings, and is equally admired by players of all schools. Let us consider, on the other hand, the young European player who came up exclusively through the jazz movement and the young American player who is arriving today. The young European, if he entered music after say 1945, very likely played exclusively for a specialized jazz public and with specialist revivalist or traditional bands composed of other youngsters like himself, who had learned their music from records, older players, who were normally forced to go into ordinary commercial pre-war dance bands, generally received a much better technical training. He would rarely be forced to play alongside musicians who, though less learned about King Oliver, were technically far in advance of the amateurs. He would escape both the grind and the educational value of sight reading, rehearsals, and the varied routine of dance band playing. There is no doubt whatever that a number of talented European players have developed more slowly, and in some cases more one-sidedly, than they might have done, for want of such professionalism. The young American player of today suffers in a rather different way from the temporary eclipse of the large band which, in the later 1920s and 1930s, was the chief musical school of jazz. There, and there alone, could men learn that extraordinary capacity which makes a band like Count Basie's produce so dynamic a sound, that which enables a man not simply to be carried by the rhythm of the rhythm instruments, but to swing individually and in sections. For, leaving aside traditionalist jazz, which is virtually defunct in its homeland, small group work or jam sessions are what emerges from jazz education, if they educate the player at all, it is only at the highest and most sophisticated level. He must be good already if he is to become better by small group work. Mr. Norman Granz, from whom I take some of these reflections, goes so far as to think that no player born after 1940 is likely to be fully educated for this reason. I do not think such pessimism is warranted. Big bands may come back, or other forms of training may evolve but it is clear that the supply of first-rate musicians must depend on what are essentially commercial phenomena. The problem of style, repertoire, and creation can be discussed together. Here the essential point is that good jazz requires an audience which does not get in the way of the players too much. 
if players and public are naturally at one, as in the classic days of New Orleans, there is no problem. If they are not, then the players perform best when providing for the minimum needs of the public dancing, background noise, atmosphere while enjoying themselves or experimenting in their own way. This was relatively easy when commercial pop music was the main burden they had to carry. Today, however, a commercial public has grown up which requires jazz as jazz, and as we have seen, this provides for the player's livelihood. They are obliged to play in particular styles even if they may want to play differently. They are besieged with demands for request numbers and therefore forced to repeat, time and again, a limited group of standards until they are sick of them, when the saints go marching in, trouble in mind, or the buckets got a hole in it among the revivalists, Cherokee, how high the moon, body, and soul among the modernists. There is not much to be said in favor of the routine pop ballad, but it does change all the time. Miserable though the Tin Pan Alley repertoire is, it does at least confront the musician with a constantly new set of challenges, themes which he ought to turn into something interesting and from among which, perhaps, he can select one or two which lend themselves to a more lasting process of transformation. A jazz style and a jazz repertoire imposed by a would-be expert public is as constricting to the musician as an exclusive insistence on Grieg and Tchaikovsky is to classical orchestras. What is worse, the jazz public insists, against all logic, on the impossible achievement of spontaneous creation to order. Every jazz musician is forced to become a sort of knightly poet laureate, who guarantees a supply of odes on fixed dates and occasions. It is no use pointing out that the phrase concert jam session is a contradiction in terms, that the safest way to turn creation into routine is to announce that it will take place every evening between 8 and 12 in a particular cellar. In itself this would not be serious, for it is fairly easy for musicians to dress up routine as spontaneous creation, especially with a little loud blowing and hard drumming in small enclosed spaces. The musicians might well do so, and then go away, as they have long done, and jam for their own pleasure in some after-hours night spot. And yet the very devaluation of creation and improvisation which the rise of the specialist jazz public has imposed in working hours risks devaluing it outside. Musicians may lose interest in it, and flee into carefully rehearsed and arranged jazz, which has its own merits, as many tend to do. Or else they may carry the routine tricks of working hours into the times when they really feel like improvising, or ought to improvise. The growing flood of jazz which has actually to be performed and recorded to meet the existing demand merely intensifies these problems, particularly on record. After all, the entire output of Louis Armstrong's Hot 5 and Hot 7, which produced a score of masterpieces, consists of 60 sides on a dozen or so sessions spread over four years. In a single year 50 tracks made by Armstrong in 1955 were released in Britain. Point seven. Mr. Ruby Braff, a good trumpeter, produced at least 40 tracks between March and October 1955. I do not claim that such overproduction produces bad jazz. Good professionals can be relied upon to produce a good average level. But a good average level by musicians playing a good solid routine is merely the bread and butter of jazz. And by the very nature of their changing music, jazz players depend, much more than straight ones, on the chicken in the sandwich, the mood, the inspiration, the combination of circumstances which turn routine into joy. These remarks are not intended to arouse alarm and despondency, but merely to show that the musical character and prospects of jazz cannot be divorced from its character and prospects as a business. If jazz were ever to be standardized into purely composed and executed forms, when it would cease to be jazz as we know it, it might avoid these difficulties. It might then have no more troubles than the symphony orchestra, which, like the licensed Ford dealer, sells a known and branded commodity for which a permanent and relatively unchanging demand exists. The repertoire which fills halls may be rather more limited, the versions which appeal to the public a shade more florid than musicians might like, but within those limits they play what they consider good music. But the jazz group cannot afford to become a dealer in standardized commodities, partly because its commodity, creating music while it plays, dies once it is standardized, 
partly because the music itself constantly changes and evolves. The jazz player, if he has any sense, is reconciled to playing standardized stuff most of the time, for that is his business as a professional entertainer, and if he is sensible, he will also enjoy performing as the actor does, though he is less completely dependent on the audience. But he has also generally had a large free margin inside and out of hours when he could play as he pleased. Within that margin he could be overheard by the public, with luck, though he was not performing or only half performing for it. It is the gradual conquest of this margin by the jazz business, by you and me, the jazz public, which has led him into a quandary in the past 20 years. He has not escaped from it yet. Part 4 People 9. The Musicians Jazz is what its musicians and singers make it. The player is the center of its world. We must therefore try to discover what sort of man, or more rarely woman, the jazz artist is. This is in some respects easy, in others difficult. No aspect of jazz is better documented than its biography. There are, at a guess, biographical data of perhaps two or three thousand musicians, singers, and other jazz entertainers in print somewhere or other. However, though these list the musical careers of their subjects in considerable detail, supplemented by the fantastically laborious and scholarly discographies, they neglect other aspects of their lives almost totally. Unless we know a musician personally we rarely even know whether he was married or when, and whether he has or had children. The biographical information about the social origins of musicians is as casual and unsystematic as the information about their geographical origin is meticulous. Nevertheless, we know enough to reconstruct the portrait of both black and white musicians pretty well, even in the more obscure phases of jazz. The two must be kept apart, although the jazz musician has developed a common pattern of personality, which does not depend on his skin, for the social origins of white and black artists are very different, at least in the earlier phases of jazz, and so is the part they play in their respective communities. Louis Armstrong, like Joe Louis or Sugar Ray Robinson, can become the symbol and hero of all Harlem. No white jazz musician has ever become the symbol and hero of more than a minority of young rebels. Let us consider the black musician first. The obvious and dominant fact about the earliest jazz is that it was a poor man's music, and a music of the undeserving and unrespectable poor at that. At the turn of the century a respectable black preacher's family in the South, like that of W.C. Handy's father, was at least as shocked at the idea that its son should become a musician as a lower middle class or middle class white family. In the southern countryside as well as in the towns perhaps more than in the towns the line between godly and worldly music was as sharp as in Calvinist Dumfriesshire. The godly man sang gospel songs, and put away Satan's tunes like the blues with horror and disgust. When John and Alan Lomax collected their folk songs in the southern penitentiaries they had the utmost difficult in persuading former worldlings who had become heartshell Baptists or Pentecostal holiness people to dig out their morally tainted musical past. That the modern jazz lover has made both work songs and spirituals into part of the jazz repertoire is one of the many ironies of our subject, but one not shared by devout artists like Miss Mahalia Jackson, who has steadfastly refused, through the years, to sing for anything but the glory of the Lord, or in company with reprobate music. Naturally the barriers against jazz were less high among blacks than among whites. Beside the overwhelming barrier of color in a country of racial discrimination, all others seem small and surmountable, the ghetto breeds its own internal fluidity, as well as its own compartments. Moreover, there have been up to the present so few ways in which American blacks might rise in wealth, achievement, and social status, that even a very plebeian one like jazz was not to be neglected, all the more so as it is a known fact that the world of entertainment for the poor is much more egalitarian than the culture of the rich. Today, at a time when mixed bands under a black leader are a commonplace in jazz, there is hardly yet a single black conductor of an American symphony orchestra or leader of a chamber music ensemble, and few black symphonic players. It is therefore natural that, from the beginning, some middle-class blacks enter jazz. Indeed, among the musicians for whom a musical training, 
or general education, or simply an initial degree of relative self-confidence are important assets composers, arrangers, band leaders the middle class black played a disproportionately large part almost from the beginning. Most of the leading jazz composer arrangers Handy, Carter, Morton, Redman, Ellington, S.Y. Oliver and many of the leaders of the famous early large black bands Fletcher Henderson, Ellington, Redman, Lunsford, Count Basie are or were of middle class origins. This is in marked contrast to the leaders of the famous large white jazz or semi-jazz bands, who are mainly of relatively much lower social standing, like the Dorsey brothers, who came from the Pennsylvania mines, Ben Pollock and Benny Goodman, who came from the Chicago Hull House Slum Settlement School, Harry James, who came from Circus Life, Glenn Miller, Woody Herman, Ted Lewis, Paul Whiteman. The white equivalents of Ellington or Henderson had other careers open to them than band leading. But on the whole the early jazz was poor men's music, or the music of traditional show folk, whose social standing was not much above vagabonds. Admittedly even among the black poor there are distinctions. The instrumental players other than guitarists and pianists were perhaps not of quite such humble social origins as the blues singers and players, who clearly represent the most pauperized, oppressed, and vagrant segment of the black people. A footloose rural guitar picker like Lead Belly, in and out of jail, was despised, if only as a hayseed, even by the poorest street musicians of New Orleans. The blind man at the corner singing the Bale Street Blues or the boys who led him along southern roads, like the now famous Josh White, the itinerant barroom pianists with flamboyant nicknames like Pine Top Smith, Speckled Red, Cripple Clarence Lofton, or Little Brother, were on the margins of even black society. It is no accident that the first blues player and singer whom W.C. Handy heard in 1903 was a lean, loose-jointed Negro, who, had commenced plunking a guitar beside me while I slept. His clothes were in rags, his feet peeped out of his shoes. As he played, he pressed a knife on the strings of the guitar in a manner popularized by Hawaiian guitarists who used steel bars. Nor is it an accident that the man sang about. Go and wear the southern cross the yellow dog. I.e. to Moorhead, miss, where the southern and Yazoo Delta railroads cross, where the penitentiary lay, which the singer probably knew from inside. Handy was later to make one of the classics of jazz, the yellow dog blues, out of this memory. The women singers, though their musical status was to be much higher than the men's, came from comparable social depths. If they came from show folk families, like Ma Rainey, Ethel Waters, and Billie Holiday, they were lucky. Few great artists have come from such appalling slum poverty as the great Bessie Smith, and the social status, and perhaps the original profession, of many blues singers is indicated by the nickname of Bertha Chippy Hill, for a chippy is a prostitute. Except for the peculiar group of New Orleans Creoles, the instrumental musicians came from equally modest social backgrounds. The gens de couleur were bricklayers and carpenters and cigar makers and plasterers. Some had little businesses on their own coal and wood and vegetable stores one i.e. they were skilled workers and petty artisans, at least until they became full-time professionals. Alphonse Picow, clarinet, was the son of a cigar maker, apprentice to a tinsmith and later a joiner. Barney Bigard, clarinet, began with cigar making and engraving. Sidney Bechet knew enough to open a tailor's shop during the slump. But the Creoles, former free men depressed into the ranks of the laborers and immigrants by segregation, were a unique local group, and even in New Orleans those who got their non-musical living driving a coal cart, like Louis Armstrong, or working on the docks, like George Lewis, were at least as numerous as the Creole musicians, though less articulate outside New Orleans those of unskilled status were the vast majority. At all events, the original jazz players belonged to the working class which, since blacks are largely confined to laboring jobs, meant the unskilled. When they lost their jobs or fell out of fashion, they would naturally drop back into the characteristic occupations of the working class black. Papa Mutt Carey would become a postman and porter in California, Albert Nicholas would work on the New York subway and in the post office, Natty Dominique as an airport red cap, 
King Oliver as a pool room attendant, Bunk Johnson, an uptown man, the poorer and less respected blacks lived uptown, returned to the country and the sugar cane. They were working men and aware of it, for, as Johnny St. Cyr, Banjo, put it, a jazz musician have to be a working class man, out in the open all the time, healthy and strong. That's what's wrong today, these new guys haven't got the force. They don't like to play all night, they don't think they can play unless they're loaded. But a working man have the power to play hot, whiskey, or no whiskey. You see, the average working man is very musical. Playing music for him is just relaxing. He get as much kick out of playing as other folks get out of dancing point too. Perhaps St. Sears is an idealized picture of the old days of transition to professionalism, even in New Orleans, but the social situation it paints is clear. The artists sprung from the unskilled poor, and playing for the poor is in a peculiar social position. In the world from which he comes and in which he works entertainment, which means any personal talent, or gift sold for the public to watch, hear, or otherwise enjoy, from one's body to one's soul, is not merely a way of earning a living, but far and away the most important way of making one's individual path in the world, rivaled only by crime and polities, with religion, of the type evolved by poor men for themselves, trailing a little behind. It is essential to remember this. The star musician, dancer, singer, comedian, boxer, or bullfighter is not merely a success among this sporting or artist public, but the potential first citizen of his community or his people. A Caruso among the poor of Naples, a Marie Lloyd in the East End, a Gracie Fields in Rochdale, a Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, or Sugar Ray in Harlem, a Louis Armstrong occupy a position far more eminent among their people than a Picasso or Fontaine in Orthodox society. Among oppressed people such as blacks and gypsies, the entertainer is often the only member of his group who wins fame outside the race. Even at a less exalted level, the moderately successful entertainer is one of the rare men or women who can escape the curse of poverty and endless unskilled drudgery, if only for a time. For the recipes for getting on which have built respectable Western society since Calvin, thrift, hard work, systematic education, and the life, are not much good to those who genuinely start from bedrock, with no assets but talent, energy, strength, or looks. Every investigation into the social origins of the rich, of business and public executives, or men and women of high intellectual achievements, demonstrates the extraordinary disadvantage at which the genuinely unskilled and illiterate are. In the arts alone can they compete on equal, perhaps on superior terms, for just as the best fighter is a hungry fighter, so the best entertainer is the one for whom his art is the only possible way out of squalor and oppression into relative freedom. But for the poor the arts mean commercial entertainment, and commercial entertainment in the 19th and early 20th centuries meant work in one or other of those semi-ghettos which all great cities develop as entertainment districts, and where music halls, brothels, nightclubs, saloons, boxers' gymnasiums, variety agencies and their denizens rubbed shoulders, on Bale Street in Memphis, on 7th Avenue or Lenox in Harlem, 12th and 18th Streets in Kansas City, from Montmartre to the boulevards in Paris, behind the Parallelo in Barcelona, and so on. The jazz musician was therefore potentially a king or duke, but his Versailles was on the place Pigalle, his subjects lived in the slums, and his rival potentates or peers were, black, gangsters and crooked politicians, professional gamblers and fighters, fancy women, and occasionally great preachers, lay or religious. He was, of course, a professional and a craftsman, and as we have seen, his professionalism and craftsmanship were by far the most important factors in his life, though even they necessarily threw him into the company of the others who worked by night and slept or relaxed by day, and thus separated him from the ordinary citizen. But his mode of behavior was at least equally determined by his social origins and his social role in the community of the poor, or more precisely, of the laborers and subproletarians of the slums over whom they reigned. For instance, if he was often bohemian in his ways, it was not on the pattern of the standard bohemia of the 19th century arts, 
which is at bottom the scale of values of the lower middle class turned inside out, but on the pattern of the unskilled laborer magnified. He did not have the 19th century bohemian's horror of respectable manual work. When Sidney Bechet, the great reed man was broke in the 30s, he started his tailor's shop, and Tommy Ladnier, whose trumpet could suggest more blues with a single note than any other, shine the shoes of the customers. He did not react against the values of clerks and shopkeepers by neglecting himself or dressing sloppily. On the contrary, he was an enthusiastic and flamboyant dresser, regarding his dress as a symbol of wealth and social status, like the cowboy, the navvy, the sailor, and other casual but occasionally flush laborers. If he was a free spender it was for the same reason casual earnings breed casual spending and because his social standing in his world depended on behaving like a king. If he developed the over life-size gestures and habits of the superman the limitless appetite for women and whiskey, the passions and capriciousness of the prima donna, who has herself, as a type, sprung from a similar social milieu, it was not only because to the successful New Orleans trumpeter or classic blues singer or dancer all the whiskey and all the women, or, if she was a woman, all the men, were freely available, but because he had to live up to his part. For the star was what every slum child and drudge might become, the king or queen of the poor, because the poor person writ large. We see him first, surrounded by legendary mist, as Buddy Bolden, the demon barber of Franklin Street, the blackest of black men, as the tale goes, a pure negro, for darkness means low status, even among blacks, who found his cornet on the street. We hear him knocking with his trumpet on the floor of the odd fellow's hall to give the beat, holding it up, pausing to be sure of his embouchure, and leading his band into the wonderful blues of the poorest of poor prostitutes, make me a pallet on your floor, while the audience yelled out, Oh, Mr. Bolden, note the mister, play it for us, oh buddy, play it, three in the legend he played so loudly that on some nights you could hear his horn ten mile away. He could not read a note of music, and the women fought for the privilege of carrying his cornet. He was crazy for wine and women and vice versa. At the age of 29 he went mad, and lived the rest of his life, until 1931, in a lunatic asylum with dementia precox. We see him again, in the classical version of the over life-size music hall star, as Fats Waller, the pianist who started the day with eight fingers of whiskey and threw his fantastic talent to the winds. I've seen Fats Waller enter a place, says Louis Armstrong, and all the people in the joint, I mean the place, would rave, and you could see a gladness in their faces, for he would compose the best part of a musical show while the girls were rehearsing their dance routine, meanwhile bubbling over with so many stories and funny remarks that those girls could hardly hoof it for laughing, a volcano, all right, alone in his class. He earned millions and threw them away, he kept broke because he was always bawling and having a good time and just didn't care. Point five. He laughed and cried louder than anyone, he drank and made love more, he slept less, he was fatter, he welched on more advances and played more trashy music better than anyone. He died at the age of 39 in 1943, at the peak of his career. Last, but most important, he did not in the early stages share the most striking characteristic of the orthodox 19th century artist, the contempt for his public. His model was not Rambo but Marie Lloyd or Johann Strauss. The frontier between the hip people and the squares, though there is no evidence that these terms were used in New Orleans times, did not run between the artist and the chosen few who could dig him on one side, the idiots, and the bourgeois on the other. It ran between the artist and his public, the outcast community of the undeserving poor on one side, and the respectable world on the other. It was the line which, in the 1890s, divided the music hall artists, the guards, the prostitutes, and the enthusiasts from the blue-nosed, teetotal, nonconformist spoil sports of the London County Council who wanted to license the halls and get the girls out of the Empire Promenade. Why indeed should the artist feel misunderstood? True, the public did not appreciate the technical achievements of the musician and, I dare say, then as now tended to applaud loudness or emotion rather than musicianship. But they liked the music, 
they danced to it like mad, and there were always plenty of them, from the girls in the honky-tonks after business was over to the audiences in the black theaters, to sway and cry at the blues. When geniuses like Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith were spontaneously recognized as the king of trumpeters and the empress of the blues by the applause of the public and the sales charts of record companies, there was no strong reason for the artist to feel isolated, except from the respectable world in which official cultural reputations were made. But about this many of them had not heard, or did not care. The divorce between the jazz musician and the public probably began in the later 1920s. At any rate, there are clear signs that from about 1927 the straight old music lost its power to draw, even the black papers began to hint that jazz was on its way out. This change of taste, which has been more fully discussed above, no doubt hit the traditional artists hardest, Bessie Smith drank harder than ever, and supplemented her old-fashioned blues more and more widely with pornography, but even this could not stop her disappearance from the recordings and her miserable decline to the southern backwoods shows where she had once started. Nothing went right for the great King Oliver after 1928, and his simple goodness and modest Christian resignation Oliver was that rare phenomenon, a pioneer jazz player who was also a copybook citizen only make the story of his last ten years more pathetic. It would be doctrinaire to argue that the new styles now demanded even by the black public were not jazz, even though they were quite certainly much more influenced by the standards of white commercial entertainment, and it would be simply untrue to argue that most musicians minded very much what they played, so long as it swung and gave them the chance to blow out. Plenty of jazz players continued to feel at ease in their world, even when resigning themselves to a more modest place within it. The kings of New Orleans might be cornet players, the queens of Nashville or Atlanta blues singers, but the kings of the northern black ghettos, with their more sophisticated tastes, were more likely to be music hall dancers like Buck and Bubbles or Bojangles Bill Robinson, boxing champions, or, if musicians, band leaders. The street had given way to the stage. But the musician's world was changed. To succeed under the new conditions he had to be a music hall personality, like Louis Armstrong and Fats Waller, to have a gimmick like the frenetic Cab Galloway with his nonsense vocals, and even in the ordinary bands he needed far better technical equipment and musical knowledge than before, equipment and knowledge only a tiny fraction of which would be appreciated by the public. And so some players the less adaptable ones entered an empty world, where only their own kind appreciated them, and the others played for a public whose applause was largely irrelevant. The musician began to be alone with his music. It is significant that, whereas the kings of the pioneer instrumental jazz got their crowns by public acclamation, Coleman Hawkins, whose supremacy on the tenor sax was virtually unchallenged among musicians from his first appearance in the early 20s for more than a decade, never led a band until 1939, and indeed found it preferable to earn his living in England and Holland for the best part of the 30s. The top player was increasingly a musician's musician, or a star only for the selected and untypical public of true jazz fans. Jazz lived and flourished best no longer where it was acclaimed, but where it was tolerated and left alone, as in the speakeasies and nightclubs of Kansas City. As for the old-style musician, only in the holes and corners of the South, or in the poorest northern slums, where, as on the Chicago South Side, the immigrants congregated, could he hope to get by. A good deal of jazz thus tended to become a musician's music, and the jazz player to be even more closely confined to a special social and intellectual world. Such was his situation when white intellectuals in the 30s discovered that jazz was intellectually reputable, and when, thanks largely to their systematic championship, it became widely popular among the whites as well as among its old black public. At this point we must consider a factor in the black jazz musician's life which has steadily grown in conscious importance, race relations. No bar of black jazz has ever made sense to those who do not understand the blacks' reaction to oppression. But, as we have seen, most of the pioneer jazz musicians did not protest openly against their condition Handy and Armstrong could write or sing about darkies, pickaninnies, and coal black mammies as if they did not realize that these are insults and fighting words to the self-conscious black. Rarely did they kick against the pricks, 
they did not compete with the Ophis. That an Al Jolson should earn a great deal more than a Bessie Smith even at her peak was as much in the nature of things as that black artists playing the South should accept discrimination. At most a proud man like Fats Waller, whose limousine was persistently sabotaged, would refuse to go on with the tour until his booker hired him a private railway coach, but even he did not refuse to play the zone. A generation brought up in the northern ghettos, a couple of decades playing in the north and west, and the marvelous political awakening of all the oppressed and underprivileged in Roosevelt's America, put a new tone into the jazz musician's instrument, open resentment. Every line of the autobiography of the old-timer, W.C. Handy, radiated modest optimism and the conviction of gradual progress. At the New York World's Fair, 1939-40, I saw, in small degree, a fulfillment of no excellence without great labor. There, on the American Common, tablets were erected containing the names of 600 men and women selected from all races who had contributed in some degree to American culture, and among those names I saw mine.6. But the new northern or assimilated generations, those who had flowed north in their millions from 1916 on, and their children, were less contented. They had not escaped discrimination, though they had lost the stable, settled, certain community life of the South, for which even some of the most militant hankered, Big Bill Brunsey, the blues singer, claims to have gone back to his patch of land in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, after every trip north to record or perform. And the inequality they knew was, for the musician, twice as unbearable as in the past, because they now knew that their music, black men's music, was not simply entertainment, but serious art, many whites believing, correctly, that it was the most original and important contribution of America to world music. Jazz, as we have seen, had always attracted a small quota of middle class and intellectual black players, but with one major exception, Duke Ellington, they had played or arranged the music as it came, and tried neither to intellectualize nor to turn it into art music, i.e. to compete with white music. But from the late 30s the black jazz musician became increasingly ambitious, both to establish his superiority over the white musician, as it were officially, and to raise the status of his music by competing with white music on its own ground of elaborate and sophisticated structure and theoretical as well as practical expertise. Jazz did not, indeed, begin to attract young black intellectuals as such in any numbers until the new and ambitious versions of the music had already established themselves. The modern jazz quartet, for instance, three of whose members clearly belong to the black elite, John Lewis, Anthropology and Music at University of New Mexico, Milt Jackson, Music at Michigan State, Percy Heath, Fighter Pilot and Granoff School of Music, Philadelphia, contains no player whose career began earlier than the last war years. Nevertheless, the urge to intellectualize and turn jazz into an avant-garde art music is clear from the end of the 30s. The motives for this urge may best be explained in the words of the anonymous and intellectual California musician reported by J. E. Barron 7. You see we need music, we've always needed a music our own. We have nothing else. Our writers write like the whites, our painters paint like them, our philosophers think like them. Only our musicians don't play like the whites. So we created a music for ourselves. When we had it the old type of jazz the whites came, and they liked it and imitated it. Pretty soon it was no longer our music. No Negro can play New Orleans jazz today with a conscience. A few old ones still do, but no colored man listens to them. They might just play it for the whites. Even though the experts have proved that there's no blacker music. You see, as soon as we have a music, the white man comes and imitates it. We've now had jazz for 50 years, and in all those 50 years there has been not a single white man, perhaps leaving aside Bix, who has had an idea. Only the colored men have ideas. But if you see who's got the famous names, they're all white. What can we do? We must go on inventing something new all the time. When we have it, the whites will take it from us, and we have to start all over again. It is as though we were being hunted. 
such black racialism was not necessarily the only political attitude of the revolutionary young players, but it illustrates the rather emotional and primitive general resentment which almost certainly prevailed among them over more mature and sophisticated views. Very few black jazz artists in and after the 1930s were associated with the labor and communist movements, but even among those few I can think of no pioneers of modern jazz. However, it is possible that some of these may have played, among other symbols of rebellion, with the orthodox left-wing ones. Indeed, I suspect that left-wing politics got among the highly specialized and insulated group of black musicians, especially outside New York, mainly through their contact with the strongly progressive band of jazz enthusiasts and critics, and these, as we shall see in the chapter on the jazz public, were markedly out of sympathy with the new musical developments. However, it is important to remember that the new developments of jazz, however abstract and formal at first sight, expressed a political attitude. The very slogan Art for Art's Sake, or, as the pioneer revolutionary, John Burke's Gillespie said, I play for musicians, must be translated, at least some of the time, into some such terms as, jazz is an art music, not just entertainment, and as Negroes we demand attention for it as such. The new intellectualism of jazzmen found expression in a variety of ways, some of them surprising. For instance, the fashionable costume of the new player was no longer simply a variant of the full dress regalia of the laborer's king who is in the money, but a derivation from the dress of 19th century Parisian bohemian intellectuals. Heavily rimmed glasses, even when not needed, a goatee, a beret, perhaps a long cigarette holder or meerschaum pipe were the uniform of the bopper in the middle 1940s. Carelessness and sloppiness in dress the true bop follower often systematically avoided pressing his suits became fashionable. Point eight. Reading and orthodox culture had never been essential qualifications of the jazz player, but in the new era it became a distinct asset to be able to say, like Thelonious Sphere Monk, a particularly characteristic pioneer of the new music, that we liked Ravel, Stravinsky, Debussy, Prokofiev, Schoenberg, and maybe we were a little influenced by them. Point nine. This is the generation of players that started buying Dallas when in funds, and around which talk of psychoanalysis and existentialism flows. The rebellion against the inferiority of the black and the traditional forms of jazz expression which were identified with it, Uncle Tom music, is equally evident in the behavior of the new players. Among some especially the latest, most intellectualized generation which has emerged sign 1950 it took the form of a deliberate turning away from the simple extrovert noises, the spontaneous emotions of the traditional musician, and the instruments that had always carried them. Trumpets were played as though they were flutes, drums were reduced to a whisper, wind instruments were sometimes eliminated entirely. Groups like the modern jazz quartet, reacting against the old ways by anti-bohemianism, appear on the stage in faultless morning or evening dress, bowing stiffly and with expressionless faces to applause. Not to play like a music hall act and a clown, not to behave even off stage like the old style player who looks for a nightclub and some whiskey and a chick, and a band to sit in with, as soon as he comes off the job, such is their ambition. An even more obvious form of revolt against inferiority, which a leading group of the new players shared with other northern big city blacks, was mass conversion to Mohammedanism. The new music was played, among others, by Abdullah Ibn Buena, Art Blakey, the drummer, Saib Shahab, Edmund Gregory, Alto, Abdul Hamid, McKinley Durham, trumpet, tenor, Liaquat Ali Salam, Kenny Clark, drums, Ibrahim Ibn Ismail, Walter Bishop J.R., Piano, and other sons of the Prophet, though most of the actual founders have done little more than put on an occasional turban. The new Muslim studied the Quran in translation, tried to learn Arabic, and propagated the faith. It would be easy, but wrong, to make fun of such gestures of revolt. The best judgment on them is contained in a small dialogue between Dizzy Gillespie and the arranger Gil Fuller, who watched one such band of Muslim boppers break rehearsal to bow towards Mecca. Dizzy's eyes filled with tears. They've been hurt, he explained, and they're trying to get away from it. 
it's the last resort of guys who don't know which way to turn, said Fuller impatiently. East, said Dizzy. They turn East Point 10. The attitude of the new musicians, as well as their music, thus expressed the peculiar ambiguities of this generation of black intellectual rebellion. It was political, but expressed itself in abstraction and formalism. It was black, but expressed itself at least partly in the adoption of the patterns and clichés, the modes of orthodox, i.e. white, culture, a fact which made the task of the jazz man twice as difficult. The new musician and the new music thus paradoxically undermine the racialism they intended to propagate. It is black, and desperately anxious to compete with the whites as black music, the respectable ambition of the modern jazz musician is no longer simply to be accepted as a man who plays Bach, or as a composer of classical music, but as a man who plays a music which is as complex as Bach but based on a specifically black foundation, the blues. At the same time his rebellion even when he attempts to sidestep this effect by a flight into Mohammedanism or some other non-white culture takes him farther away from the specifically black musical idiom of the old jazz, and from the cultural situation of the old jazzman which, though not particularly determined by skin color, was sharply distinct from orthodox and respectable culture. His paradox is that, though he wishes to be a much more conscious and complete challenger of white cultural supremacy than his predecessors, his very challenge assimilates him to the white pattern. The jazz man of New Orleans, or even of Kansas City, represented a form of art, a way of the creative artist, a pattern of relations between art and society, which were as different from that of the orthodox world of symphonies, chamber music, and opera as the Byzantine painter and mosaicist is from the world of the Venice Biennale, or the heroic bard from the modern novelist. The modern jazzman represents the same type of minority avant-garde music as his white equivalents in Paris or New York. He differs from them only as, say, the non-representationalist differs from the expressionist painter. Hence the modern jazzman is rapidly evolving into a figure familiar to anyone who follows the history of 20th century Western arts. His blackness, i.e. the special traditions of the culturally unorthodox world from which he has sprung, becomes increasingly irrelevant. With one exception. The new type of avant-garde jazzman may evolve into another version of the modern Western intellectual, but he had evolved out of the old self-made, outcast, entertainer. The startling fact about the modern movement is that all its pioneers are or were jazzmen of the old plebeian type. Dizzy Gillespie, born 1917, is one of nine children of a bricklayer from a hole in South Carolina, who came up through the ordinary jazz band world. Charlie Parker, 1920-55, was a slum child from Kansas City. Kenny Clark, Art Blakey, Max Roach, Chico Hamilton, the drummers, born 1914, 1919, 1925, 1921 respectively, learned their music as it came. Charlie Christian, 1919-42, who revolutionized the guitar, Fats Navarro, 1923-50, the trumpeter, were just provincial players who came up somewhere in Oklahoma and Florida. No doubt some of them had a better education, including musical training, than the men of Armstrong's generation, but they can in no sense be regarded as people who owe anything substantial to conservatories or to the advantages of a black middle class background, or even since their music repelled most jazz intellectuals to outside influences. It was among such players that the musical and social revolution of the jazz musician began round about 1941-2. If we are to understand it, we must look at another characteristic phenomenon of the northern black generations, the hipster, whose evolution is intertwined with that of the modern jazzman. There is by now a good deal of literature about the hipster, most of which reads like a psychoanalyst's case diagnoses, and for a good reason 11 because the hipsters do not explain themselves, and show the world only their symptoms, which have to be interpreted. But the hipster is there all right. He began to appear at the central metropolitan street corners of northern ghettos between the wars, though it is not impossible that he existed in embryo in Harlem even earlier. At any rate, he does not belong to the South. He can, I dare say, 
still be seen in the American black equivalents of Soho and Saint Germain de Prez, dressed in whatever is the uniform of his fraternity before the vogue of the bopper's costume it used to be the zoot suit, with its epaulette shoulders, its frock coat hanging almost to the pavement, and its peg-bottom trousers. He wore, and perhaps still wears, his face like a mask, for ostensible emotion was taboo. He talked jive talk which nobody ought to understand. He lived for kicks jazz, sex, marijuana, or any other stimulants that were going. He was not like other people, the squares. He was beyond the law, beyond human emotion, beyond ambition and money, beyond good and evil, he was against the white and black status quo the Uncle Tom's but he did not know what he was for. We are today fairly familiar with the hipster's type of negative, emotional, anarchic revolt, older generations have watched it among the young post-war generations in a number of countries, since the existentialists of the post-liberation left bank in Paris gave it its first orthodox habitation and name. Their American white equivalents, as Norman Mailer has correctly pointed out, have actually borrowed their idiom from the black hipster, in Greenwich Village a menage a trois was completed the bohemian and the juvenile delinquent came face to face with the negro, and the white hipster was a fact in American life. The international symbols of this revolt, like the late film star James Dean, are familiar to all. But in spite of this convergence, the original Harlem hipster was not, like the lost generation of Saint Germain de Prez, a derivation from orthodox upper-class culture, such as is still oddly reflected in the Edwardian Toffs outfit of English working-class teddy boys, or the pseudo-art school styles of East End working-class girls, but a specialized development of the ghetto of laborers and outcasts. The Harlem hipster functioned in some respects like the jazz player. His social origins were certainly similar, he owed nothing to education or orthodox cultural influence. He was, Mez Mezro is almost certainly right on this point, the would-be smart and able youngster with ambitions, keyed up with the effort to see and hear everything all at once, because that's how bottom dogs ought to be unless they want to get lost in the shuffle 12 his chief achievement, Jive talk for talk was the hipster's only triumph is a continuous, ever-renewed virtuoso collective improvisation which depends on talent, on speed, on imagination, and a sort of primitive verbal. Bravura. Nobody ought to be able to talk jive talk, even if he learned all yesterday's or even today's jive vocabulary by heart, just as nobody is able to play like Armstrong or Charlie Parker even with the most painstaking imitation. For the hipster sophistication and lightning speed on the uptake were everything. His expression, as has been said, was the physiognomy of a studentess. Whoever needed the faintest explanation of even the most cryptic gesture or statement was by definition a square. Like bop jazz, only in verbal terms, jive talk was a set of variations on themes and rhythms unstated, because assumed. Just so the Max Roach Quintet call their derivation from the well-known song All the Things You Are, Prince Albert. Anyone who does not know that the theme played is derived from the harmonies of the, unnamed, All the Things You Are is a musical square. Mesro is almost certainly right in believing that hipsterdom represented a more urgent, aggressive, and higher ambition than anything in the Old South, quite apart from the passionate effort to show that they're not the unsprained, stuttering, tongue-tied sambos of the blackface vaudeville routines, the lazy bones of the comic strips, the old Moses of the Southern Plantation.13 In his way, the hipster aspired to the white man's status as a professional, an intellectual, in fact to just those achievements which are almost beyond the longest reach of the ghetto boy without money or skill, with a caricature of schooling, without a background or even a tradition that such ambitions are desirable. That is perhaps why the only people who have come close to realizing the hipster's ambition in their own field are the jazz musicians. And that is probably why the ambition of the ordinary hipster, who is far more often a man without career or achievement, turns from breaking out of inferiority into contracting out of it. At all events the hipster described in the post-1945 years is not the same man as the one whose fraternal order Mez Mesro joined around 1930. He is the collective outsider. He does not live in this world, but escapes from it into a world of bop music, which the square cannot understand, and pot, marijuana, 
of kicks sensations which the square cannot feel. He may earn his living as a petty criminal, a hobo, a roustabout, or a freelance moving man, it does not matter how, for the hipster, whose very essence in Mesro's description was action, no longer acts, but simply exists. Even his one triumph, jive talk, seems to have contracted into a featureless, simplified vocabulary of monosyllables, grunts, and tacit gestures, which serves almost exclusively to differentiate him from the square. Only two things remain of his former self, a total refusal to conform to the squares and a savage integrity about his own standards and the things he likes. No doubt there are other elements in the hipster's makeup also, on which the more psychologically minded literature has dwelt. In a way the ambitious slum youngster of the second generation of northern black immigrants is doubly rootless, having lost the subordinate, but fairly obvious, place of the New Orleans slum boy in his community. The obvious, uniformed cohesion of the hipster against the squares is certainly in part due to the desire to be in some community, if only that of those without social roots. The observers who note that the hipster classifies what other people would call good as solid or in there, i.e. somewhere, and an undesirable state as nowhere, may have a point. For in a sense he is nowhere socially or as an individual. If he will succeed, he is nowhere yet, if he fails, or gives up the struggle, he remains nowhere, except in the private world of drugs, or sex, or some other subjective sensation. It is easy to see how the young revolutionary musicians fit into the general scene of hipsterdom, for the hipster is just such a homegrown ghetto intellectual or artist as they, only less successful. The modes of behavior of the revolutionaries, deliberately shocking not only to non-musicians but even to older musicians, were those of the hipster, for instance, the refusal to abide by the old established code of manners which obliges the soloist who is about to finish his chorus to nod to the next man to give him his cue, the apparent boredom with which the most radical musical innovations were played, the habit of playing with one's back to the audience, shuffling on stage any time and off stage without a look at the end of a solo. If the old player's ideal had been social, the new ones now modeled themselves on the Rambos and Modiglianis of orthodox art, or more exactly, they reproduced their ways independently. They doped heavily, to the disgust of the older men, for whom whiskey, women, and an occasional stick of tea were all that a decent musician needed. There is little doubt though again it would be invidious to name names, even those which have come before police courts that drug addiction was much more widespread among the modernists than among any previous group of jazz players. There are life histories among them, such as that of the earliest and greatest of the moderns, and perhaps the only genius among them, Charlie Yardbird Parker, which have the horrifying, helpless inevitability of the lone wolves of modern romantic culture. There was no more pleasure or success in the life of Parker than in that of Van Gogh, even though his talent was much more rapidly appreciated. There was merely the total inability to get on any terms with the world, and the compulsion to play what must be played in the face of the world. The artist has become the wild beast, who is by definition caged wherever he is, for every conceivable society must be a prison for him. Since those early days of the jazz revolution the harshest outlines of revolt have been a little softened, though no doubt somewhere there are still young players who see themselves jazzwise in the same defiant and partly self-pitying terms as each new avant-garde of orthodox artists. Dizzy Gillespie now undertakes official cultural missions for the U.S. government. J.J. Johnson, the trombonist, is a long way from the days from 1952 to 1954 when he had to earn his living as a blueprint inspector, occasionally gigging in his spare time. The modern jazz quartet was reviewed by a classical music critic for the Sunday Times and aroused violent controversy among the readers of The Observer. In fact, it has taken the jazz revolutionaries a great deal less time to win orthodox recognition than it ever took a Benny Carter or a Dickie Wells to get accepted as a serious artist outside a tiny circle of unknown enthusiasts. And yet, the revolution cannot be undone. The young jazz musician today is socially and individually a different person from the Armstrongs and Bessie Smiths, and even from the Fats Wallers and Lionel Hamptons of the past. The white musician in America need not be discussed at such length. 
In a sense, he has practically from the start been the outsider type, playing a music which he knew to be misunderstood by the public. When will we ever be able to earn our living playing hot, asked Frank Teshimacher, the famous Chicago clarinetist. The question was rhetorical. Teshimacher and his friends knew perfectly well from the moment that they began to imitate the black players that this kind of music was not saleable to the white dancing public for jazz in the 1920s. The most they could hope to do with it was to play a few college dances where some of the students might be for it, to play the kind of nightclubs or halls where the manager and the public didn't mind what the noise was, so long as it was loud, and to make an occasional record. If they wanted to earn their living by music, at least after 1927 to 8 or so, they had to play in sweet or pop bands. The uncompromising white musician thus faced the problem of the misunderstood and isolated artist from the beginning, indeed, who knows how many of them had not chosen to play jazz just because it was their private paradise, which neither fathers nor square friends could share, a protest against the old generation, against the 150 percenter Americanism of the lush decade before 1929. Howard Becker the sociologist has described a group of such young white jazz musicians in the Chicago of the cool era, but the description, with a few changes, could stand for the 1920s also, they were sons of good middle-class Americans. They protested, totally and absolutely, against all aspects of the American way of life, by playing their jazz, by frequenting only musicians and nightclub girls, by wolfing existentialist or other guaranteed anti-bourgeois philosophers. Point 14 No generation of white jazz players since the start, with the possible exception of the poor New Orleans whites who simply played the New Orleans way and thought no more about it, has been without such a contingent of rebels. And none has been without its quota of self-lacerating and doomed romantic artists, drinking themselves quietly into an early death, survived only by their records. Big Speederbeck, the greatest of white jazz men, was such a one in the 1920s, and has even stimulated his novel, Dorothy Baker's Young Man with a Horn. Bunny Berrigan, another trumpeter, paralleled him in the 30s. One lasted 29 years, the other 33. The classical white jazz man, a pocket Hemingway or Scott Fitzgerald, equally suspended between the whiskey bottle, the wisecrack, and the jam session, was a refugee from the bourgeois world. However, there was also the non-classical white jazz man, whose situation was much more like that of the black musician. He was an entertainer or popular music player by trade, and not primarily a crusader or a deliberate castaway. This was certainly the position of most of the original white New Orleans players, the majority of whom came from social strata like the Sicilian immigrants, whose social position in the hierarchy of the Old South was not a great deal higher than the blacks, at any rate they were also sometimes lynched wingy Manon, for instance, a slum child from New Orleans, and near neighbor of the young Armstrong, played music like Armstrong, worked the habitual circuits of the small-time Delta. Musician Louisiana, Texas, the Middle Mississippi Valley, later Chicago, New York, and the West Coast and earned his living as a comedy personality as much as by his trumpet. Southern or Northern, the genuine professional musician type seems to have lacked something of the hunted purism of the refugee jazz man. George Brunies, for instance, an excellent New Orleans trombonist, seems to have been quite happy in his birth with the terrible band of Ted Lewis from 1923 to 1935, and did not feel his jazz status was jeopardized by lying down on his back with another musician on his stomach, while he operated a trombone slide with his feet. Ray Bottock, drums, another white New Orleans player of professional stock, seems to have been content to earn his living solidly in three main jobs from 1926 to 1942, with little of that frantic freelance gigging and vagabondage through ephemeral combinations which was so characteristic of the classic purist. However, as we have seen, Chapter 8, the economy of the jazz business is such that a great deal of casual work is inevitable, whatever the tastes or compulsions of musicians, and post-New Orleans white pros, especially those who got their start in the wild 1920s, when jobs were never short, have often had a varied and casual career. In Europe, where no musician could earn even pocket money, 
let alone a living, by playing jazz until the rise of a specific jazz public in the 1930s and 40s, the ordinary professional dance band or variety musician formed an even more important component of jazz. Socially, in Britain at least, he came from either musical or show business families, or more usually from a working class background, with the usual admixture of bohemian ex clerks or students. The working class background was inevitably strong, since the most obvious school in which the musician learned his trade was one which, both as a professional military and as an amateur civilian institution, has long been part of the British working class, especially the skilled part, the brass band. Point 15 That is why we frequently find such dance band musicians as did not turn professional immediately in characteristic proletarian professions like printing, factory work, engineering, as toolmakers' apprentices, in cotton mills, as professional footballers, and the like, and why we find many even among those who started as clerks mostly, one would guess, the sons of working class fathers beginning their careers in brass bands. Point 16. These men were not necessarily jazz players, though they were the most likely to come into contact with jazz, through touring players and singers, through the jazz influence in the pop music they had to play. Or because the work of dance musicians is so boring that they were quite likely to seize upon jazz as a creative relief from routine. The few early players who came straight to rigorous jazz had naturally to fit into this milieu, since it was the only one in which they could make a living by playing their music at least sometimes. The dance band profession was thus the earliest nursery of European jazz, and patronized it even while it remained commercial. Thus Jack Hilton's band, which has had a poor press among the aficionados, because its claim to play jazz in the 1920s and early 30s rightly irritates the purists, not only provided a refuge for several jazzmen of stature, but actually did its best to encourage them whenever possible, e.g. by hiring Philippe Brun the trumpeter, André Akayan the saxophonist, two uncompromising French performers, and the great Coleman Hawkins. Henry Hall, of the BBC band, hired Benny Carter, the American star, to arrange for him. The dance band profession, in fact, made possible what jazz there was in Britain at least until the middle 30s and provided its first fifth column within commercial music. Since the end of the 30s, the rise of the specialized jazz public has produced a new kind of white musician, the amateur jazz enthusiast, who has, in the nature of things, often turned into the professional player. Since this type of player shares his origins and approach to jazz with the non-playing aficionado, he can be conveniently discussed in the chapter on the jazz public. Whatever the character of the white jazz players, one thing has always until recently at least separated them from the black ones, their freedom of movement. The blacks could not leave. Playing music, for self-educated players, playing their kind of music, or some other form of entertainment were their only ways of earning a living unless they wanted to be unskilled laborers, and their only way of making a way in the world. For most of jazz history the black men, who found jazz jobs hard to get, had not the choice of joining a radio station staff band or a classical orchestra, or working as a staff composer or arranger in films or on the air, or simply settling down to sell insurance or to journalism or business, like those middle-aged Chicago and former jazz players who still meet annually, as sons of Bix, to commemorate the idol of their youth. The color bar stopped them. Most of them could not even retire into ordinary, prosperous pop bands to bands like Whiteman's, Roger Wolf Kong's, or Ted Lewis's for the black equivalents to the big white pop enterprises were fewer, much less prosperous, and very much less stable. The black musician was therefore obliged to stick to his music, which was his only prop. Perhaps this helps to account for his superiority in execution and in ideas over the white. Four white musicians had ideas. The group of white New York players who recorded in the later 20s, with or without the addition of brilliant Midwesterners like Big Speederbeck, shows signs of anticipating many of the musical ideas of modern jazz 15 years before the blacks, but it did not develop them. For what happened? Mip Mole, the trombonist, went into commercial bands and radio, where he played mainly classical music for a decade. Eddie Lang, the guitarist, 
went to Hollywood to make a film about Paul Whiteman and then became Bing Crosby's accompanist. Frank Trumbauer, the saxophonist, stayed with Whiteman from 1927 to 1936 and eventually left music altogether for the Civil Aeronautics Administration. And so on. They were good jazz men, but they did not have the hard compulsion to express themselves and to win their place in the world through developing their jazz, and only through it, which drove the Charlie Parkers, the Gillespies, and the Thelonious Monks. Only those who were congenitally and implacably anti-commercial had this compulsion. But was it, in their case, always a compulsion to make music, or merely one to break away, to recapture their youthful paradise on Lake Michigan, to live the bohemian life of the anti-bourgeois? Perhaps both. But many of those whose compulsion was most clearly that of the dedicated creative musician have died, like Bix, or Birigan, or Lang, or Teshimacher. Such are the forces which have made jazz musicians what they are. For they do not start as men of a special type. There are certain kinds of human activity, such as a facility for lightning calculation, which are very unevenly distributed by nature, to all intents and purposes either you have them or you have not. But the gift of expressing oneself through music is not among these. As Johnny St. Cyr said, you see, the average working man is very musical. Naturally the gap between the best jazz musicians and the worst is immense, and there are very few of the best, but until it was turned into a self-conscious art music which requires preliminary expertise, jazz was better suited than any other 20th century art to give artistic expression to the ordinary man, and especially, in the blues, the ordinary woman. Everyone has something to say, as the makers of films with non-professional actors discovered. Jazz which grew up by completely adapting its technique to what ordinary people had to say, even to the point of allowing musical illiterates and those with a rather poor technique to make valid artistic creations, required less preliminary selection among its musicians than any other art. Perhaps it tended to attract those who were inarticulate in any other medium, including words, more than the others, for a man who can say what he wants in prose cannot get the extraordinary sense of happiness and release which comes from becoming eloquent with a trumpet or in a song. Louis Armstrong without his trumpet is a rather limited man, with it he speaks with the precision and compassion of the recording angel. The jazz musician was therefore, and still is to a large extent, nearer to the ordinary randomly chosen citizen than most other artists, and jazz has been able to draw upon a wider reservoir of potential artists than any other art in our century, in extreme cases, such as New Orleans, on virtually the whole of the population. Only his way of life has tended to set him apart, and has in turn tended to attract certain types of recruits whether those with a special vocation for music, or with a special taste for the milieu, or those who happen to find the trade particularly convenient. The frontiers of jazz have been open towards the world of the non-musician. This has been one of the causes of its strength and vigor. If it becomes increasingly like the other orthodox arts it is likely that these frontiers will be closed, their passage being allowed only to selected entrants. If this happens, the character of jazz will change fundamentally, though one would not like to guess in what way. 10. The public. Every jazz lover has two or three clear, old-fashioned, rose-tinted pictures in the family album of his hobby. One is of the classic New Orleans street parade, the musicians on their cart, cornet blazing, trombone sitting on the tailgate so that the slide moves freely, going to town as the basin street whores leave their cribs to listen, the kitchen mechanics come to the doors tapping and shaking, and the conjure women stop selling their spells. Another is of the dance hall somewhere across the tracks, black faces on snappily dressed bodies, and the throb of the horns over the drum. A third is the rent party in the slums of the Chicago South Side or Harlem, pig's feet, beer, whiskey, and the hypnotic rhythm of the piano. Give the piano player a drink because he's bringing me down. He's got rhythm, when he stomps his feet. He sends me right off to sleep. A fourth is certainly of the honky-tonk, a big man at the upright piano with a derby hat, men with drinks, girls and their pimps themselves, as like as not piano players or pool room sharks, or both and the cry, 
play that thing, Mr., oh, play that thing. When the words the jazz public are mentioned, it is images like these which come most naturally into the minds of the aficionados. Mistakenly so. For though it is true that the first and original public for jazz was of this kind, it is also, from our point of view, the least interesting. For jazz is peculiar in having acquired a secondary public far vaster than its primary one. It is rather like the city of Venice, in which the foreign visitors in any year now greatly outnumber the native Venetians. Naturally the relationship of the natives to their city is interesting, but it is much less odd, and for that reason much less puzzling, than the relationship of the outsiders who do not belong there but have taken it to their hearts. The vast majority of those who have enjoyed jazz since 1914 to 18, when it became a national American, and subsequently an international, phenomenon, were and are outsiders in one way or another. This applies less to American blacks and a section of Southern whites than to the rest of us, for, as we have seen, poor and uneducated blacks used a primitive or preparatory form of the jazz idiom in their normal folk music, secular or religious. Hardshell believers from the Carolinas, used to praising the Lord in their way, would find nothing strange in jazz. When James P. Johnson and Fats Waller and I would get a romp down shout going, says the famous Harlem pianist Willie the Lion Smith, that was playing Rocky just like the Baptist people sing. You don't play a chord to that you got to move it, and the piano players do the same thing in the churches, and there's ragtime in the preaching. Want to see a ring shout? Go out to the Convent Avenue Baptist Church any Sunday one. It was not jazz, but anyone who spoke this musical idiom would have as little trouble learning jazz as an East Anglian has in learning standard English. In a sense all first-generation urban blacks in the USA can be regarded as part of the primary public of jazz. For ideological reasons some of them notably the very religious or respectable might not like it, but it was their music nevertheless. The black public for jazz therefore presents us with a rather different problem from the white public, at least until it comes to contain a large percentage of second-generation urbanized blacks, or of blacks with social and cultural aspirations which make it look down on the old-fashioned idiom in which it has been brought up, or on the simple jazz which emerged directly out of this idiom. Not so the whites. In the cities of the North End, a fortiori, in those of Europe, jazz was a new language. It is pretty certain that it made its way first and foremost through the ballroom. Until the eve of the Second World War the pioneers of jazz among the secondary public had invariably been the dancers, and, as we have seen, the early history of jazz expansion can virtually be written in terms of the active and rhythmical dances to which it provided a uniquely suitable accompaniment. The cakewalk prepared the way for ragtime, the one steps, two steps, and fox trots for jazz. When Benny Goodman, the king of swing, tried to explain why his style of jazz became so popular, he naturally observed, it was a dancing audience that's why they went for it. Point to the true blue jazz lover, who looks down with contempt on commercial pop music, and would not dream of actually dancing to his favorite music unless his girl insisted on it and then only as a concession to cultural backwardness is a late phenomenon. As a type he has emerged out of the mass of swaying couples who did not look for creative art in the places where jazz was played, and whose main reason for liking jazz was that it was good to dance to. If we ask a middle-aged jazz lover how he came to like the music, we shall very likely get the answer this writer got from a Newcastle schoolmaster in his 40s, who has been an amateur since about 1930. You see, when I was young, I used to go out dancing a lot, and it got me interested in the music. Of all the dance music I heard, jazz seemed the liveliest, and the one with most to it. Then I started to buy records. For similar reasons the dance musicians themselves were drawn to pure jazz, even in countries such as Britain, where their native idiom was quite different, and where indeed a peculiarly formal and extremely popular dance style evolved in the pala which sprung up between the wars. Strict tempo dancing, the foundation of the mass ballroom vogue among the British working class, with its contests and championships, grew in a direction diametrically opposed to jazz. Yet when, in 1932, a knowledgeable British journalist wrote about the jazz public, 
he estimated no doubt with some exaggeration that 95% of it consisted of dance band musicians. For jazz was not merely good to dance to. Of the mass of commercial pop and dance music, whether or not it was colored by the jazz idiom, pure jazz was the most interesting to play or to listen to, the one least likely to Paul. A middle-aged jazz critic has recalled his school days in 1926-7, when he first acquired a taste for it. The father of one of the boys was a director of HMV, so we got all the new records as they came out. We played them over and over again, naturally. After a few months I found that I got bored with most of them, but the hot records stood up. That is how I first suspected there was something to jazz. The jazz fan emerged from the run of the popular music mill, because hot jazz itself emerged from the competition with ordinary semi-jazz dance music as something worth special attention. The jazz lover in the strict sense of the word thus emerged from the mass of the ordinary public for dance and pop music by a sort of natural selection, but he is no more like that public than men are like the apes from which they have evolved, a comparison which, though unfair, springs readily to the mind. As a type he has always and everywhere had clearly recognizable characteristics, the first of which is his stubborn refusal to be confused with the pop fan. He is passionately anti-commercial, to the point where the mere fact that an artist attracts the larger box office is often regarded as prima facie evidence of musical treason, or even where the musician who dresses properly for his stage appearance may get black looks from the more incorruptible fans. The fan is not normally happy except among initiates. To quote a characteristic passage from two of them. The collector, despite the revival of interest in jazz EJH can still take some solace from the fact that if you seriously ask the head clerk of any large record store, he will tell you that John Q. Public might be getting a little more hep, but there has been no sweeping change for the better the huge majority still come out starry-eyed for the latest Dinah Shore. The collector's clubhouse at the private country club is a lot more crowded than before but it still has a homely atmosphere my emphasis EJH.3. Perhaps for this reason the fan, even within jazz, has limited tastes. Middle age, history, and vested interest have by now created a certain number of Catholic or eclectic jazz lovers, but this does not come naturally. For the characteristic fan, jazz, like the ideal blood of an aristocratic family, is a sharply defined stream in constant danger of pollution from the muddy floods which surround it. What is jazz, is the single question which crops up most frequently in the discussions of the aficionados. It is neither pop music nor straight music. Normally it is not even everything which falls between these two territories, assuming the jazz fan to have defined their vague boundaries to his satisfaction. There is also a particular type of the true jazz which must be defended against its impure, or deviationist, or obsolete competitors. In the 1920s and early 1930s white jazz fought black jazz, in the middle and late 30s big band jazz also fought small combo jazz. Since the Second World War this civil war has become institutionalized in the battle between the traditionalists and the modernists, each camp also containing subcamps whose members have the firm conviction that most of their colleagues have sold the pass. The rights and wrongs of these discussions need not concern us here, they are not all stupid. It is their Calvinist spirit that counts, whether expressed in the sophisticated accents of the critics or the simple cries of treason by teenagers whose favorite jazz bands decide to play in a different style. Jazz, for the fan, is therefore not simply a music to be enjoyed as one enjoys apples, or drinks, or girls, but one to be studied and absorbed in a spirit of dedication. Jazz fans do not listen to their music to dance, and often avoid dancing, unless pressed into it by their girlfriends, whose approach to the music is normally more utilitarian. They stand or sit by the band stand, soaking in the music, nodding and smiling at one another in a conspiracy of appreciation, and tapping their feet unless the expression of any overt emotion is conventionally frowned on. In the peak days of the feud between ancients and moderns, a reliable way of telling one from the other in Anglo-Saxon countries was by the fact that the ancients favored a more Bacchic style of appreciation, while the moderns, imitating the avant-garde musicians, kept a dead face, however, 
among traditionalists the aficionados of the blues have always tended towards a rather church-like gravity. In Latin countries, and notably in France, the contrast was less, owing to the traditional enthusiasm of all local art lovers for demonstrating their cultural allegiance by breaking up the concerts of rival art lovers. Jazz, for the true fan, is not merely to be listened to, but to be analyzed, studied, and discussed. The quintessential location of the fan is not the dance hall, the nightclub, or even the jazz concert or club, but the private room in which a group of young men play one another records, repeating crucial passages until they are worn out, and then endlessly discussing their comparative merits. For every jazz fan is a collector of records, within his financial means. Flourishing communities of fans have come into being in countries such as Britain, at times when virtually no live jazz of interest was to be heard at all, almost purely on the basis of records, and there are many fans, such as this writer, who at an earlier stage of their career listened to no live jazz at all for something like 10 years on end. Moreover, the fan is not exclusively interested in jazz as music. For him jazz is a world, and often a cause of which the actual sound emerging from the instruments is only one aspect. The lives of the musicians, the environment in which jazz evolved, the political and philosophical implications of the music, the scholarly or sporting details of discography, are equally part of it. It is not merely due to the lack of musical literacy among jazz fans that technical discussions of jazz in musical terms have been so rare, nor to the strong Marxist influence of the 1930s that so much of jazz criticism and jazz appreciation consists, in effect, of writing or studying the social history of jazz up the river from New Orleans, or even more fundamentally across the water from West Africa. This mixture of aesthetic, social, philosophical, and historical interests is part of the makeup of the jazz fan. Only since the Second World War has something like pure musical or aesthetic appreciation or criticism of jazz emerged as a serious force, and then only among one school of jazz lovers. Biographical and historical material, studies of individual bands, discographies, discussions about the nature of jazz, impressions of the jazz scene, recreations of the social atmosphere of jazz, and record reviews have always provided the bulk of the content of the specialist jazz magazine, in the pages of which a line of music print is as rare as Hebrew or Chinese characters in the ordinary book. The jazz fan is therefore rarely a musician himself. Periodicals addressed to the amateur and professional musician are recognizable by the spate of articles of the type how to get the best out of your trumpet, how to improvise a chorus, and the like, these do not often occur in the specialist magazines. It is true that enthusiasm for jazz has always been rife among amateur and professional dance musicians, that is, among a fairly large public, for the American Federation of Musicians, aided by an insurance expert, estimated that in 1953-4 there were 19,114 jazz pianists busy every night in the USA, not counting amateurs. In case this figure should mislead, it may be mentioned that the number of classical or academic pianists of superior ability at this time was estimated as 114,684, for it is also true that an enthusiasm for jazz has always tempted a good many fans to try their hand at playing, the revivalist movement in jazz was primarily a movement of amateurs, even if many of them have since become professionals. Lastly, it may be true that in the early stages of the jazz movement, the proportion of fans who were also players, or who became players, was high, much higher than that of lovers of painting who paint, lovers of classical music who play, though perhaps not higher than that of lovers of poetry who also write verse, which is a rather unskilled occupation. We do not really know, for there are no figures, but it is not at all unlikely. However, it seems quite clear, both from experience and from the contents of the specialist literature, that the practicing or aspiring musician rapidly became a small minority of the jazz public, which consisted, and consists, overwhelmingly of appreciators. Broadly speaking, this description is true of the jazz public anywhere and at any time, I have no doubt that it applies to the hot and cool communities of Tokyo, Reykjavik, and Buenos Aires as much as to those of Los Angeles and London. But who composes these communities? 
statistics are difficult to come by. Among the few we have are those of a sample collected by a gramophone company in the Paris region in 1948, at the height of the local jazz boom, 0.5 according to this inquiry 12% of the record buying public were in the market for jazz, 30% of those under the age of 30, 69% of the jazz record buyers were young under 30 and their social composition was as follows. Percent. Middle class. 34. White collar. 22. Tradesmen, shopkeepers. 7. Students. 4. Working class. 26. Collectors. 4. Musicians. 2. Foreigners. 1. In brief, jazz in France was, and, to judge by subsequent inquiries such as those of the review arts, is, a minority addiction, the addicts being in majority young though with a surprisingly high proportion of older people and overwhelmingly members of the lower middle and middle classes. On the whole this impression is probably universally true, though with considerable national variations. There is no doubt at all that jazz is, and has always been, a minority taste, even allowing for those who appreciate hybrid and jazz-influenced music which the purists refuse to admit. This is true not only of France, where jazz record buyers lagged far behind those of classical and operatic music, 23%, and even farther behind such native European forms of light entertainment as chansons, variety, accordion, and BAL musette music, and operetta, a total of 50%, and only just equaled dance music, 12%. It is equally true in Britain where, before the jazz boom of the last five years, the best-known British revivalist jazz band could reckon with an average sale of only 5,000 copies of each of its 78 RPM records, and the company which released the works of Jelly Roll Morton was surprised and gratified to find that this acknowledged and advertised hero of old New Orleans sold 3,000 to 4,000 copies per 78 RPM disc. Jazz has until recently simply not been big business in Britain, in the terms in which those who prepare records for the hit parade of the top 10 or top 20 think of it, or even normally in the terms in which a regular steady seller in the popular music market say Mr. Victor Sylvester, Mr. Stanley Black, or Mr. Jimmy Shand of the Scottish music, think of it. This is why it has so largely been left to marginal or amateur enterprise, and even today, when it has become profitable, it can at best be described as small to medium business. We may estimate the size of the strict jazz public as somewhere between the 25,000 or so who buy jazz news, specialist jazz books sell 8,000 or so, and the 115,000 who buy the traditional weekly of the jazz lover, the melody maker.6 True, these are the hardcore of the strict jazz public, and they are surrounded by a penumbra of people who, though neither regular readers nor record buyers, probably go to the occasional concert or buy the occasional record. But even if we assume that all those who visit the concerts of a famous American band, say Count Basie's, are jazz lovers, and that such a band plays to capacity throughout its tour, the national jazz public at present hardly amounts to more than 100,000 or so, say 20,000 in London, 60,000 in the rest of the big cities covered, and the balance in the neglected towns.7 Such figures are not negligible, but they are those of a minority public. This does not mean that such a minority may not become a majority, though this is unlikely, for the young people, among whom the great bulk of the jazz addicts are to be found, are themselves always a minority, except in rather exceptional demographic situations. Britain is a fairly extreme example, for the jazz public here is proportionately much larger than in most other countries, with the exception of the Scandinavian ones and perhaps the Dutch, proportionately larger than in France and certainly than in the USA. Admittedly, both in Britain and in the USA jazz-tinged idioms of popular music are very much more popular than in France, Germany, or Italy, where the native forms of light music have at least until the rise of rock and roll been much more resistant, because quite differently based. It may even happen that strict jazz artists or records become temporary bestsellers in the Anglo-Saxon world for this reason, i.e. that in America they sell upwards to 250,000, 
in Britain upwards of 100,000 copies, as things stood in 1958. However, though jazz-influenced pop music must belong to the world of jazz as the historian sees it, it is not jazz as either the musician, the sociologist, or the businessman sees it. It has the same relation to jazz as palm chord string groups have to classical music, at best the lowbrow version of the highbrow article, at worst a mere background noise. As the children in a California high school, devotees of pop music in its most heavily rhythmical versions, put it, jazz is a sophisticated kind of entertainment, isn't it? The second equally undeniable fact is that the jazz public is overwhelmingly young and masculine. Among whites, jazz is essentially a music appealing to boys and young men between the ages of, say, 15 and 25, the post-war commercial offensive against school children may have lowered this age level a little, but probably not much. Instrumental jazz is not children's but young adults' music, and the children influenced by it are more likely to take to simple vocal music of the rhythm and blues or country and western type. This observation requires no statistics. In jazz clubs and at jazz concerts young men invariably preponderate, because very few girls go there except with boyfriends, while very many boys also go there alone or with other boys. The actual community of addicts is almost totally masculine. Though there are enthusiastic and knowledgeable aficionados among women normally on the fringes of the intellectual or artistic occupations, or of nightlife closer research will almost always show that they have acquired the taste through an earlier boyfriend among musicians or fans. This is fairly easy, for the jazzman is both a passionate proselytizer, and a keen follower of the women. Of all the arts in mid-20th century Britain, this is so far the one with the overwhelmingly strongest heterosexual tradition and ethos, in spite of the almost unlimited toleration of jazzmen for deviations and idiosyncrasies in people's private lives. It is equally clear that a good many youthful jazz lovers abandon their enthusiasm once they reach maturity. This may be partly for material reasons, married men cannot afford to buy records on the scale of single men, nor are they encouraged to go to all-night dances, clubs, and other jazz occasions. But there is more to it than this. The wild passion and effervescence of jazz fits in with adolescence. Young people find it easier than mature ones to overlook the formal and emotional limitations of jazz, or even its frequent mediocrity, for they pour into it their own emotion, vitality, and dedication to make up for the shortcomings of the music. To the eye of passion, colored glass can look like diamonds, and much of jazz, though not the best of it, is no more than musical glass cut in so suitable a form as to reflect the light of its public with the utmost brilliance. At all events, the curve of jazz enthusiasm in men's lives takes a sharp turn downwards from about the middle twenties on. Older men either drop their interest in jazz entirely the records are played increasingly rarely, and perhaps eventually sold or settle down into a less passionate pattern of appreciation, unless they become professionally concerned with jazz in some way or another. The older fan exists, for even on the most pessimistic assumptions each generation of addicts formed since the late 1920s is bound to have left some residue of permanent jazz lovers. Often, indeed, a flare of jazz enthusiasm among the young may awaken the dormant enthusiasm of the middle-aged, jazz is not old enough to have really ancient addicts. Normally, the older jazz lover has a less exclusive and demanding allegiance to his music, he can take it or leave it alone. An occasional concert or club provided the audiences are not so overwhelmingly adolescent as to make him feel alone an occasional session playing and discussing old records with contemporaries, just like old times, arguments with his children on their unaccountably bad jazz taste, a quiet quarter of an hour with the American Forces Network jazz broadcasts late at night, these are about his limits. The stuff can still move him. At worst, the sound is pleasant and part of his life, at best he knows that for certain moods and emotions there is no more poignant equivalent than a good jazz record. Jazz, for the older amateur, is like the occasional dose of lyric poetry for the man who has long ceased to read poetry systematically, a nucleus of surviving youth. The older jazz lover is not simply, as André Hodier suggests, young at heart. He may quite well, like Yeats, know that he is not, 
but also know what youth, including his own, is about. Labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul, nor beauty born out of its own despair, nor blear-eyed wisdom out of midnight oil. O chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O body swayed to music, O brightening glance! How can we tell the dancer from the dance? The social composition of the jazz public presents a more complicated problem and national variations of greater significance. It may be worth looking at a few countries in greater detail. Point eight. Paradoxical though it may seem, the specialized jazz public in the USA has always been relatively, and probably absolutely, smaller than in Europe, though the public exposed to some kind or other of jazz has been much larger. The sales of the British Melody Maker are considerably higher than those of the equivalent American weeklies. As for the demand for jazz records, Billboard gives the following statistics for the early 1950s.9% Popular music 49.1 Classical music 18.9 Country and western 13.2 Rhythm and blues 5.7 Children's records 10.2 Foreign Folk Music 1.1 Latin American 1.0 Hot Jazz 0.8 Virtually only the last item represents the pure jazz public for while most of rhythm and blues, the ancestor of the recent rock and roll craze, is jazz, its normal public is among the unself-conscious black buyers, not the self-conscious jazz appreciators. The same is true of the very much less jazz-tinged, but very folky country and western music, hillbilly, cowboy music, and the like. Admittedly it is likely that popular music includes a certain amount of jazz of the more saleable kind, but even so the jazz public must trail a very long way indeed behind the public for classical music. The American jazz fan is therefore a rather exceptional specimen. In the USA the, white, jazz lovers seem to have come first, as a group, from among the northern middle class youth, that class being defined as those who went to college between the wars. The South has produced proportionately very much fewer fans and collectors, no doubt for the obvious reasons. At all events American universities have played a disproportionately large part as nurseries of jazz music. The history of the white Chicago musicians of the 1920s can be written in terms of college dances, and notably of student taste at Indiana University. Eastern colleges provided the staple public for the earliest swing bands, notably the Casa Loma Orchestra. The students of the University of California, Los Angeles, turned Goodman's first tour into a success, and those of Berkeley and Stanford were later to provide the backbone of the early West Coast revival bands. Point ten since the war it has become axiomatic in the business that blues and highbrow jazz can be made to sell best on the college circuit but even in the colleges jazz still remains a minority taste, though a large one. There is equally little doubt that the first group in history which shows most of the characteristics of the modern aficionados, the white Chicago musicians of the middle 1920s, was primarily a white-collar or middle-class group. They differ from the modern fan chiefly in that most of them became actual players. Big Speederbeck, Hoagie Carmichael, the Austin High School Gang, McPartland, Tess Schemacher, Lanigan, Dave Tuff, Floyd O'Brien, Pee Wee Russell were from the right side of the tracks, as is indicated by the absence of Italian and Slavonic names among them. Midwestern jazz was not confined to middle-class boys, though it is significant that the only working-class school to have produced a marked jazz tradition of its own was the highly untypical Hull House School, the Toynbee Hall of Chicago, i.e. a foundation of middle-class social workers at all events, the young Chicagoans had all the essential fan stigmata, the desire to play and hear, not jazz but the only true jazz, the painstaking and dedicated copying of an entire style, the Occasional idealization of the black, most notably in Milton Mesereau, who at least claims middle class origin, 11 the occasional deliberate declassment, the intellectual interests and pretensions Bix fancied Debussy and Schoenberg and the obvious revolt against middle class respectability. It was little Dave, tough, writes Mesereau, who gave me the knockdown to George Jean Nathan and H. L. Mencken. 
Dave used to read the American Mercury from cover to cover, especially the section called Americana where all the blue noses, bigots, and two-face killjoys in this land of the free got the going over they never forgot. That Mercury really got to be the Austin High Gang's Bible. It looked to us like Mencken was yelling the same message in his magazine that we were trying to get across in our music, his words were practically lyrics to our Hot Jazz 12. Systematic record collecting first seems to have begun among the college crowd in the later 1920s.13 The pillars of the early hot clubs in the middle 30s were middle class intellectuals the daughter of a wealthy Canadian manufacturer, a lawyer, a future English don, and the like. The most influential and active patron of jazz in the 30s was, and is, a radical offshoot of an extremely wealthy and respectable Eastern family. Similarly Howard Becker, who has described a group of modern Chicago jazz aficionados in one of the few sociological studies on the subject, correctly draws attention to their middle-class characteristics, they are sons of old, respectable, comfortable Anglo-Saxon American families who deny their birthright for the company of horn players and honky-tonk girls and the aesthetics of low life. Theirs is a political protest, for they reject the American way of life in toto, though without substituting anything for it but music, avant-garde existentialist philosophy, and a personal anarchism, which is perhaps why those of them who do not wreck themselves by this life and die early will probably end, like their predecessors, as respectable bourgeois, except for a few who become musicians, or revolutionaries. Jazz was, and is, for deviant American members of the middle class what surrealism and existentialism were for deviant French members of it. These were the handful of pioneers. A larger American public of pure jazz enthusiasts only appeared among the high school youths in the middle 1930s rather later, and probably on a rather smaller scale, than the comparable public in Europe. Both the first journals appealing specifically to the jazz public, Downbeat, 1934, and the first hot clubs, Chicago 1935, were younger than their European opposite numbers. The jazz revival of the war years added another batch of recruits, so that by 1944-5 the American record collectors community consisted mainly of two sectors, those in their later 20s, who had been converted in the middle 30s, and those just about 20, who had been converted in 1942 to 4.14 it is certainly still overwhelmingly middle class and overwhelmingly between the ages of 20 and 40, the younger group supporting mainly rhythmic pop music, the older ones never having been fully exposed to jazz or having abandoned it. A market research report, 1960, on a California radio station which plays jazz exclusively makes this quite clear, 79.4% of its listeners were between 20 and 40, 90 percent had attended Oregon were attending college, only 6.6% .6 were craftsmen, 4.5% operatives and kindred workers. 15 Whether this public is as overwhelmingly on the political left as the jazz fans of the New Deal vintage, among whom there were probably very few Republicans, we do not know. Apart from the political and ideological changes among the young post-war Americans of the age groups which produce most jazz fans, there is no great evidence that the composition of the jazz community has changed much. However, the American jazz public has two important peculiarities. In the first place it contains a far larger and wealthier section of adults than the European. These lawyers, doctors, business executives, scientists, or newspapermen, now on the verge of middle age, have never recovered from the musical infection of their youth. While the kids maintain the jazz club or concert, it is people of this kind who maintain the Dixieland clubs where elderly men also play as though the world were young, and who give to the American nightclub an atmosphere so different from the European, breeding jazz-impregnated singers, jazz-impregnated and socially corrosive satirists. They also provide that most adult of jazz artists, Duke Ellington, with the public he needs, for his appeal to the adolescence is not too strong. Such men give to jazz the nearest thing to patronage it possesses. Is it accidental that some clubs most firmly associated with middle-aged mobsters systematically hire good jazz groups, not because they give better profits, but because they like jazz? Nor is this public negligible. Even in 1960, 
when the pop music market was largely determined by the teenagers, 20-30% of the selections on American jukeboxes were composed of records by artists who appeal through nostalgia and familiarity to the strictly adult market and most of the records of these bands Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, the Dorseys are between 15 and 20 years old 16. This leads us to the second peculiarity of the American jazz public. It is this. Whereas jazz came to Europe through the regulated channels of American record imports, which were in turn controlled by the pioneer aficionados and critics, who therefore imposed their own tastes and standards on the wider public, jazz in America was live music, which altogether escaped minority intellectual control. Except for very small groups of rigid sectarians, the line between the pop and the jazz public in America was therefore much hazier than elsewhere, the power of commercial advertisement to interest a marginal public in whatever band or style happened to be in vogue was immeasurably greater. To judge by the periodic polls which the jazz press has conducted since the middle 1930s, European taste has, until the later 1950s, fairly consistently reflected the taste of the critics, even to the point of remaining faithful throughout the years to artists whose achievement in jazz critics believed to be permanent. American taste on the other hand perhaps because it depends less on records and more on the temporary prominence of live musicians has been notoriously changing and fickle, in fact, even the American true jazz public has behaved far more like a pop public than has the European. This may be illustrated by the choice of the best trumpeter. Virtually every European poll since the beginning has consistently placed Louis Armstrong first, and even after the split between the traditionalists and the modernists, has bracketed him with the leading modern trumpeters Gillespie or Miles Davis. American polls have successively placed a variety of trumpeters of very uneven merit at the top, in some instances even failing to place Armstrong in the first ten. The continental public has also been markedly middle class and intellectual, probably more so than in America. It is also by far the oldest consistent and organized jazz public in the world. The first Norwegian jazz club seems to have been founded as long ago as 1928, and though the journal Le Jazz Hot did not appear in France until 1935, by 1933 there were magazines dealing mainly or wholly with jazz at least in Holland, Sweden, Belgium, Switzerland, France, and Germany. On the continent jazz had the advantage of fitting smoothly into the ordinary pattern of avant-garde intellectualism, among the Dadaists and Surrealists, the big city romantics, the idealizers of the machine age, the expressionists, and their like. Thus in France Jean Cocteau and Max Jacob patronized L.E. Jazz Hot, while Marianne Oswald, the favorite deezers of the intellectuals, singing poems about down and outs and prostitutes by Prevert, did so to serious jazz accompaniments. After the war the theoreticians of modern jazz published their discussions about it in Sartre's Les Temps Modernes. This self-confidence, and the Latin proclivity for writing manifestos, probably explains why France became the intellectual headquarters of jazz criticism before the middle thirties, dominating the taste of jazz lovers through the periodically revised writings of M. Hughes Panacy and the activities of collectors through the hot discography of M. Delaunay, as today it does the aesthetics of modern jazz criticism through M. André Hodier. The French might know a great deal less about actual jazz than the Americans who were on the spot, they might indeed patently know too little to write full dress books, as was the case with M. Panacea's pioneer L.E. Jazz Hot, 1934, virtually all of which was abandoned by its author within five years. But the proverbial Gallic certainty and lucidity saw them through, and the rest of the world listened. In Britain the situation was rather different, and in many ways more interesting. Here too, the growth of the jazz public passed through the usual stages. Until 1927 the true jazz fans were merely a handful of scattered individuals, but in 1927-8 a recognizable jazz public emerged, strong enough to make it worth the gramophone companies while to release a regular supply of American hot records, mainly of the white New York variety. An attempt to issue a series of primarily black records failed, since even the hottest aficionados found them too strong for their tastes, at least if we are to judge by the contemporary record reviews again, to judge by the record releases, this public remained steady and grew throughout the next years, 
apparently quite unaffected by the slump which for a time virtually destroyed recorded jazz in the United States. Indeed, as we have seen, some of what little survived in America was virtually commissioned for the European i.e. mainly the British market. By 1933 the British jazz public was large enough to make a large-scale London recital for serious jazz fans, by a visiting American band, financially possible, Duke Ellington's London concert at the Trocadero, Elephant and Castle. Until then, and for a long time thereafter, visiting artists relied on ordinary music hall and dance bookings, i.e. on attracting a much wider public than that of the jazz aficionado, the appearance of the jazz concert, like the specific jazz club, marks the emergence of the jazz public as an independent force. Large or small, the British jazz lovers became increasingly self-confident during these years. Their first articulate prophet had been an energetic young Spaniard, Fred Elizalde, who formed the first pure British jazz band from among Cambridge undergraduates in 1927, Oxford, as usual the home of lost causes, held back. Their second, and far more influential one, was a cosmopolitan young Irishman with a fortunate combination of musical and literary talent, who has described his early career charmingly and fully. Point seventeen. Mr. Patrick Spike Hughes formed a recording band, played, composed and, most important of all, in 1930 took over the jazz record reviewing in The Melody Maker, which henceforth became the bible of every British jazz lover. At about the same time the British fans also began to develop the characteristic institution of the rhythm clubs which multiplied rapidly after 1933. By the end of 1935 98 had been formed, of which perhaps 50 were really active. Their main centre was in and around London, which alone contained upwards of 20, in the south, and in a few scattered large cities. They do not seem to have penetrated the north and Scotland in force until rather later, and Wales hardly at all the middle thirties also saw the first of those little specialist journals which are as much part of the world of jazz as of that of poetry. The jazz public was small. I do not suppose many jazz records sold more than 1,500 copies. It was also, in spite of the impeccable social setting of prophets like Elizalde and Hughes, overwhelmingly drawn from the lower middle and working classes. The established upper and middle classes those who went to public schools and universities were far less important in it than their opposite numbers were in America and on the continent. The working class contingent among British jazz lovers came chiefly from among, or turned rapidly into, dance band musicians. These were, as we have seen, a group of markedly proletarian origins, which always contained a core of jazz enthusiasts. Indeed, their trade journal complained in 1927 that they pandered to their own tastes rather than the public's in playing too much hot music. Point 18. Probably, however, the people to whom jazz made its strongest and most direct appeal came from that social zone in which the sons of skilled workers, probably themselves in office jobs, met the sons of white collar workers, shopkeepers, small businessmen, and the like, from the lower middle class. Clerking, small business, the drawing board, accountancy, commercial art, the lower reaches of journalism, the fringes of show business, provided the jazz lovers professions, anyone who knows fans of the 1930s, can immediately think of three or four accountants or commercial artists. They were cultural self-made men. The respectability against which they revolted was that of the semi-detached suburban three-bed, two-reception house, but they also resented, and revolted against, the world of upper-class culture, as reached through the public school and varsity. If H. G. Wells had been in his teens in the early 1930s, he would have attended the first rhythm clubs, and met others like himself, for the jazz fans came from his world. This is probably why the Young Post, 1945 writers, who, led by Kingsley Amos and John Wayne, gloried in what purported to be provincialism, wrote jazz among the many other rude words on their banners. They were 15 or 20 years late in discovering it, but their instinct was right. Theirs was, by and large, the world of the grammar school and public library rather than the public school and university, of the tea shop and Chinese restaurant, rather than the sherry party, and when times were bad, 
as they were in the thirties, sometimes of the fish and chip shop. They were not against official culture. Jazz for them was not, as for many continental intellectuals who took to it, a retreat into unintellectualism. On the contrary, it was part of achieving intellectualism the independent way, and often the hard way, by self-education. American and Continental Hot and Rhythm Clubs spent much of their energy making or sponsoring live jazz. The British ones were not so interested in this there is no British equivalent to the Quintet of the Hot Club of France or the Dutch Swing College Orchestra of the 30s but they spent a great deal of time discussing jazz and its social background and history. The early fans' taste in the Orthodox arts did not differ significantly from the official taste, if highbrow, they read their Eliot, Pound, and Empson and their D.H. Lawrence, though also their Oscar Wilde and Bernard Shaw and, as like as not 15 years before the rest of the highbrows, their science fiction in pulp magazines. No doubt jazz appealed to them because it was their discovery and art, not that of the upper class cultured, but it also appealed to them because, thanks to its immediate appeal, it was an ideal introduction to serious music for people with no previous qualifications and training. If they progressed to classical music, as like as not they did so via Delius, whose sensuous appeal is equally direct, and especially Debussy, whose opera midi provided the bridge to the classics for more than one fan. It is easy for those who come from intellectual environments, and have gone through the full educational treatment, to forget that even the teenage sons of Oxford don start on Bach and Piero della Francesca not because these have a powerful appeal to their age group, or even make much sense, but because there is considerable tacit pressure to the effect that they are high-class things, which one ought to think well of. The pioneer jazz fan was therefore culturally active, energetic, often with ambitions to create, perhaps one reason why commercial artists, journalists, people on the fringes of the theatrical and film business were so frequently found in his ranks. A Mr. Clifford Kell Irby, a bus conductor, was not at all untypical in his extracurricular activities, he played in both jazz and military bands, edited the Leeds Transport magazine, drew posters, painted, we owe our information about him to a large, and, alas, not very successful symbolic painting on the past, present, and future of jazz, 19, and traveled on the continent. I have very little doubt that he also composed a fair amount of poetry in free verse. If less ambitious, he very likely still had the hobbyists and collectors itch, which found an outlet in the compilation of elaborate and scholarly discographies, the collection of biographical material, and experiments, if he had the money, with elaborate gramophone equipment. He was almost certainly politically conscious, because the appreciation of jazz implied, at its minimum, views about racial discrimination, i.e. fascism. In the 1930s this meant almost invariably that he was on the extreme left, being joined in this situation by the young, unemployed musicians who were pushed there by unemployment, the young Jewish ones who were pushed there by Hitler. Not that the left recognized the jazz fan as a type, but he was in it all right and gave all jazz made in the pre-Second World War mold a permanent slant to the extreme left. From the middle 30s jazz began to permeate upwards into higher society, and notably into some of the public schools and the old universities. To judge by my own memories of Cambridge in the last pre-war years, its conquests were modest. An enthusiasm for jazz or the blues was a respectable eccentricity, but nevertheless neither normal nor socially particularly cherished. It affected some, but not all, of those who idealized Roosevelt's America and most of what came out of it, but not to anything like the extent to which, say, American films gripped us. It did not belong markedly to the Auden Spender Isherwood new writing phase of literary enthusiasm, which dominated the Spanish Civil War years. The first really jazz struck bunch I can recall at Cambridge were those in or on the fringes of the Communist Party in the immediate pre war years, but whose tastes took them towards the neo romantic, quasi surrealist kind of poetry, the new apocalypse, Dylan Thomas, etc which was to dominate the 40s, the Rousseauists, rather than the Voltairines among us. It is among friends of this kind that I remember sitting entranced, not only by Mahler, another of their discoveries, 
but by Basic and Rushing, Turner and Johnson, and above all by Billy Holiday's Strange Fruit, by the jazz of 1938-9 vintage. This modest expansion of the jazz public reflected the vogue for swing which swept the United States after 1935 as well as the political currents of the times. But swing put the older, and more quintessential, British jazz lovers into a quandary. The jazz community exists largely, as we have seen, by its exclusiveness and its hostility to commercialism. Swing was popular and commercially successful. The ranks of the aficionados were therefore shattered by ideological civil wars between purists and impurists, a war as usual easily won by the purists. Their taste which came to dominate the taste of the jazz public, for the pioneer fans became in their turn the writers and critics can be roughly defined as favoring any jazz appreciated by them before 1935, or made in a pre-1930 idiom, with a marked preference for that played by black players. Mr. Rex Harris's Pelican books on jazz still reflect this attitude, heightened by the later New Orleans fanaticism, with remarkable accuracy. The strength of this purism was all the more remarkable, because it was not only rationally and musically indefensible, but not shared by the leading critics and sponsors of jazz. M. Panacee, with all his increasing passion for the pure gospel of New Orleans, welcomed every new discovery of the swing era with his customary ebullience and good taste, Billy Holiday, Lionel Hampton, the Lunsford Orchestra. Mr. John Hammond in America, who discovered and launched virtually every musician and band of importance in the swing era, was himself a bitter opponent of commercialization. The purists were pure, not because they were told to be, or because they could justify themselves, but because sectarian exclusiveness was in their blood. It was therefore natural that the extraordinary expansion of the jazz public which took place everywhere during the war, was not the direct prolongation of swing, but a reaction against it, the New Orleans revival. In Britain, and indeed everywhere else, this is difficult to analyze in purely social terms. It was an age group, rather than a particular social stratum, which received the revelation from Jelly Roll Morton and King Oliver, the boys who were between 15 and 22 years around 1945, though some of their leaders, and all their critical mentors, belonged to the generation of the 1930s. Out of 15 leading British revivalist musicians one, the first of them all, was born in 1917, three in 1922 one, two in 1926 and nine in 1928, 32 six of them in 1928, nine all of them came from among the jazz fans, none from among the professional musicians. Their social origins were mixed, public schoolboys and university students took to revivalism as readily as anyone else. However, the center of gravity of the movement undoubtedly lay in the suburbs, especially those of London, increasingly infiltrated by the skilled working class. The revivalist jazz bands formed on the outskirts and marched upon the center of the city, like rebellious armies deposing Roman emperors. George Webb's Dixielanders raised the banner of revolt in the Red Barn at Bexley Heath, Kent, in 1944, the Crane River Jazz Band nursery of numerous New Orleans prophets came from Cranford, Middlesex, while to this day the jazz club calendar of the Melody Maker records the strongholds of the music in Chadwell Heath and Southall, Croydon, and Wood Green, Ealing, Hanwell, Haringey, and Dagenham. Soon Leeds produced the Yorkshire Jazz Band, Manchester the Saints, named after the tune which may best be described as the national anthem of the revivalists, when the Saints go marching in, Liverpool the Sick Mersey Zippy Band, while from Scotland there came, as usual, a stream of musicians. Why the Scots have taken to jazz so much more readily than any other part of Britain is obscure, but the fact is not in dispute, ever since the early and middle thirties they have provided by far the largest single contingent of good jazz musicians in these islands. To judge by the character of the London fans, the lower middle class youth pretty certainly remain the main pillar of the jazz public. Nevertheless the general atmosphere of revivalism in this country, as distinct from America and the continent, was rather more proletarian than that of earlier jazz fashions possibly this is due to the fact that as we have seen the revival movement was much more of a playing movement than earlier fashions, and much more home-based. 
its heroes were not so much the great and often defunct New Orleans black players. These were rather gods whom mortals discerned as through a glass, darkly, for their battered acoustical records of the 1920s often sounded so appalling that a great deal of faith was needed to recognize their merits. This was even more true of some of the old men who were resuscitated for the benefit of the young white public, nobody except a historian would have listened twice to poor Bunk Johnson's recordings, which were to be an inspiration to countless youngsters. The public for revivalist jazz in Britain was soon built of admirers of Humphrey Littleton, Ken Collier and Chris Barber rather than of King Oliver and George Lewis, of those who knew Audley Patterson, of Newtown Ards, Northern Ireland and Lonnie Donegan, of Glasgow, rather than Bessie Smith and Huddy Ledbetter, whom these singers imitated scrupulously. And the jazz club of the 1940s and 50s was not, like the rhythm club of the 30s, a place of self-education, where records were heard and dissected, but essentially a place where live jazz by British musicians was encouraged and admired. The revivalist public was therefore less learned than its predecessors, and less intellectual. At all events, the social tone of the movement was set by the amateur and semi-professional musician, and the ordinary inexpert fan, generally of schoolboy or student age. This kind of simple, non-intellectual music had its appeal to the intellectuals, not to mention young aristocrats from the gossip column zone. It captured the art students, the young actors, the young writers, especially those who also discerned in it the latent but undefined revolt which they themselves felt. It is no accident that revivalist jazz provides the incidental music to John Osborne's look back in anger, whose hero, it will be remembered, occasionally goes off stage to practice the trumpet and once had ambitions to become a jazz trumpeter. However, for quite different reasons, it also increasingly and obviously captured the provincial working class youth. In Glasgow, in Belfast, in Newcastle, the Mississippi, musically speaking, was in full flood, and those who swam in it were primarily working class youngsters. Revivalism remained a minority phenomenon, though by the middle 50s there were probably few grammar schoolboys, attenders of youth clubs, and other youth organizations who had not become familiar with it. Oddly enough, in spite of the general change in the political climate, it retained strong links with the communist left, partly no doubt for historical reasons. Few of the leading revivalist bands were without some communists, and several were led by young men who came out of, or from the neighborhood of, the small communist youth movement, while the international youth festivals of 1947-57 were also international rallies and propaganda platforms for revivalist jazz. However, an equally, if not more strongly, leftist offshoot of the revival gave birth to a virtually universal musical vogue among young Britons, Skiffle, 1956 to 8. This may best be regarded as a modification of revivalist jazz to suit an even more completely unqualified and lay public. The movement was quite spontaneous. Left wingers had long pioneered ballads and blues sessions on both sides of the Atlantic, and produced a modest cabaret political and avant garde vogue for artists like Josh White, Led Belly, Burl Ives, Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, or in Britain, Ewan McCall and Isla Cameron. Revivalist bands in Britain had taken to allowing a guitarist singer with rhythm accompaniment to sing such blues and songs, mainly from the Lead Belly repertoire. Between band sets, the arrangement was called skiffle, a term dug up from the obscure recesses of American jazz history, and virtually without meaning for anyone in the USA. A taste for the blues had long been part of a sound revivalist approach, though commercially a hopeless proposition. Of all jazz fans, the blues lover has been the most consistently esoteric. To this day the admirer of Sonny Boy Williamson or Bessie Jackson, Roosevelt Sykes the Honey Dripper, or Lightning Hopkins, must rely on imported and second-hand American records, for it has not been commercially worthwhile to release a representative selection of blues records in Britain. How and why this sort of material, hitherto confined to folk song collections and the rhythm and blues catalogs of American record companies, conquered the public, is obscure, but by the middle of the 1950s it had done so both in America and in Britain, under the respective names of rock and roll and skiffle. Nobody created or anticipated the fashion, 
Mr. Lonnie Donegan in Britain, whose Rock Island line originally a black prison camp song exploded into the big time in the spring of 1956, had made the record as part of his routine duties with a leading revivalist band. His version of the song had been available for almost two years. Indeed, Lead Belly's original record had been available for the better part of a decade. The rise of the rock and roll stars in America was similarly unpremeditated, though premeditation by astute businessmen like Colonel Tennessee Tom Parker and Mr. Hank Saperstein, who took in hand the fortunes of Mr. Elvis Presley, soon came. However, if the general trend of taste was similar on both sides of the Atlantic, the British version showed two important peculiarities. Firstly, it was much more patently an outgrowth of the revivalist jazz movement. Second, it became as much a movement for amateur music making as for listening, indeed, the largest movement of its kind within living memory. Within a few months the country was covered with a network of skiffle groups, consisting of guitars and rhythm instruments improvised out of washboards, thimbles, tea chests, and the like, and accompanying youngsters who shouted the songs of Tennessee prostitutes, Mississippi convicts, and Alabama gamblers in what would have been a hybrid accent if the listener could have recognized it. Skiffle was unquestionably the most universally popular music of our generation. It broke through all barriers except those of age. Between the ages of 8 and 18 there can have been few inhabitants of Britain, whatever their class, education, or intelligence down to the halfwits who did not, for however short a period, take some active pleasure in it. The mind of the student reels as he attempts vainly to chart the frontiers of the appeal made by simple, shouting, thumping music of this type, for a Welsh farmer, who substituted rock and roll records for the classical ones with which he had always soothed his Frisians, discovered that their milk yield went up by five gallons a day. Point twenty. Revivalist jazz, as we see, progressed steadily, and with increasing speed, from minority to majority status. By the later fifties it had virtually ceased to be minority music, Skiffle was triumphant. But even after it had exhausted its short vogue, the old-fashioned instrumental jazz of New Orleans remained stronger than ever. It had, indeed, insensibly turned into standard popular dance music for youngsters between 15 and 25, who, if asked, would have guessed that King Oliver was the monarch of Denmark. This tendency was not confined to Britain. Point 21 Inevitably, therefore, the true aficionado searched for more esoteric positions to occupy. Some fled farther back into the recesses of black folk music, until smoked out of them by the cloud of rock and roll shouters. Others fled forward, into the unexplored territories of modern or cool jazz. Modern jazz had been on the American and European scene since the middle 40s. Its sectarian appeal would no doubt have made itself felt earlier but for two facts, it was much harder to listen to than the older kind, and the bulk of the established critics and jazz intellectuals, formed in the school of the 30s, were bitterly hostile to it, for political and social reasons. What they cherished in jazz was a people's music that is, a music which both appealed to ordinary people and, in its nature, provided an alternative pattern of the arts to that of the esoteric minority culture of our age. Modern jazz seemed to them to sell the pass, a jazz version of esoteric avant-garde music might have its own merits, but they were not the ones they had come to jazz for. Often they were also, and understandably, repelled by the demoralized and a social atmosphere which frequently surrounded the modernist revolutionaries the drug-taking and peddling, the hipsterdom, and the general atmosphere of a cut-price 1919 Montparnasse. Nor did the fact that commercially-minded men with an eye to the cash value of novelty took up bop as a slogan for up-to-date jazz, encourage them, even though the advertising types failed. In spite of a good deal of American drum beating in the later 40s, bop, cool or modern jazz proved incapable of being turned into a widely saleable music. A king of swing could be built in the 1930s, but not even Mr. Woody Herman, who favored the modern idiom and modern musicians in the later 40s, could get himself recognized as king of bop. Modern jazz won itself a public of sorts, drawn partly from among professional musicians, always ready to appreciate a technically interesting music, 
partly from among the various national equivalents of the hipsters and st germain type layabouts, partly from among that stratum of young intellectuals, who, as in France, are given to accepting anything in the arts which can plausibly claim to be revolutionary. But it seems pretty clear, in Europe at least, that its major expansion occurred only in the middle and later 50s, when revivalist and traditional jazz had become too widely accepted for comfort. I do not suppose the process was always deliberate. Among musicians in Britain it often took the form of a vague malaise, a boredom with the traditionalist music whose limits they felt they had explored pretty completely, a desire to play something more interesting. Characteristically it often took the compromise form of moving from the traditional music of the 20s to the mainstream music of the 30s and early 40s, a halfway house to modernism. But the trend was unmistakable, and it was greatly aided by two American developments, the virtual drying up of the American source of traditional records, except for the perennial blues, and the swelling stream of modern records which British companies either had to release under contract or thought it worth releasing because of the established principle that what sells in America will soon sell in Europe. For in the USA modern jazz, by the middle 50s, acquired recognized cultural standing, perhaps because the line between hipsterdom and intellectualism grew faint in the period of McCarthy and the apotheosis of General Motors. Where every intellectual risked being an outsider or a secret dissident hidden underneath a crew-cut and grey flannel suit, an outsider's music might well come into its own. The evolution of the jazz public is no more finished than that of jazz. However, it is not too soon to draw a few general conclusions from its history so far. The first is, that, in spite of considerable national differences, it is surprisingly similar in all countries. It is invariably a predominantly young public, for jazz, with its capacity to express unequivocal emotions in the most direct manner and its gallery of potential heroes and symbols, is a music ideally suited to adolescence. Except perhaps in Britain, the original nucleus of fans always contains a very large element of sons of good families, students, and the like, in rebellion against the world and their elders. This is so even in socialist countries where jazz, thanks to the official opposition to it, has often become a banner of rebellion for such groups as the Still Yagi in the USSR, who are very often the sons of highly placed and conventional parents. Because it is rebellious, the aficionado community finds affinities with movements and ideologies of opposition, and sometimes, as in the Anglo-Saxon countries in the 1930s and after, may become impregnated with it. But normally, being vague and individualist, it remains on the margins of activity, and tends to attract those who want to contract out of convention as much as those who wish to overthrow it. The jazz of the 1920s was non-political, that of the 1930s and 40s attached itself to the left, and no doubt overlapped a little with its activists, just as it is likely that in some socialist countries it is vaguely anti-socialist, and may overlap a little with anti-socialist activities but on the whole we shall not expect many fans or amateur trumpet players to build, or perhaps even to man, the barricades. Mostly they will eventually retire into one form or another of official orthodoxy, remembering their turbulent past only as the proverbial young American executive of the post-war films remembers the little Italian girl with whom he had a passionate affair in Rome before returning home to the rat race and the battle of the sexes. In Britain, and possibly in other countries about which I am uninformed, the core of the jazz public represented another kind of rebellion, and a more serious one, the aspirations of the culturally and educationally underprivileged young for official recognition. Perhaps this is one reason why its political connections and activities have been much more persistent here than elsewhere. Round this nucleus, another wider and vaguer jazz public has emerged, as jazz has become better known. For these young people jazz has been not so much a cause and a banner, though all adolescents make themselves symbols of their separation from their elders, as a fashion and a convention. It is part of their life at a certain age, like playing tennis or going camping or going to espresso bars. There is a wide difference between the atmosphere of the jazz rebel, with his penchant for low life as much as for music, and the atmosphere of the characteristic British Mass Jazz Club of the early and middle 1950s, 
where nobody drank, or wanted to drink, anything stronger than Coca-Cola, or smoke anything stronger than tobacco, and where the songs about whores, fancy men, gamblers, and tough men echoed through an atmosphere which was much less like that of Storyville than like that of an old fashioned youth club, minus the organizers. In a way this sort of public was and is a great deal more like the public jazz was made for than any other. Few jazz occasions recaptured the New Orleans spirit, as distinct from the New Orleans environment, better than the riverboat shuffles or jazz carnivals which came to be organized in Britain, one or two steamers would be hired to go to Margate and back, a selection of bands playing, or relays of musicians would play for an Albert Hall filled to the brim with working-class adolescents having the time of their lives. By aficionado standards, few of these were serious jazz fans. It was simply that for them jazz had become what Viennese waltzes were for their grandparents and shimmies or foxtrots for their parents, the normal kind of music for dancing and a good time. A third form of jazz public, if it can be so called, has also developed round the original nucleus of the fans, those who take no particular interest in jazz, but recognize that it has become part of the cultural scene, and must be treated as such. Jazz has been slow thus to establish itself, except in the Scandinavian countries where, in Denmark at least, jazz classes appear to have been organized in schools, and jazz concerts officially subsidized even in the early 1930s. Even in America official recognition of the fact that jazz is the most original musical contribution to civilization made in that country has been slow. Fortunately, for it is very doubtful whether jazz flourishes any more than folk song in an atmosphere of academic music schools and seminars or symphony concerts. However, little by little the patent appeal of jazz has been reflected in the institutions of orthodox culture. Jazz reviews have appeared in serious journals, jazz programs on serious broadcasts. At bottom all this amounts to no more than the recognition that jazz is now something about which the well-informed person ought to know enough to hide his ignorance. But even that is something. 11. Jazz as a protest. The atmosphere which has surrounded jazz almost since the beginning is so overcharged with emotion as to make it extremely difficult to explain in purely musical terms. The first English writer to deal seriously, if inadequately, with jazz, R. W. S. Mendel, observed this as early as 1926. Unlike earlier light music, he noted, jazz was actively disliked and subject to the most violent and slashing attacks one and this, he thought, probably accounted for the failure of any composer of the front rank to take it up. It was so strongly disliked, he argued, because it upset us more and stirred us emotionally more than older kinds of light music had done. So it does, but the upsetting is by no means only musical. Let us simply consider the extraordinary fervour which jazz has been able to rouse fairly consistently among its devotees, and which leads young jazz lovers to treat famous musicians as something like models, heroes, or saints, and more mature ones to leap over the barriers of non-musical loyalty with astonishing ease. L.T. Dietrich Schultzkone of the German army spent his war leaves in Paris working on the 1942 edition of M. Delaunay's hot discography, though the French jazz lovers' community was, for obvious reasons, extremely anti-German. When captured at Lorient, he interrupted the negotiations for the surrender of the local German troops by asking whether anyone collected Benny Goodman records. It is difficult to see the devotees of other widespread international hobbies pursuing their passion quite so far. Again, the views of the Soviet authorities on jazz have been known at least since the middle 1930s. They disliked it, and regarded it, sometimes not unjustifiably, as a phenomenon of bourgeois decadence. When views on such matters were expressed by the leaders of world socialism, Communists in Western countries normally assumed that they were sensible or justifiable and often made extraordinary efforts to convince themselves and others of this, sometimes in the teeth of their own previous liking for, say, Rilke, Brock, or Alban Berg. At all events they normally made few attempts to express contrary views in public. Yet it is no exaggeration to say that no communist jazz lover and there has been a disproportionately large number of them has ever taken serious notice of Soviet hostility to his music. 
this was regarded as an aberration, due to ignorance, or at best as something due to purely local Russian conditions, an attitude which communists might profitably have adopted on other questions also. So far from taking notice of Russian views, British communist journals printed serious jazz reviews continuously even in the peak years of Stanovism. Clearly, jazz rouses remarkably powerful and tenacious emotions among both its supporters and opponents. In this chapter I wish to suggest that this is due to the fact that jazz is not simply an ordinary music, light or heavy, but also a music of protest and rebellion. It is not necessarily or always a music of conscious and overt political protest, let alone any particular brand of political protest, though in the West, in so far as it has had political links, they have been pretty invariably with the left. It is hard to see how it could be otherwise, since even the most apolitical jazz lover must be committed to opposing racial discrimination, which is publicly defended only on the right. But a good many of the protests and rebellions which jazz has at one time or another embodied leave politicians cold and unsympathetic. The French boys and girls who, in 1942, were arrested by the Germans in the Paris metro dressed in flash, impertinent, provocative suits and dresses, and wearing a badge with the words Un France Swing Dance on Europe's Zizoué, can only just be fitted into the category of the anti Nazi resistance, even though several of the poor things ended in labor camps. Point two such protests may become political because the people against whom jazz lovers protest, for instance, fathers, mothers, uncles, and aunts, happen to hold certain conventional views, some of which are political, for instance, republicanism in the USA. Or they may be labeled subversive chiefly because those against whom they are directed cannot conceive of a rebellion against some of their conventions as anything but a rebellion against all their views, for example, as un-American. The point is not that the jazz protests can be fitted into this or that pigeonhole of orthodox politics, though it often can mostly into a left-wing one but that the music lends itself to any kind of protest and rebelliousness much better than most other forms of the arts. There is historic justice in the story of the seven striking Nottinghamshire miners who, at the end of 1926, were fined three pounds each for forming a jazz band and making life difficult with it for a black leg three it is a music for expressing strong feelings of dislike. This is due, in the first place, to an element jazz shares, alas, with Tin Pan Alley, it is democratic music. As the organ of the British popular musicians wrote in one of its first editorials, at the beginning of a career of consistent and passionate championship of jazz. Jazz is a new cult. It is probably a grand new art, and it has this advantage over straight music that it appeals not only to the fauteuils but to the gallery also. It considers no class distinction. Jazz was originally music designed to be enjoyed by the least intellectual or expert, the least privileged, educated, or experienced citizen, as well as by others, though the specialist jazz aficionados have been much more reluctant to admit this than the players. It was also designed to be played by men who have picked it up anyway. The jazz listener does not require the sort of preparation which is needed to listen profitably to a fugue, the jazz player can perform without the sort of training which is needed to sing coloratura, though this does not mean that either fails to benefit from training. More than this, jazz is a musical manifesto of populism. The Merry Widow might be the musically modest citizen's grand opera, but the jazz band, real or pseudo, was in no sense an imitation of a culturally more ambitious or respectable genre. Loud, raucous, sounding, even without the pseudo-jazz additions of tin pans, motor horns, and funny hats, like nothing on earth except an undisciplined brass band playing in a room too small for it, the pioneer jazz band nailed the colors of its vulgarity firmly to the mast. It appeared not simply because people liked the sound, but because it was a conquest of popular over minority culture, like that of the Marx Brothers who break up a performance of grand opera by getting the band to play Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Several things may flow from such populism, good and bad, for those of us who are for popular art as for popular government must be prepared to recognize its considerable drawbacks. At its best the democracy of jazz produced an ideal of art in society wider and socially sounder than that of the orthodox minority culture, 
though recognizing and admiring its achievements. For instance, it gave people who, in terms of classical music, would have been doomed to remain pure listeners or simple executants, the chance actually to make, i.e. to create, not merely to reproduce, music. It has produced scholarship and serious critical discussion of art among people whom the orthodox arts could never bring to this point, audiences whom gossip columnists contemptuously describe as not the most intelligent that have been seen, who listen, with absolute attention, in absolute silence, and in their thousands, to what would in orthodox terms be considered a reasonably difficult chamber music recital, and what is more, who discuss them as the old Viennese musical public would. Discuss the rival merits of Fertwangler and Bruno Walter. It has come nearer to breaking down class lines than any other art. At least I know of no other which could produce a table full of sax players from a West Indian orphanage, American soldiers from a black neighborhood in Cleveland, journalists, dons, salesmen, and sutteners single-mindedly debating the stylistic differences between the East and West Coast schools of jazz. At its best the democratic protest of jazz merely means that this music stakes a claim to a serious participation in the arts for people who would, but for it, be mostly debarred from such participation, and its appeal for such people is therefore strong. At its worst it degenerates into philistinism. For if jazz is designed for the least intellectual or expert, the least prepared, privileged, or experienced citizens as well as for others, this also means that it appeals to the most stupid, ignorant, lazy, and inexpert, who do not like what they cannot understand, or what requires effort, or knowledge, or expertise. It is true that this sort of philistinism surrounds the jazz-influenced kinds of pop music much more than jazz itself, whose strict devotees are generally shocked by the prospect of simply sitting back and enjoying themselves, the critics more than the musicians. The Hollywood films in which the hero, after a disgusted flirtation with long hair music, lifts the saxophone to his lips, pushes his body into convulsions, and finds the girl, the money, and the way forward, are about the stars of Tin Pan Alley. For these the contempt of the strict jazz public is often as boundless as that of the classicist. But if jazz has influenced and colored pop music to the extent it has, it is largely because the pop public took so readily to an idiom which flaunted its vulgarity, for exactly the same reason that take me out to the ball game played in the middle of grand opera sounds much more outrageous when played by a brass band than by a string orchestra. Nor is it any use denying that even many jazzmen have regarded their music not as an addition to serious music but as a straight competitor to the classics. In the second place jazz is a music of protest, because it was originally the music of an oppressed people and of oppressed classes, of the latter perhaps more obviously than of the former, though the two cannot be kept rigidly separate. It has, of course, made perhaps its most powerful appeal to middle and upper class aficionados because of these social origins, nobody has ever started a movement of emotional commitment to Cherny's exercises, which are not less interesting than some boogie-woogie piano, though in a different way, because nobody has ever felt like idealizing the 19th century lower middle classes en masse. But blacks have been so idealized, much to their justified disgust. The belief that the American black in some sense represented desirable elements which white civilization lacked has been widespread in America and Britain since the black-faced minstrel shows first became a standard type of popular entertainment in the second third of the 19th century. The search for the pure, the innocent, the natural counterpart of modern Western bourgeois society is as old as that society itself, for it reflects the permanent awareness of its fundamental flaws. Sometimes it took the form of simple exoticism and primitivism, the search for the noble savage, who might be located, according to taste, in Tahiti or the Corsican highlands, in the Caucasus or on the Arabian deserts. Sometimes, especially among members of the middle and upper classes, it took the more complex form of a sort of partial idealization of social groups who were, in other respects, hated, despised, and oppressed, workers, especially unskilled ones, and peasants, women, social outcasts like criminals and prostitutes, oppressed pariah peoples like blacks and gypsies. In such cases admiration was mixed with contempt, 
sometimes with fear which is often only an unacknowledged form of admiration for something we cannot do ourselves. The gypsy was filthy, thieving, superstitious, and treacherous, but spontaneous and free as in Merami and Vizez Carmen, which is the textbook example of this attitude, the southern black is for William Faulkner a rightly dominated subman, but also, by his very strength, emotional fervour and simplicity a sort of reproach. Among the more rebellious minorities, mainly of intellectuals and artists, the idealization was much more simple, the Milo of gangsters, pimps, and prostitutes, as represented in, say, Becker's film Cask Door, was quite simply more heroic, free, innocent, and in its roundabout way, just because it was one of outcasts and protesters against social convention. In terms of jazz, jazz is good music because it is believed to derive not simply from blacks but from the red light district of New Orleans. The emotional, and often quite irrational, bias in favor of blacks and black lowlife has always been extremely strong among serious jazz lovers. Politically left-wing aficionados have attempted to counter it with the argument that jazz is a people's music of both black and white oppressed, though for historic reasons the blacks have formed and advanced it most, and practiced it best, and for sociological ones the low-life zone of large cities has provided its best nurseries. But though this view has won some intellectual assent, at least when not put forward in its more extremist forms, it has not really disturbed the fundamental black bias of most of the older jazz lovers. Point for this bias, especially among some traditionalist zealots, can reach the point of mania as when one, white, historian of jazz writes that white men cannot even play it, or another argues that. I may say that authentic jazz can be created only by Negroes, any other jazz by white men, is not authentic. They cannot emulate the feeling and expression of their Negro contemporaries, because they are alien to the mystical and profound inspirations which motivate the Negro musician. Point five. The desire to become a white Negro, of which Mesrose really the blues is the best literary expression, is merely the most extreme form of this attitude. It may be as well to remember that this is merely an inverted version of the more orthodox type of racialism, such as that of the people whose hostile reaction to syncopated dance music is attributed by them to everything connected with the nigger. Point six: The fact that the one attitude leads to civilized behavior between peoples and the other to Nazi or South African barbarism should not obscure the equal irrationality of both. A good deal of jazz criticism is permeated by less extreme versions of the same pro-black race feeling, and this sometimes affects critical standards. Color prejudice in reverse, what black intellectuals used to call Crow Jim, must not be confused with the obvious recognition, which implies no belief in mysticism or blood, that the origins and evolution of jazz are more closely linked with the history of American blacks than with any other group of people, and that up to the present the supremacy of black players in jazz is about as obvious and perhaps even more unchallenged than that of Jews in chess playing. Of course it may be argued that this is partly due to the practice of critics, since about 1930, of establishing the criteria of good jazz in terms of the achievements of black players, but I do not think the general superiority of, say, Armstrong, Bessie Smith, and Charlie Parker over any of their white contemporaries and predecessors can be wholly explained away in this manner. The point I wish to make is not that the role of blacks in jazz has been exaggerated, for it has not, but that the appeal of jazz for many white middle-class admirers is that it is a music of those who, by middle-class ranking, are socially below them. The lady leaves her castle with the raggle-taggle gypsies, not because they play so sweet, but because they are not ladies and gentlemen they are in fact gypsies. Apart from this, the protesting element in jazz owes less than one might suppose to its actual black character. For, paradoxically, the black's own musical protest against his fate was one of the less important elements in the appeal of jazz, and one of the latest to become influential. All American blacks, like all members of oppressed and underprivileged peoples everywhere, are always protesting against their situation in one way or another, by the very modes of their behavior, even if not consciously and deliberately. However, in times of relative political stability such as those when jazz was evolved, 
such protests are often indirect, elusive, complex, esoteric, and extremely difficult for outsiders to recognize as protests, because they are not addressed to them. Jewish jokes, often of a type which, if told by an outsider, would be regarded as anti-Semitic, are an extremely elaborate form of expressing resentment against the old ghetto Jews' position, but quite unadapted to become the basis of rebelliousness by non-Jews. Just so the innumerable self-deprecating in-group illusions of traditional Southern black culture are likely to be regarded by outsiders, and indeed by politically more advanced blacks, not as protests but as Uncle Tomism. And not wholly without reason, for one of the functions of such protests is to blow off steam without producing the explosions lynchings and pogroms which incautious practical rebelliousness might always provoke. At all events, the early phase of jazz, which is the one with the greatest general influence, the New Orleans style and its derivations and dilutions, is almost certainly the socially best adjusted music ever evolved by American blacks, the product of a cruel and unjust society, but one in which the black was allowed considerable emotional certainty and security so long as he kept his place within the ghetto where he played for other blacks. Unembattled, happy, Almost complacent is not a bad description of old style New Orleans jazz. Point seven this did not last, but its influence on white pop music, serious jazz, and the jazz public cannot be described as one of social protest. Only in the fervor hour of the spirituals and in the heartbreaking, but unsell pitying blues, did a note of genuine protest sound. But the vogue for these did not make substantial progress until the socially conscious 1930s. But even the unembattled kind of common people's music has the elements of protest in it, nor are these confined to the black people. It is not only their type of music which speaks directly from and to the ordinary untrained man or woman, in which people play as men speak, or laugh, or cry, only more so, and which, by virtue of this directness is a standing protest against the cultural and social orthodoxies from which it is so sharply distinct. It is any music specifically made by and for the poor, which however little intention of political protest. This may be illustrated by the example of an institution which has affinities with art and, incidentally, has had the most profound influence on the evolution of jazz, the poor man's church. The laboring poor have often, in Protestant countries, developed their own kinds of religion separate from, and in some respects opposed to, those of the upper classes point eight these almost invariably have certain characteristics. They play down the things at which poor and ignorant people are bad for instance, intellectualism, elaborate theologies, and the like and stress those in which they compete on equal and superior terms for instance, emotional fervour, moral enthusiasm, austerity. The educated preacher who appealed to Episcopalian and Presbyterian congregations among the New England, or Midland, middle classes, was unpopular among frontiersmen, mill hands, miners, or sailors, who admired the man or woman who punched the Bible and preached blood and hellfire in the style of the hot gospeling actor orator singer. Every poor man's Protestant sect, white or black, is essentially a ranting sect, whether it consists of Durham primitive Methodists in the 19th century, or hillbilly Baptists or the modern Pentecostal holiness churches, Adventists, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, such sects were much given to democracy. The congregation took an active part in the proceedings, by choral singing, amens, and hallelujahs, by speaking with voices and testifying whenever the Spirit moved a member, not to mention other means. The official gap between the preacher and the public was as small as possible, and the actual gap was no larger, since virtually any member who was moved and had fervour and eloquence and who has not, at certain moments, could become a preacher himself or herself. Again, for very much the same reasons, religious worship was unformalized and unritualized, spontaneous, and collective. Once again these characteristics appear in their purest form in black churches, and may be heard on the invaluable records of their services and music, but they may equally be found in white ones of whatever nationality, provided these reflect similar social situations. Such religion, even when not intended as a social or political gesture, was a protest. Every element in it exalted the ways and aspirations of the poor, the ignorant, and oppressed, the laborers, 
and appreciated the standards of the rich, the educated, the powerful, the upper ranks. The parallel of such church services with primitive jazz is not arbitrary, even if we leave out of account the very close links between the hot gospeling black churches and the rhythmic blues, which makes a childhood among the Pentecostal holiness people or the churches of God in Christ so valuable an education for the future jazz musician. Like such churches, jazz was systematically not like orthodox culture, and exalted the gifts and ways of untrained and ignorant musicians and dancer listeners in very similar ways. Like them, it went straight to the heart of ordinary people, because its technique was designed to do so. The most remarkable technical achievement of the blues, its capacity to sweep the listener to the right emotional mood literally within the first bar, sometimes by the first note, is one it shares with the gospel song. The techniques of the hot gospeler in prose, of the gospel singer in song, and of the improvising soloist in jazz are, as the word hot implies, fundamentally similar. These techniques have only occasional parallels in the orthodox arts, which rely on a much more elaborate and complex system of gears and transmission belts between the artist's emotion and its artistic expression. Only when we get an artist, himself, by the way, also a poor man's evangelist, like Van Gogh, who aims at immediate impact of emotion, do we find a procedure analogous to jazz. But its very nature and origins jazz therefore expresses some kinds of protest and heterodoxy and lends itself to the expression of others. The mere fact that it originates among oppressed and unconsidered people, and is looked down upon by orthodox society, can make the simple listening to jazz records into a gesture of social dissent, perhaps as generations of teenagers have discovered the cheapest of all such gestures. What they would do if jazz were ever to become domesticated and officially accepted, like ballet, makes for entertaining speculation. I do not propose to survey the various kinds of protest which jazz has helped to express in the course of its history the subject has been treated by psychologists, and may be left to them. My object has been to show, not why people require some way of making musical protests, or blowing off steam, but why, having these requirements, they should find jazz so eminently suitable. It is because it is common people's music, which, both by its social origins and associations and by its musical peculiarities, lends itself to such interpretation even where it is not designed for it. If jazz had not been on the American scene, some other form of the American popular tradition would unquestionably have come to take its place as a vehicle for protest, though hillbilly songs, cowboy music, or the vigorous and democratic products of the early, half folky tin pan alley, would not have made perfect substitutes. For jazz owes at least this to its black origins and associations, that it is not merely common people's music, but common people's music at its most concentrated and emotionally powerful. Because blacks are and were oppressed even among the poor and powerless, their cries of protest are more poignant and more overwhelming, their cries of hope are more earth-shaking, than other people's, and have found, even in words, the most unanswerable expression, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, sometimes I feel like a motherless child, good morning, blues, blues, how do you do? Because the musical language of jazz is Afro-American, it is more heterodox, and owes less even to the echoes of orthodoxy than other kinds of popular music. Moreover, because of its musical origins, it has used that most potent of musical devices for inducing powerful physical emotion, rhythm, as no other music familiar to our society has. It is not merely a voice of protest, it is a natural loudspeaker. What jazz protests about or against is, for our purposes, secondary. The protests which white intellectual Californian tramps, or British teenagers, or Johannesburg Africans, or Moscow Stilyagi, seek to express through it differ from one another, and from those of various groups of American blacks. They are also, incidentally, of unequal seriousness. It would be foolish to reduce them all to a single denominator. They do, however, have this in common. Jazz by itself is not politically conscious or revolutionary. The voice of men shouting we do not like this must not be misunderstood for the cry of this cannot last, let alone for the slogan this must be revolutionized. 
nor should artistic unorthodoxy be held to imply unorthodoxy all round, any more than the thief's unorthodoxy about the criminal law implies unconventional views about politics. In fact, until adopted by groups of intellectuals, jazz has lent itself to political revolutionism rather less well than other kinds of popular music, for instance, religious hymns. There is a sound reason for this. The origins of jazz lay among that section of the poor which, though extremely oppressed, is least given to collective organization and political consciousness, and which finds its freedom by sidestepping oppression rather than by facing it, the unskilled, pre-industrial, big city laboring poor. Being poor and oppressed, they sing and play about poverty and oppression as a matter of course. Folk song experts of the left have never had any difficulty in discovering flamenco songs expressing bitter hatred of policemen and judges, Neapolitan ballads idealizing brigand rebels, or blues of left-wing social significance. But equally, they have never been able to deny that the great majority of such songs, however persistent the undertone of resentment against poverty and oppression, are songs of private life and personal relations, the characteristic blues is and remains the song of the troubles between a woman and her man or a man and his woman. In a sense the strength of the slums, the brothels, the music halls, as nurseries of the popular arts derives from the fact that those who live in them and frequent them have no other regular outlet for their unhappiness than the making and experiencing of aesthetic impressions, living for kicks, as the phrase goes. For those who organize and fight, ecstasy is often a byproduct of collective action, art a part of it, like the choral song, which, as hymn or in a secular form, is so characteristic of such movements, with their frequent possibly their general tendency to puritanism. But jazz is anti-puritan, and the choral song plays no part whatever in it. It is the critics who have classified secular jazz and blues and the gospel song under the same heading, historically and socially the gospel people among the blacks have been strongly opposed to jazz and all it stood for, many jazz musicians and blues singers resentful and contemptuous of church groups. In much the same way the labor movements of Britain have generally been unenthusiastic about the old music halls, while the old music hall artists, in spite of their marked prejudice for the poor against the rich, were rarely political militants. The old British contrast between the pub miner, who was, more often than not, the less organized type, and the chapel miner, who provided the cotter of union organizers, has its less formalized parallels in the world of jazz. Few politically militant blacks were genuine admirers of jazz, at least until it had been borne in upon them, often by the propaganda of white intellectuals, that this music was an achievement of the race of which blacks should be proud. It was easy to associate jazz with radical and revolutionary politics, and in times of political ferment American jazz musicians were quite willing so to be associated, after all, if the poor, however unorganized and demoralized, have any politics, they must be on the side of the poor. In other countries, where the jazz movement had different social bases and often grew out of the political left, the links were sometimes closer. However, when left to itself, the jazz protest remained vague and ambiguous, because what it is against is far clearer than what it is for. It is against oppression, against poverty, against inequality and unfreedom, against unhappiness. It is, in a vague and anarchic way which has been misunderstood by the anarchist intellectuals who have taken jazz to their bosoms, against policemen and judges, prisons, armies, and war. There are no traditional blues in praise of battle, however pacific, only spirituals. The hatred of these things does not imply militancy. Very many American jazz musicians have expressed hatred and resentment of an unjust society, if only privately. Very few have been associated even with the active and organized fight against racial inequality in the way in which a good many prominent figures from more commercial popular entertainment notably from Hollywood have been Europe in the post-1945 period has known many American intellectual and artistic expatriates, but though several black players have settled here, largely because they are treated with greater human dignity in the old world, I cannot think of any political jazz refugees of either color to set beside the numerous political refugees from Hollywood or New York in the other fields of art. 
What jazz is against may be reasonably clear in theory, though it may find only a rather passive, evasive, and individualist expression outside music. The most notable of such expressions are perhaps the savage diatribes of the jazz-steeped nightclub satirists who became prominent in the later 50s, Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, and the rest. What it is for is much less clear. No doubt, liberty, equality, fraternity, and a chicken in the pot every Sunday, or every day, allowing for the American standard of living. However, these great slogans are less self-explanatory than even some who are not jazz musicians or jazz fans believe. And this has always beset the protest of jazz, like a good many other individualist and spontaneous protests, with a great temptation, that of settling for very small positive gains for official recognition, for personal satisfaction. Or, to be more precise, of oscillating between a discontent which can never be satisfied because, like the blue flower of the German romantics or the crock of gold at the foot of the rainbow, it is so defined as to be beyond satisfaction, and one which can be rather easily satisfied, by growing up, by being sent on a tour as cultural ambassador for the US government, by playing with the New York Philharmonic, or earning a lot of money. The yearning for official recognition is perhaps the most dangerous part of this temptation, because it affects not only the general appeal of jazz but also the music. It has always existed, even when the jazz players were perfectly content to blow out their souls as ordinary entertainers of a popular dancing audience, and the fans most vociferous in their contempt for the long hair arts. It is this which has caused jazz musicians of all styles time and again to insist on playing with string sections, for violins symbolize accepted cultural status in music, in spite of the uniformly disastrous results of such experiments. The film St. Louis Blues, which, like so many American films, is a compendium of widely accepted fictions, all equally miserable, illustrates this very clearly, like the film about Louis Armstrong's world tour, it ends in the apotheosis of jazz being played in a philharmonic auditorium by a lot of fiddlers the rebels of the arts in jazz settle for admission to their version of the Royal Academy, unlike the rebels in more sophisticated arts, who have learned better. Similarly, jazz lovers in both Britain and America have shown quite disproportionate resentment against the neglect of their music by the guardians of orthodox sound. Generations of them have grown up to repeat the same rare crumbs of praise for jazz by classical musicians, first or second rate, and to hail with touching gratitude the occasional recognition of jazz by the third program of the BBC or similar established cultural institutions the jazz fan, the jazz critic, have hitherto been hunted creatures. Few books about jazz fail to begin with, or to contain, a defense of jazz against its detractors. This feeling of inferiority, whether acknowledged or not, has been part of the jazz protest. It has produced such phenomena as the attempt to turn jazz into something equivalent to straight music the symphonic jazz of the 1920s, the devices lifted from Bach and Mio in modern jazz, the dressing up in morning coats and acknowledging applause by stiff bows, the systematic refusal to behave in any way like an old-fashioned extrovert entertainer. All this is understandable, perhaps inevitable, but it is to be regretted, for the strength of jazz is not the strength of the feeling of inferiority among its musicians or admirers, but that of an idiom which is, however limited, radically different from the orthodox minority culture. The British stage did not necessarily become better because actors have come to be given knighthoods. In one sense, the influx of the sons and daughters of the middle and upper classes has unquestionably weakened it, as Bernard Shaw recognized, how many British actors or actresses today can take King Lear, Othello, Cleopatra, or Lady Macbeth in their stride, as the Uncaite troopers of the 19th century could? Paradoxically, it is the simplest and least political jazz which has best resisted the temptations of compromise, respectability, and official recognition. Bessie Smith, who never sang in white theaters and would not have changed her style if she had, is like the blues the least corrupted and corruptible part of jazz, and therefore the purest carrier of the jazz protest. It may be significant that of all the biographies and autobiographies of jazz artists, those of the women singers express the irreconcilable bitterness of the underdog most persistently. Point nine. this is not because such artists are more immune to temptation. 
Often, indeed, the primitive and elemental musicians are far more willing than the sophisticated and emancipated ones to play what the public wants or to act as the public wants them to act. It is probably because they simply cannot sing or play any differently, being too unadaptable. If Armstrong were to play the Purcell trumpet voluntary, it would still come out like the blues. But this fact makes it harder for those who have no feeling of inferiority about jazz to champion its unique and radical merits. They can be easily accused of idealizing the simple, illiterate, and unemancipated. You want us to stay inferior is a charge readily brought against those who merely want to keep jazz independent. This is inevitable. The logic of the struggle for emancipation and equality makes those who fight for it try to demonstrate two things first and foremost, a, that they can compete successfully with those who claim superiority on their own ground, and, b, that they can abandon a way of life which has hitherto been associated with inferiority. The early feminists tried to show not only that they could pass university examinations as well as the men, but that they could do without feminine fripperies dressing elegantly, makeup, and the rest. Zionist Jews tried to show that Jews were good at farming and fighting, which had not hitherto been regarded as typically Jewish occupations, and rejected the valuable Yiddish culture of their East European ghettos as the badge of the inferior past. Those organizing African universities are highly suspicious of European advisors who suggest that they need not pay much attention to Greek and Latin. Do not the classics belong to the higher education of the Europeans, and is not the plan to cut them out merely a reflection of the desire to deprive Africans, even now, of the best education? There is some sense in such suspicions and such rejections, however exaggerated their practical results. After all, those who kept women in inferiority did very often idealize those parts of feminine behavior which happened not to compete with male achievements, be pretty, sweet maid, and let who will be clever. Anti-Semites never denied that Jews were clever or good at business, only that they were brave, hard-working, or honest. The champions of African inferiority are the first to idealize the unspoiled tribesmen as against the half-educated intellectual. The cries up the Puthan, down the Bengali Babu. Up the noble Bedouin, down the Egyptian schoolmaster. Up the brave and stupid Maasai, down the corrupt Kikuyu, ring through the history of racial oppression, just as aristocrats and employers are never tired of contrasting the simple old retainer or the loyal old operative with the inferior specimens of the peasantry and workers on the modern political scene. It is natural, and necessary, for those who feel themselves to have been kept under to resent this, and to demonstrate their equality by doing what they have been regarded as incapable of doing. But if it is natural that babies should be emptied with the bath water, care must be taken that they can also be put back. There is no technical reason why they should not, unless they have been dropped on their heads in the process. Probably they will be. Emancipated women have long stopped avoiding pretty dresses, emancipated Jews despising Yiddish stories and jokes. In due course, no doubt, emancipated American blacks will have their own New Orleans revival, being sufficiently distant from the Old South to separate the original cultural achievement of their people from the conditions of oppression in which it took place very likely by the time this happens the critics will be ready to warn them that a return to a dead past is not the same as the development of a living tradition, a warning which has hitherto had to be addressed mainly to young white musicians. In the meantime those who have no feeling of inferiority about liking or playing jazz can only continue to defend its genuine originality and achievements, even when they are combined with things which others would prefer to forget or put behind them. They can, however, also do something else. They can assist the emancipation of those who are oppressed and unprivileged, and feel themselves to be inferior. For that is probably the quickest way of making their point. Part 5 Selections from Writings for the New Statesman and the New York Review of Books 12. From the New Statesman, 1958-1965 Basie. Like all artists, jazz musicians play chiefly for the only public whose judgment they respect, that of other musicians. Like all artists, they run their art into trouble if they get too far beyond the control of the ordinary paying public which knows what it likes, 
provided it does not pay too much or no too much. If it pays too much, the temptation of Tin Pan Alley may be too great, Mr. Bill Haley's rock and rollers may be competent jazz players, but they can't show it in public. If it thinks it knows too much, it will get in the musician's way. Far and away the best kind of public is one which does not much mind what the musicians play, so long as, speaking broadly, they make the right sort of noise and perhaps loose off a few fireworks now and then, a public which will incidentally allow players and arrangers to satisfy their own consciences. Few places have provided better conditions of this sort than Kansas City in the years between 1920 and 1940, a hard-bitten and remarkably wide-open town which has revolutionized the world of jazz, largely through the agency of Count Basie's band, which emerged from it in 1936, and arrived at the Festival Hall on Tuesday. Let us be thankful for Kansas City. Count Basie and his 16 men are the finest jazz orchestra that has visited this country since Duke Ellington came here in 1933. Two of the British band leaders who reported in force at the premiere were heard to say to one another in the interval, that they proposed to take their bands off Waterloo Bridge into the river. One sympathizes with them, though the situation hardly calls for such extreme steps. Jazz as it is played by the Basie band is simply out of the reach of British musicians, and when they are again reconciled to the fact, they can continue to entertain themselves and us in their more modest way, as before. The band appeared in a decor which looked like a design for a sea lion's pool, and was supposed to symbolize its music. Anyone who saw the players, grayish and relaxed with fatigue after their journey, face the press a few hours before going unrehearsed on the stand, will appreciate their mere achievement in getting through the evening. Heaven knows what these soft-spoken and far from simple men with poker-faced publicity smiles think, as the cameras take the photos which look exactly like those taken in a hundred other cities, or as they play low life admirably for yet another time. But they don't show it. A combination of extraordinary natural rhythm, supple, controlled and easy, and of equally extraordinary craftsmanship, makes this band not only a superb rhythmic and blowing machine perhaps the best in the world today but unforced and alive. This is probably due to the men's complete confidence in their own technical equipment and in one another. There is no doubt that this band comes to us as a team near the peak of its collective form. Some of it is also due to excellent arrangements written for this combination of players and for no other, though lack of rehearsal with the microphones exaggerated the brass somewhat. But the band does not depend on routines, for a group of them semi-improvised the traditional Royal Garden Blues, which is far from their normal repertoire, with almost contemptuous effortlessness. Any way one likes to look at it, this is a very high-class band indeed. Its rhythm spreads with wonderful ease from the few deceptively simply chords with which Count Basie himself opens on the piano, to the rest of the rhythm section and thence to the brass and reeds until, as one admiring British musician said, every man seems to be his own rhythm section. The soloists are superbly stylish, notably Joe Newman, a slim and elegant trumpet, Frank Foster, a boyish saxophone sporting the small goatee of the avant-garde colored musician, and the trombone of Henry Coker. And the entire band refrains, with an almost insolent confidence in its powers, from the vulgar and simple tricks of the trade which set the teenagers rocking and rolling. It does not need them. At most it allows itself to batter at their emotions with a mass of brazen sound, but its best numbers are not its loudest, and the band knows it. Apart from a couple of bravura pieces for the drummer and the bass player, Basie makes only one major concession to his singer, Joe Williams, an impassive tall man who hides his thoughts. Williams is a jazz singer of considerable talent, who has greatly increased the band's popularity in America, but for one critic at least he cannot make Basie play the blues as James Rushing could in the distant days when he and the band first moved us with Sent For You yesterday. Anyone who wants to listen to a really first-rate colored band at the peak of its present form ought to hear Basie. Until Duke Ellington returns to this country, British jazz lovers will be lucky to hear anything which achieves or surpasses the standard of excellence. Parisian jazz. Artistically jazz, like haute couture, is a rather denationalist product. 
To the casual listener a New Orleans band sounds much the same whether composed of Scotsmen or Japanese, a cool quartet, whether composed of Singhalese or Swedes, which is natural enough since all are essentially imitating Americans. The only local school of jazz which appears to behave with real stylistic autonomy is that of the jive bands in the Johannesburg slums. Musically, therefore, the British jazz lover who visits Paris crosses no frontiers. The traditional jazz to be heard there is mostly worse than ours, the middle period and modern jazz rather better thanks to the constant presence of expatriate American musicians of top rank but otherwise there are few surprises. Mr. Kenny Clark, the drummer, holds together a variety of modern combinations at the Club Saint Germain, as he did in New York, including a startlingly good French pianist, Marshall Solal. Michel Hosser, Henry Renault, and their partners at the Chat Chi Pechi sounds like the modern jazz quartet, only not so good, because they are an imitation modern jazz quartet. M. Guy Lafitte, as good a tenor player as any in Europe, audibly echoes the Parisian expatriate Don Bias. As for the airy swinging trumpet of the veteran Bill Coleman and the blues playing Mez Mesro, who hold up the Trois Lets, they belong to Paris only because they live there and owe most of their international reputation to the championship of French critics in the 1930s. Socially, on the other hand, nothing could be more strikingly different from the jazz world of London than that of Paris. Though jazz has penetrated a long way into the zone of the certified and OK British intellectuals, the characteristic jazz fan here is still an adolescent electrician or apprentice tool maker, a draftsman or lab technician, a compositor, bank clerk or junior technologist. If H.G. Wells were young today, he would almost certainly belong to some jazz club, and it is not without relevance that science fiction has been an extracurricular interest of British jazzmen since before the war. Not so in France, where jazz is almost exclusively an anexia of left-bank intellectualism, and the sale of records dips sharply and regularly every June during the examination season, when the Lycines and students have other things to think about. There it has long been strictly okay. Jean Cocteau and Max Jacob Pudronis the review L.E. Jazz Hot in its early days, Sartre's. Le Temps Modernes has long opened its columns to André Hodier and Lucien Malson needless to say, a professeur de philosophie and at least one able professional bass player began his musical life as a graduate sociologist. When a group of avant-gardists wished to make a documentary film about the palais ideal of the post Mencheval a backyard Zanadu constructed by a Provençal douanier Rousseau with Blakeian leanings, which has long been a hobby of the ex-surrealists they naturally add a modern jazz soundtrack. A very good one too, by André Hodier. Except when they are tourists, the French jazz audiences look as though they have been rounded up from the terraces of the Cartier. Except when they are black Americans, French jazz players look like the intellectuals they are, that is to say either like the young Clemenceau or, allowing for glasses and the absence of the tonsure, like the young Abelard in a blue cardigan. The Parisian jazz world has a few remote outliers on the right bank, survivals of its origins around Montmartre, but fundamentally it exists between the river and saint sulpice Virtually all the jazz worth listening to is to be found between the club Saint-Germain, neatly placed 10 yards from both the floor and du Magos cafés, and the Troil Mail lets in the Rugalanda, where the intellectuals border on the North Africans. If jazz were not played in cellars one might well going from one to the other within earshot of some drummer or other, via the Tabu, Rudolphine, where players go after hours, flanked by posters advertising German abstract art, the Came Leon, Rue Saint-André de Arts, and the Rue de la Hachette, which has come a long way since Elliot Paul's A Narrow Street, for it now contains both the headquarters of M. Ionesco's drama and the heaviest concentration of jazz clubs in the city, including the Chatki Pechi and Maxim Saris Cabo de la Hachette, the liveliest of the dying tribe of New Orleans sellers. Explorers may tackle the Seagull, B.D. Rocheco Art, a street cafe where African musicians honk it out with more noise than finesse, Visiting players drop in at the Mars, Rue Robert Essain, for news of what goes on, but at bottom it is all on the left bank. It is a narrow, economically untenable world, which has ceased to expand, 
three years ago the French radio abandoned its annual amateur jazz contests. The provinces and the working classes have not yet come to its rescue, and in so far as they have turned to jazz, it is to the New Orleans music of Sidney Bechet, who gives 250 provincial concerts a year in a style despised by the Parisian avant-garde. The clubs charge excessive prices and are fast being replaced by discotheque joints without live musicians, the musicians, unless, American, stars, compete for casual work at 3 to 5,000 francs a night and may have to play for 1,500. No doubt the present depression which local observers put down to politics, though it also affects Britain, which has no Algerian colonels makes matters worse, but not much. Parisian jazz therefore retreats into marginal professionalism, occasional concerts, and film scores, which have lately multiplied, thanks to the commercial success of Vadim's film with John Lewis's score, and Louis Mal's Ascensure à l'Echefaud with Miles Davis. The most ambitious experimental jazz orchestra, André Hodier's jazz group de Paris, two trumpets, trombone, three saxes, vibes, bass, drums, has failed to establish itself commercially and remains a spare-time group whose members earn their living elsewhere. In fact, like Parisian dressmaking, Parisian avant-garde jazz is a minority taste which must depend either on those who can pay a luxury price for it or on the export trade. But the French jazz public is not rich, even though its parents sometimes are, and the only real export market is for the excellent books of French jazz critics and theorists, it is surprising how few French jazz records are released in this country. There remains the tourist trade, a natural sucker for seller clip joints, on which the jazz clubs can continue to rely, at least until the visitors begin to demand girls and floor shows. And yet, while French jazz maintains its intense intellectual liveliness and Paris its attraction for American musicians, somehow or other the horns will continue to blow in whatever is the most advanced style of the times. The Duke. Whenever Duke Ellington is mentioned, the jazz critics dust off their superlatives. Since most of them have already been used up to celebrate his present visit, a few categorical statements will do for the purpose of briefing the square readers of the new statesman. They may, therefore, take it that Ellington is certainly the most tuckle figure in jazz he has worn his title by right of elegance since the age of eight and probably the most original composer in the USA. His band is not only the finest but the oldest jazz orchestra, having functioned continuously since 1926 an awe-inspiring record for those who know the business chiefly performing its leader's compositions. All these things are almost as surprising to the convinced Ellington admirers as to the outsider, for though there is no doubt about his achievements, they are as enigmatic as his public charm, or as the behavior of his chief soloist, who looks and behaves like the most impassive of Orozco's Indians until he lifts his horn to produce the most lyrical invention in the history of the alto saxophone. The stature of a mountaineer is judged not by the height of mountains he climbs but by their difficulty. Jazz critics admire Ellington so profoundly because they know the nature of the musical rock faces he scales. He is more than merely constant Lambert's petit maitre, a painter of musical pictures with a remarkable technical mastery in the precise mixing of orchestral sound and the interplay of solo and orchestra. He is the man who first recognized and solved the unbelievably difficult problem of turning a living, shifting and improvised folk music into composition without losing its spontaneity. Anyone can use jazz devices in orthodox composition or leave cadenzas blank for solo improvisation. Nobody but the Duke, in a peculiarly anarchically controlled symbiosis with his musicians, has produced music which is both created by the players and fully shaped by the composer. He has been so unique and so far ahead of his time that even jazz musicians sometimes fail to appreciate his originality, surprised to find some revolutionary device of modern jazz anticipated in the early 1930s, and that by a man who sees no reason to break with jazz tradition. For example, Ellington, alone in this as in so many other things, has consistently kept in his music two of the oldest sounds in jazz, the liquid New Orleans clarinet and the heart-rending vocalizations of the southern blues trumpet. This remarkable man is now with us again for the weeks. A lifetime in the night world of show business, where blacks are acts and not men and only folding money is counted, 
has taught him to hide his intellectualism behind the mask of a courtly dresser and an expert on the women. It emerges in a certain bland ambiguity of his style, Ellington is a gift to students of ambiguity, and in his persistent musical wit. Perhaps it has also taught him to underrate his public, for at the festival hall he gave us the jazz equivalent of what a symphony orchestra would do if called to perform at a Butlin camp. But British jazz fans are probably more highbrow than the Ellington band, or perhaps more aware of a distinction which the Duke, who has an occasional fondness for cream chocolate music, does not recognize. However, as the band has no prepared program, it will no doubt adapt itself to the local demands. It is still unique and marvelous, though one of the Ellington musicians felt that, after a week's break, it was not yet quite played in again. This was, I think, a mistaken and unnecessary modesty. The Ellington musicians play, as the Moscow Art Theater acts, in a class of their own. Blue Note At a time when New York reports that religio LPS enter big-time stakes, album interest has suddenly focused on the religious kick, we are apt to search nervously for grains of comfort in the stubbly fields of jazz and pop music. We may find some in the fact that the current list of the 10 best-selling jazz LPS-EPS in Britain contains two discs of authentic, uncompromising, and uncompromised blues singers, the late Leroy Carr, Treasures of North American Negro Music, and the Terry McGee team, accompanied by Chris Barber. This advance of the blues is not unexpected. It is nevertheless a triumph for the small if influential band of fanatics which has for years systematically set out to infect an indifferent public with its own devotion to this difficult art, among them Humphrey Littleton, who has twice combined with Jimmy Rushing, and Chris Barber, who has pursued a fixed policy of importing blues and gospel singers for his band. So far as one can see Mr. Barber gets nothing but spiritual satisfaction from these imports, it is the blues singers who benefit by the chance to sing with what is, to the puzzlement of several critics, the most successful band in show business today. Few of those who came to hear the Barber Band at the St. Pancras Town Hall on Monday had ever heard, or even heard of, McKinley Morganfield, Muddy Waters, who also appeared on the bill. But it is a safe bet that henceforth this blues singer, like his predecessors, will have a public of his own. Muddy Waters, as his flamboyant trade name suggests, practices a type of singing as yet unfamiliar over here. Rushing stands four square on the floor, swaying his mighty bulk gently, and calling out his beautifully swung lines with ease, relaxation, and equanimity preferably against a big band, Little Jimmy Rushing and the Big Brass, Phillips LP. The late Big Bill Brunzi sang for the feeling of the words. Muddy Waters is a mannered, not to say a mannerist, singer who constructs patterns of voice and electric guitar, which make their emotional effect by systematically bombarding the audience with the loudest and bluest of blue sounds, a flamenco-sounding blues man. He is a large sleek hair gypsy-like artist, at any rate he has the calculating air of the gypsy musician bending over the audience figuring how far and in what direction to let out the emotional stops. Not so his accompanist and half-brother, Mr. Otis Spand, a chubby little player designed by nature to play the blues on a piano if ever a man was, and who ravishes us by nature as muddy waters does by artifice. An impressive team. There is no getting away from the blues, the most sophisticated and modern players return to it. The fascinating Thelonious Monk drags a somewhat intimidated Gary Mulligan into them on Mulligan Meets Monk. The late Art Tatum's trio blues can only be described as the Hotakal of piano blues, like Ulanova dancing Russian folk dances, the whole of this sensational record belongs in every collection. There is no getting away from the blues, and a good thing too. Count three. The wise man who enters a formal jazz concert crosses himself, knocks on wood, or, if a rationalist, merely hopes against hope that this time it will come off. But generally it won't. There are very few jazz combinations which can be guaranteed to produce exactly what the public expects when buying its tickets, that is, if the public's expectations are high. One of them is once again among us, and this critic, a natural pessimist, took his seat in the festival hall with perfect, and justified, confidence. Count Basie's band did not let us down. 
What it does is musically modest, even by jazz standards. The Kansas City formula for big band jazz, of which Basie is the master, and which is quite plainly the most workable yet discovered, is based on simplification and not complexity. I am not struck by some of the cuter arrangements by Neil Hefty. Out of the riff, the simple repeated blues phrase against which the soloist improvises, has come what Andre Hodier calls the massive phrase, which is the foundation of all the Basie does. There may be higher things in jazz, but if it comes to ensemble swing, there is not, and perhaps never has been, anything like this band. Individually the soloists are often not of the first class. Indeed, they are generally well below Basie's classic early band. But as a team they have relentless rhythmic perfection. That band, even playing pianissimo, can lift people out of their seats like a crane. To compare it with Ellington's, as superficial observers have done, is grotesque. Beyond the fact that both are big bands by jazz standard 16 men in this case they have nothing in common. Basie is no more like Ellington than Cobbett as a stylist is like James Joyce. Both write prose well, but the one is trying to do a much more difficult thing with it than the other. Ellington is a subtle composer, Basie the leader of a group which has evolved a foolproof version of the big band blues. Ellington's band is a group of touchy prima donnas, Basie's a team of superlative craftsmen, with the collective pride of an elite regiment. It must be the only band which itself finds players who turn up late. On its day the Ellington band is peerless, but its day is unpredictable. The Basie band, more modest in its ambitions, is utterly predictable, and consequently more consistently praised. What is equally to the point, Ellington is an individualist, Basie in the mainstream of jazz. The most remarkable thing about his success is that it is achieved by playing straight unadulterated jazz without gimmicks and acrobatics, a jazz independent of style in so far as it can absorb players of any style, e.g. the markedly modern Thad Jones and Joe Newman, with perfect ease. Even Joe Williams, with whom I was not much struck on the first visit two years ago, has developed into a first-class big band ballad singer, though he is still not my ideal of a blues singer. Trav Ellen all alone. Billie Holiday died a few weeks ago. I have been unable until now to write about her, but since she will survive many who receive longer obituaries, a short delay in one small appreciation will not harm her or us. When she died we the musicians, critics, all who were ever transfixed by the most heart-rending voice of the past generation grieved bitterly. There was no reason to. Few people pursued self-destruction more wholeheartedly than she, and when the pursuit was at an end, at the age of 44, she had turned herself into a physical and artistic wreck. Some of us tried gallantly to pretend otherwise, taking comfort in the occasional moments when she still sounded like a ravaged echo of her greatness. Others had not even the heart to see and listen anymore. We preferred to stay home and, if old and lucky enough to own the incomparable records of her heyday from 1937 to 1946, many of which are not even available on British LP, to recreate those coarse textured, sinuous, sensual, and unbearable sad noises which gave her a sure corner of immortality. Her physical death called, if anything, for relief rather than sorrow. What sort of middle age would she have faced without the voice to earn money for her drinks and fixes, without the looks and in her day she was hauntingly beautiful to attract the men she needed, without business sense, without anything but the disinterested worship of aging men who had heard and seen her in her glory. And yet, irrational though it is, our grief expressed Billie Holiday's art, that of a woman for whom one must be sorry. The great blue singers, to whom she may be justly compared, played their game from strength. Lionesses, though often wounded or at bay, did not Bessie Smith call herself a tiger, ready to jump, their tragic equivalents were Cleopatra and Phaedra, Billy's was an embittered Ophelia. She was the Puccini heroine among blues singers, or rather among jazz singers, for though she sang a cabaret version of the blues incomparably, her natural idiom was the pop song. Her unique achievement was to have twisted this into a genuine expression of the major passions by means of a total disregard of its sugary tunes, 
or indeed of any tune other than her own few delicately crying elongated notes, phrased like Bessie Smith or Louis Armstrong in sackcloth, sung in a thin, gritty, haunting voice whose natural mood was an unresigned and voluptuous welcome for the pains of love. Nobody has sung, or will sing, Bess's songs from Porgy as she did. It was this combination of bitterness and physical submission, as of someone lying still while watching his legs being amputated, which gives such a blood-curdling quality to her strange fruit, the anti-lynching poem which she turned into an unforgettable art song. I need hardly say that this superb record, with its companion blues fine and mellow, is not available on British discs. Suffering was her profession, but she did not accept it. Little need be said about her horrifying life, which she described with emotional, though hardly with factual, truth in her autobiography Lady Sings the Blues. After an adolescence in which self-respect was measured by a girl's insistence on picking up the coins thrown to her by clients with her hands, she was plainly beyond help. She did not lack it, for she had the flair and scrupulous honesty of John Hammond to launch her, the best musicians of the 30s to accompany her notably Teddy Wilson, Frankie Newton and Lester Young the boundless devotion of all serious connoisseurs, and much public success. It was too late to arrest a career of systematic embittered self-immolation. To be born with both beauty and self-respect in the Negro ghetto of Baltimore in 1915 was too much of a handicap, even without rape at the age of 10 and drug addiction in her teens. But while she destroyed herself, she sang, unmelodious, profound and heartbreaking. It is impossible not to weep for her, or not to hate the world which made her what she was. Status-seeking. Every day jazz is becoming culturally more respectable. To be precise, two quite different things are happening simultaneously. On the one hand, there are the usual attempts more common, for obvious reasons, in the USA than elsewhere to give jazz the accolade of accepted culture by putting it into symphonic programs, summer schools, university courses, and the like. On the other, there are the more numerous and significant attempts to make other cultural articles more attractive by borrowing jazz appeal, of which the Sunday TV program known in the trade as Jumping with Jesus is the most obvious. Messrs Christopher Logue and Charles Fox, whose jazz and poetry experiments still re-echo on record, frankly use jazz, among other things, to increase the sparse audience for poetry, though probably without success. But by far the most systematic attempt to draw jazz into the orbit of other arts has been made by the films. In the past two or three years the practice of commissioning film scores from serious jazz musicians has become almost as fashionable as that of making socially conscious musicals. Several examples are before us now, Ellington's soundtrack his first for Anatomy of a Murder, Mondel Mulligan's for I Want to Live, and, of course, the French ones, of which the most recent and unsuccessful is Thelonious Monk's soundtrack for Vadim and Valian's Les Liaisons Dangerouses. What has gone wrong with this at first sight exciting collaboration is simple and instructive. Roger Vadim is a technically bright director who, in spite of a good elementary feel for the moods of weather, sex, and decadence, has always lacked any sensitiveness to the world around him. He has merely observed that the people he makes films about listen to jazz in between, and sometimes while, making love, and therefore appear to regard jazz as little more than a suitably chosen background noise. So no doubt it is for them, but that is not enough for a film score, especially not for one of Les Liaisons Dangerouses, even for a version deprived of most of what made that book terrible and haunting in its original version, the transposition of revolutionary crisis into sexual terms. When Vadim commissioned the modern jazz quartet to do the music for Saeed on Jumais, John Lewis did the job of fitting the music to the sense and movement of the film for him. But, unlike John Lewis, Thelonious Monk, an eccentric and original composer, is also an almost purely self-contained one, who, one may guess, is not greatly interested in expressing or following moods other than his own, even if he were capable of understanding, or sympathizing with, what the characters in this film are after. In brief, all we observe is the pursuit of absolute logic by means of sex to the occasional accompaniment of music by Thelonious Monk. Good music, 
Monk is invariably worth listening to. But not a film score. Culture makes only a few tentative incursions into the massive program of Newport Festival Jazz which opened at the Festival Hall last Saturday, and that mainly in the performance of Dave Brubeck, whose piano borrows heavily from classical techniques which are perhaps unfamiliar to jazz audiences but otherwise not striking. I am told that at a subsequent concert the Brubeck Quartet came to life. My own view, that its merits are modest, is not modified by a second hearing, though one cannot deny talent and devotion in Paul Desmond, who lectures mildly down his saxophone like an economics don evolving a theory of international trade. However, Joe Morello is a beautifully delicate and elegant drummer, if a very academic one. Brubeck was followed by Dizzy Gillespie in a Somala cap, light grey suit, horn-rimmed glasses, and bent trumpet. Mr. Gillespie, Nobody who plays an instrument with such effortless technical command and musical intelligence should be put ronized, even by reviewers, is as old-fashioned and vulgar a showman as Louis Armstrong, a mugger, scene-stealer, a music hall comedian. He is at the same time an intellectual, and doubtless the only reason why he is no longer, as he once was, the acknowledged chief of the avant-garde, is because the fashion there is for a more serious, introverted, and humorless type of behavior. He played everybody else in the program under the table with contemptuous ease. I rather think that he is a great man. The Buck Clayton All-Stars, who are a seasoned band of campaigners from way back in the 30s, had some difficulty in establishing themselves after Gillespie, but within a short time their straightforward professional swinging reconquered the audience. Buck Clayton himself, blowing lightly and strongly, a master craftsman with feeling, Dickie Wells, still a wonderful trombonist, Emmett Berry, clear as only a jazz trumpet can be, and the rest, stood round on the stage like people at a cocktail party, moving casually into an old-fashioned front line to blow the audience out of their seats. The noble Jimmy rushing after a poor start, finished strongly with the immortal blues go into Chicago and sent for you yesterday. The old stuff is still irresistible. Culture enters hardly at all into the music of Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry, the blues singers who are once again with us. Anyone who does not go to hear them is a fool. Too cool. For those of us who are Hindus, Jews or, like so many American jazz modernists, Muslim, the 1950s did not exist. By our own calendars we have a few more years to wait before generalizing about the character of the past decade. Still, as we are surrounded by men trying to sum up the past ten years, it is perhaps impolite to advertise our heterodoxy. Very well, what, from the jazz critic's point of view, has been happening since 1950? Let me make no bones about it. Artistically the 50s, though producing a far greater quantity of jazz in a far greater number of countries than in any previous decade, were disappointing. American jazz, which is still the only one that really counts, remained parasitic on the achievements of earlier years. The young modernists experimented aimlessly and eclectically, with the incidental results, familiar to students of modern painting and poetry, of making one cool experimenter indistinguishable from several dozen others, but the only innovations which retained their power were those of Parker, Gillespie, Monk, and the men of the 40s. The most important jazz player of the decade, and the one who best typifies it Miles Davis is an altogether lesser man than those who dominated earlier, an Armstrong or a Parker. He is a beautiful, melancholy, technically rather limited individualist, but no chef diacal, though the leader of an exceptionally fruitful small group. The most talented composer leader of the period, John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet, has confined his great gifts to the interior decoration of a few musical drawing rooms. Compared to the vast mansions which were still being built and furnished by that old lion of the twenties, Duke Ellington, and the ruthless Bauhaus explorations of that pioneer of the forties, Thelonious Monk, Lewis's structures look pretty flimsy. The fifties did not even produce many new musicians of stature, a fact underlined by the long list of eminent obituaries during the decade, Bechet, Lester Young, Billie Holiday, Tatum, Catlett, Baby Dodds, among the older styles, Parker, Navarro, 
Clifford Brown among the moderns. Old talents were rediscovered or appreciated Monk among the moderns, Buck Clayton, Vic Dickinson, and several veterans of the 30s but there were few genuinely new faces. Most of this sterility was due to a wholly disastrous desire to intellectualize jazz, to make it academically respectable, and at ease among the conservatoires, summer schools, and biennales. Respectability is the death of a music which exists because it is a protest against artistic and social orthodoxy, and which operates in a way wholly different from straight music. Respectability does not even pay dividends, the man who, in the 50s, became with Paul Robeson and Kwame Krumah the best respected black in the world, was an old-fashioned jazz entertainer, Louis Armstrong. Fortunately for jazz the musical failure of status-seeking became steadily more obvious. The jazz tradition, expelled by the front door, re-entered by the back. The reputation of the 50s has been at least partly saved by what will, in retrospect, seem the most important phenomenon of their jazz history, the return to the blues. Unlike the revival movement of the 40s, which petered out in the 50s, except among the young European public, this was no archaeological reconstruction of the past. The blues which for Elise jazz, including the most experimental and far out, was the contemporary urbanist black folk music and gospel song which, thanks to the vast teenage commercial boom of the middle 50s, enjoyed a fantastic popular vogue in the debased form of rock and roll. It is no accident that many of the hard blowers among modern saxophonists play close to this style, that new musicians, like Coltrane and Ray Charles, have been drawn from the rhythm and blues field, and that connections with hot gospeling sex are today a valuable qualification for a jazz player. Jazz is when men blow out their souls, and not merely musical figures. That is why Big Speederbeck is remembered, not because he used higher intervals of accord as a melody line and backed them with appropriately related changes, thus anticipating Bird Parker. It is to the credit of the 50s jazz that, while not abandoning any of its technical sophistication, it began to rediscover this fact. Miles away. The most elusive of jazz musicians has once again escaped us. The trumpeter Miles Davis, who was recently to have opened a British tour, remains the only major living jazz artist whom we have not heard in the flesh, for reasons which are as vague and complex as all excuses for not turning up in show business. Under normal circumstances this would be no reason for writing about him, but Davis is the sort of wraith-like artist whose characteristics are merely emphasized by his absence. What the devil is there to him? Something, clearly, or else he would not have topped numerous popularity and critics' polls in various countries lately even in traditional Britain ahead of Louis Armstrong or even the technically far superior Dizzy Gillespie. But what? The question is in its way as difficult to answer about him as about Lawrence of Arabia, and for analogous reasons. The image of both men seems so much bigger than their measurable achievement. Davis is a player of surprisingly narrow technical and emotional range, perhaps outside traditional blues players the most limited artist to have achieved so high a reputation. Moreover, as has been pointed out, even within that range most of his records are not very good. A handful of tracks in 1949-50 established him. A series of carefully spaced records since 1957 confirmed him, but even this latest, and by common consent most fruitful, phase of his art contains some notable failures such as his leaden and dragging Porgy and Bess. On the other hand, on much of Milestones and some of Kind of Blue, it contains genuinely imperishable stuff. And yet, what even the worst of his mature records radiate, and what almost certainly explains Miles's remarkable success, is an absolutely unmistakable sound and mood. The sound, at its most characteristic, is a very slow, ghostly, muted, faraway lyricism rather like what we might have expected if Tennyson had blown a jazz solo instead of writing Tithonus. The mood, as one might expect, is one of total introversion and ranges from a reflective melancholy to naked desolation, but these sound as though felt by someone who, though not suffering from nightmares, is never quite awake. It is a sleepwalker's art, a lonely sound which plays before, after and beside, but rarely with other players. It is quite unforgettable. 
Film critics have an almost infinite capacity for not noticing soundtracks, but when Miles Davis did the accompaniment to a recent French thriller, recorded as Lift to the Scaffold, as usual on Fontana, Miss C.A. Lejeune did notice it. She said there was too much brass. It is a genuine if unorthodox tribute to Miles's power to project himself, all the more so as there is only one trumpet on the film track and as Miles rarely raises it above his customary remote echo sound. What else is there besides this strange personality whose power lies in Davis's uncompromising hostility to the outer world? A genuine talent for improvising long, simple, often hauntingly beautiful arias, sometimes against backgrounds scored by Gil Evans. A gift, unexpected in so essentially uncooperative an artist, for inspiring the musicians who play with him in the small groups which are his natural habitat. The rare ability to suggest vistas beyond the sound of his horn, stretching into some sad sort of infinity. I do not think that he is a great artist, because as yet he lacks both the tragic and the comic dimension. But there are few more genuine poets in jazz, and no player who would make better background music for an exhibition of romantic art. The present vogue for him is justified, but I should feel happier if the young men and women for whom jazz is the only adequate expression of their view of life, chose for their symbol a player whose art was less close to self-pity and the denial of life. Manhattan Solo When good Americans die they go to Paris, but when good jazz fans die they unquestionably go to New York, it is to be hoped with a lot of celestial folding money in their pocket, for this city is no bargain. On any given evening, somewhere between the Battery and the Harlem River, about three-quarters of all living jazz musicians whose names are known to the foreigner can be heard or seen. Like everything else in this astonishing stone battleship of a city the twin peaks of the midtown and downtown skyscrapers are its turrets the concentration of jazz is awe-inspiring. And yet like so much else in New York, it has little organic connection with the city. Jazz is just there, a minority among the other minorities whose sum total makes up the town, though the increasing conversion of Manhattan into a black and Puerto Rican borough will make it sound louder as time goes on. To be precise, New York jazz is at least two minorities, and it is disturbing that they have so little relation with each other. Uptown there is the jazz of Harlem, the one that does not even get advertised in the New Yorker, otherwise a faithful guide to the music. This is the sort of noise you hear corning out of the dark belly of the L bar on Broadway and West 148th, the visceral sound of Marlo Morris's rhythmic organ playing, rather like Crystal Lizard Glue, or in the top club on West 145th, which is a simple-minded place where men to go drink, girls to hustle and bartenders to give short measure. A little band, led by a former dancer, operates on the stand between the bar and the tables with two poorish sax players, a splendid swinging trombone called Buster Cooper and a handsome sweating shaven-headed entertainer, Titus Turner, who sings ballads, shuffles, but above all shouts some very gratifying fast city blues with comedy effects. It is not very ambitious music, but by God the place jumps and the clients at the bar laugh and stomp their feet as men ought to do when they are enjoying themselves. Those who listen to this music are not fans, they are just people who like to have some entertainment while they drink. Those who play it are craftsmen and showmen, who accept the facts of life in the jungle with disconcerting calm. The best drummers, says an eminent trumpeter over a drink, are either working or in jail. Maybe they are, but this is the kind of statement which visiting Englishmen have to take time to digest. A few miles downtown is the other kind of jazz, the avant-garde. Let me make no bones about it. This is by far the most impressive jazz played in New York today. Much of it is no doubt disappointing. John Coltrane at the Jazz Gallery is, like so many sax players, in urgent need of sub-editing. Dizzy Gillespie, at the same place, makes his concessions to the higher culture by not actually clowning, but he still refrains from using those incomparable gifts which make him potentially the greatest jazz musician alive. But Ornette Coleman at the five spot, in the confines of the Bowery, is a deeply impressive artist. The Far Out Boys do him an injustice by insisting on the revolutionary character of the sounds which, in defiance of all the rules of all musical games, 
he produces out of his plastic alto sax, and which can only be described in words which carry unwanted overtones of depreciation, squeaking, neighing, honking and such like. Widening the technical range of an instrument is not enough to make a player more than a freak. The unforgettable thing about this very dark, soft-handed man playing with a vertical fold over his nose is the passion with which he blows. I have heard nothing like it in modern jazz since Parker. He can and does play the chorus of a standard straight with an intense, voiced, lamenting feeling for the blues which lays this critic flat on his back. He swings. Beside him his trumpeter and pupil Don Cherry sounds a thin piper of experimental exercises. Coleman is a big thing in jazz, and it is to the credit of New York that it has recognized him in a few months, after years of lonely playing in the wilderness of the West. But who has recognized him? The public at the five spot is overwhelmingly young, white, and intellectual or bohemian. Here are the jazz fans, white or black, with the draft Stevenson buttons, lost over their $1.50 beer. If Coleman were to blow in Small's Paradise in Harlem, it would clear the place in five minutes. Musicians such as he are, it seems, as cut off now from the common listeners among their people as Vabern is from the public at the Filey Butlins. They depend on those who are themselves alienated, the internal emigrants of America. And their tragic paradox is, that the value of what they blow lies not where they are going, but where they are coming from. The tragedy of modern jazz, as of most modern art, is that it moves further away from its roots. Far out west. Intellectuals are at present more strongly in favor of San Francisco than ever before. It is very beautiful and, as American cities go, untypical. Khrushchev was welcomed here, the local students have organized demonstrations both against the Un-American Committee and the American Legion, which has retaliated by reaffirming the guilt of Sacco and Vanzetti, and across the bay in Berkeley they have actually bred a strain of courteous cops. Instead of mobsters. San Francisco has a waterside union run by Reds. Its beats, looking indistinguishable from their European equivalents, produce the largest amount of bad poetry for any square mile of the world, but still, poetry. By common consent, it is a good place to live in and a holiday from the rat race, a place still haunted by the shades of the age before togetherness, by the giant robber barons of the Pacific, the over eyes labor heroes of the 30s. Why, in defiance of all right-thinking sociology, at least one local radio station still angles its commercials frankly at the working man? I need hardly say that it plays, not jazz, but 24 hours a day of hillbilly music. Whether another aspect of San Francisco, which affects the jazz lover, rouses sympathy or not, depends on taste, it is a tight city. There was a time when this place was as wide open as any in the West. The citizens still take pride in recalling the occasion when Eisenhower, returning from Korea, gave a special salute to a particularly delirious group of female voters who happened to be the girls from the city's leading brothel. For there was action along the bay, plenty of action. This is so no longer. Mayor Christopher, a Greek the cops and the graft are Irish, has shut the place down, and the far-seeing elements are already worrying whether the combined pressure of Reno and Las Vegas, which have every interest in seeing other towns moral, will keep the lid permanently half-closed. But it is a well-known fact that jazz flourishes best in wide-open towns, for that is where there is most employment for musicians. For a city which enjoys a world reputation as a jazz center. San Francisco therefore possesses surprisingly few, and not very outstanding, resident musicians, and not much more than half a dozen jazz clubs, including the North Beach jazz and poetry type joints. What it does possess is a massive, enthusiastic, and knowledgeable jazz public mostly young, intellectual or bohemian and therefore a power to make reputations which is much appreciated in the business. It made Brubeck and Cannonball a Durley. More recently, and characteristically, it has made chiefly the stars of the savage, jazz impregnated social satire which flourishes, of all places, in nightclubs, Mortsall and Lenny Bruce. 
Saul stands for wit, intellect, self-consciousness, and hatred of the right, Bruce who disappears behind his Mimi cries for emotion, no self-criticism, horror and hatred of the squares. Saul can, at a pinch, be understood by anyone who knows about America and psychoanalysis, Bruce is almost incomprehensible except to those who are steeped in the world of what Bernard Wolfe's Broadway novel called The Late Risers, The Agents and Acts, The Musicians, and Junkies, The Hustlers. But, like the other artists made by San Francisco, these two have followed the money east and are now only occasional visitors. There is one exception to this exodus, San Francisco made the New Orleans revival in the early 1940s, but the musicians are still here, living off expense account advertising men and the solid, but thinning, ranks of those who were young in 1940, a closed and passionate community. This public has provided a haven for meritorious old-timers who have made their homes here, Kid Ori on the Embarcadero, Marty Marsala at the Cupid Doll and the marvelously undimmed Earl Hines at the Hangover, though he has had to camouflage himself as a Basin Street type, which suits his piano style about as well as the Petrushka music would suit a real fun fair. But there is no limit to what a public with preconceived notions will impose on an artist. I have lately watched the legendary blues shouter Sam Lightning Hopkins performing to a packed, young, washed and wholesome house at the University of California Folk Music Festival. Hopkins, a lean, quietly wolfish character in very light slacks, white and black shoes, dark jacket, bow tie and dark glasses, was clearly at a loss. They had given him a proper folky guitar instead of an electric one. They were selecting a repertoire for him, in tune with the folknicks. He hadn't quite settled down to the new act, which was shaping towards the elderly frail black preacher from the south, full of folky wisdom. He sang well, though not juiced up enough to be in really high gear, casually, in a voice both gravelly and soft, with a light, lifting guitar. Occasionally the voice bit like a pick. But he did not holler. That blue, rebellious, and desperate shout from across the Texas tracks was no longer there. For the rest, jazz in San Francisco is what happens in the beat joints, far out, but not so good as London, what is on the two local all-jazz radio stations, and what comes on tour chiefly the Ellington Band, which followed the girls with the 44-inch bust in fax too, business is business, until the place was closed down for non-payment of taxes. This was the jazz of our dreams, in the place where it belongs, melting a hard assembly of middle-aged lawyers, doctors, journalists, and fixers like traditional brides. It reconciles me to much of the U.S., even to the memory of Louis Armstrong, on the eve of his 60th birthday, giving the Studebaker commercial over the air, tomming as they say from the heart. The old school. In America they would have had it the other way round, but in our tradition-minded country jazz at the Philharmonic, Festival Hall, respects seniority. Cannonball Adderley's quintet opened, an up-and-coming group led by a good saxophonist who has made modern jazz palatable to a mass public and is capable of more than he has yet given us. A collection of venerable and famous names closed the show. The most dazzling among them were Joe Jones, a bald extrovert drummer of vast and merited reputation, and unshakable rhythmic reliability, who ought to inspire several new clichés, light as the touch of Joe Jones' brushes, and Benny Carter. Jazz critics feel about Carter as artists feel about some master of line like, say, Angra, boundless, but vaguely cool, admiration. This is why he has rarely of late had his full critical due. He stood before us, watching the audience across his alto like a Latin maitre d'hotel his dining room, and blew a single, firm perfectly judged line of sound at us the way a champion skater performs his figures. If Haydn's Prince Esther Hazy had ever required a jazz player to liven up his musical entertainments, he might have done worse than choose someone like this cool, gentlemanly, extraordinarily original artist, who last stayed with us before the war, when the new statesman did not yet report jazz concerts. Coleman Hawkins, looking like an ambassador in a vodka advertisement who happens to be holding a tenor sax, blew like a young man dissatisfied with all previous approaches to the instrument, even to some extent his own, and he practically invented it. 
This evening it didn't quite come off, but greatness must be saluted. Unlike him, Don Bias did not fight the natural lyricism of the tenor. Roy Eldridge, perhaps below his best, was on trumpet. The most impressive performers of the evening, technically, were J.J. Johnson who plays the trombone as if it were a trumpet, and the unique Dizzy Gillespie, trumpet, the mystery man of jazz. Nothing is beyond this fantastically talented and intelligent musician, the first chef diacal of the modern jazz revolutionaries. Then why is it that his dead contemporary, Charlie Parker, is a legend, and his live co-revolutionary, Thelonious Monk, is once again an acknowledged musical innovator of stature, while Dizzy is merely the most dazzling trumpeter in the world. Why did Miles Davis, who is a beginner on his instrument compared to Gillespie, impress critics and public on his recent British tour as few other visitors have done, while Gillespie merely creates an impression of unsurpassable brilliance? Is it because this extremely reticent and devious artist hesitates to do the one thing which can raise a jazz musician to the very top, to reveal his soul? I do not know. But if ever he were to give us what is in him, a great many prevailing critical judgments would be sharply revised. Mahalia The age of Billy Graham and MRA is not the ideal one for a great religious artist. At any rate after Mahalia Jackson's third song Two Elderly Ladies, who looked more familiar with church services than the rest of the audience, walked out, leaving the Albert Hall to the sinners who can recognize the most majestic voice of faith they are likely to hear in our generation. Mahalia Jackson, a huge, firm-fleshed woman whose face, radiating an internal beauty in repose, contorts with the love of the Lord when she sings, is one of those artists who are beyond good or bad taste. Musically and textually most gospel songs are sorry doggerel and distinctly inferior to the godless blues which Miss Jackson steadfastly refuses to sing. There are many musicians who would give her a more swinging accompaniment than Miss Mildred Falls, whose large light blue figure sits by Miss Jackson's broad expanse of shining mauve. None of this matters, for Mahalia has the awe-inspiring gift of communicating the original and true meaning of words. When she sings the word soul, we know what it is. When she sings O oh Lord my God, sending out her leonine contralto like a gigantic whip, or you never walk alone, placing each syllable separately like a pillar of steel, we are with her in Zion. When she sings I found the answer, now the sun is shining for me each day, we believe her. Her answer is joy, a much rarer emotion than one might think, for it requires us not merely to accept life, which most of us eventually do, but to believe that it is or could be good. Mahalia's repertoire, which is very much her own, though as a solid showwoman she listens to advice about audience preferences, contains little at present about heaven and nothing about hell, but plenty about trust, certainty, and exaltation. Even the traditional spirituals she sings at present, with the rocking drive of a big band, are those of confidence rather than longing, down by the riverside, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Elijah, Jesus met a woman at the well, and especially that gospel cavalry charge, oh didn't it rain. No doubt the joy of the gospel song is all the more massive because it contrasts with the uncertainty of real life. No doubt it is religious, because only in the spirit can the poor and mistreated be really free. As Mahalia sings, varying a familiar verse of English folk song if religion was a thing that money could buy, the rich would live and the poor would die. But it is joy nevertheless. It is unequivocally for life, a rare trumpet which gives a certain sound. Her astonishing voice can produce anything from a small, round, convinced sound in the upper register to a deep, soft chest tone of immediately communicated ecstasy and that unforgettable jubilant archangel call. As a good professional she knows her instrument, tending to finish each song with a characteristic effect generally a deep smeared, rough-edged, bent sound placed somehow obliquely to the note it represents. As a good blues singer, she sings exclusively for the words, guided only by the basic pulse of the gospel beat. She is perhaps a shade less florid and more tranquil than in the past, with less of a tendency to build her solo as a series of increasingly hot choruses but her native sense of swing is an unerring as ever, 
her power to announce the good news in the idiom of our century best designed for the communication of emotion as great as ever. We can congratulate ourselves on two things, that this very great woman and artist is universally appreciated as the queen of gospel singers, and that she has done us the honor of visiting this country. Reluctant Monk In France the hall would have been wrecked. As this was London, those who plainly regarded Mr. Thelonious Monk as a clumsy boar merely walked out in a well-bred but marked manner. This was comprehensible, for Mr. Monk, a sardonic and fey person at best, ostentatiously lost interest very soon, or else retired behind his private fortifications. Yet anyone who fails to hear him will miss one of the few original achievements in jazz. Of the three or four real jazz composers Monk is the most primitive and limited, because nearest to the improvising soloist. Some great players, especially technically successful ones, soon discover what they can do and go on doing it, like Johnny Hodges, who plays today as he did in 1931. Luckily. Some, like Parker or the Beaterbeck of Bob Fats Navarro, suffer physically from their inability to leap over the chasm which separates the man who blows from the man who can also get others to express his ideas. Monk, perhaps because his piano technique is inadequate for his ideas, has had to leap that chasm. But what preoccupies him as a composer is what fascinates the innovating soloist, experiments in timing such as that extraordinary retarded, limping rhythm of his, instrumental adventures he makes his bass play, at excessive length, like a blues guitar, but above all the ceaseless exploration of phrase and harmony. Fortunately his own compositions are mostly based on simple themes, which do not lose their shape even when taken to pieces in every conceivable way. He is not unaffected by current fashion, as witness his return to the oldest and most elemental figures of the piano blues. It is merely his curiosity, his search for new, even accidental, effects that never changes. All this we knew and sometimes regretted, for the line between planned experiment and artistic abdication or incompetence is hazy, as in modern painting, and Monk has neither the technical mastery nor the staying power which enables an Ellington or John Lewis to maintain a steady level. Nor has he their orchestral sense. But what Monk's quartet revealed at the festival hall in at least two pieces was a self-discipline, a taught classicism, greatly assisted by the admirable Lester Youngish tenor of Charlie Rouse, and a capacity not merely to indicate the directions of jazz advance, but to occupy, in a formally satisfying way, some of the new territory. And how many people are there today who can do this? Not Art Blakey's jazz messengers who shared the bill with Monk. They are a first-class group with the strength and weakness of the blowing session, drive and virtuosity, on one hand, undisciplined trailing solos, rudimentary arrangements, or cliches on the other. A properly arranged dat there, one of the finest modern numbers I have heard in a long time, showed what they can do. Their chief asset is Art Blakey, a fantastic but somewhat obtrusive drummer who keeps an iron control over the rest, and a cadaverous young trumpeter of great promise, Lee Morgan. Hello, Satan. Who writes the bony poetry of the blues? Nobody knows. A sung blues is a selection and combination of lines and phrases, polished and fitted together by a succession of singers into an aesthetic whole as unplanned and coherent as an old-fashioned small town square. To seek a single author is to miss the point. Except with Robert Johnson, the greatest of the Mississippi singers, and the only blues shouter whose voice is identifiably that of an individual poet. Virtually nothing is known of him except that he was born and raised on a plantation in Robbinsville in the Delta, was probably killed by a woman at the age of 21, or, as some claim, 30, and recorded 29 blues at two sessions in 1936-37 before disappearing from sight. Sixteen of them, including the fantastic ones from the second session, have now been reissued on a long-awaited disc in the classic Jazz Masters series, BBL 7539, by Phillips, the big company which reissues the most interesting jazz at present, and to which we also owe the marvelous John Hammond's Spirituals to Swing Concert of 1938, TFL 5187 8, and the Bessie Smith Blues of 1923 4. 
Johnson is not easily appreciated, for his deep southern accent is almost incomprehensible without repeated listening. One would willingly trade the anecdotage of the sleeve notes for the only information which really matters the text of his haunted songs. The special and identifiable tone of Johnson's poetry is that of a man driven by fate and his own emotions. Both are personified in symbols and monsters standing by his side. I got to keep moving, I got to keep moving. Blues falling down like hail, blues falling down like hail. I can't keep no money, hellhound on my trail. Hellhound on my trail, hellhound on my trail. His technique is not original. Visionary passion presses the usual worn images to a factual precision which gives them life. The blues is not merely personified, good morning blues, blues how do you do, it is a real figure blues walking like a man. The singer is not merely a man on the road, like any other. I got stones in my passway and my road seem dark at night. Got stones in my passway and my road seem dark at night. I have pains in my heart, they have taken my appetite. For Johnson is doomed. His day is spent in the company of the devil. Early this morning when you knocked upon my door. I said hello Satan, I believe it's time to go. He knows he is not only unhappy but evil, as the mentally enslaved black believes himself not merely oppressed but rightly oppressed, for white is good and dark bad. Like that of the medieval vagabond artists, his tragedy is the Christian one of damnation. The cruelty of his god is the price he pays for his poetry, the brief and uncertain pleasure of women his only relief. I can tell the wind is running, leaves shaking on the tree, shaking on the tree. I can tell the wind is running, leaves shaking on the tree. All I needs my little sweet woman to keep me company. Johnson sings in a high African voice, neither fast nor dragging, accompanying himself with those frighteningly definitive blues sounds on the guitar. There is energy in his song but no hope. The world and the soul are his jail, and though he does not say so, his peoples. He has been dead these twenty-five years, but attention must still be paid to such a man. He has written his own epitaph. You may bury my body, oh, down by the highway side. So my old evil spirit can get a greyhound bus and ride. God. Ray Charles comes to us with a greater preliminary flourish of typewriters than any previous jazz artist from the USA not excepting Louis Armstrong. He comes not as one but as three persons, a jazz and blues man, a pop star and a hipster saint, fourth in line to Lester Young, Billie Holiday, and Charlie Parker. All he still lacks is a holy nickname like Prez, Lady, or Bird, though I understand in extremist circles a claim is being staked for God. The combination is not only powerful but unique. Charles as a pop star is big by the standards of real size in that field, which are financial. He is said to make more than £300,000 a year, and even when we make allowances for publicity agents' attitudes to figures, he is a very rich artist, and quite certainly the biggest pop seller among those formed purely in the jazz mold, and the richest of those unhappy outsider figures whom the hipsters choose as their culture heroes. It is the combination of the minority and majority elements in him which makes him so significant a phenomenon, though also one very difficult to judge lucidly. Fortunately Charles's rise to the top has been so rapid that it is still possible to recall him clearly in his pre-mythical phase. I experienced him first in 1960, in Oakland, California, when he was already as big a draw as anyone in the black market especially among the down-home immigrants from the South and Southwest but still totally unknown to all whites except a tiny handful of jazz and blues lovers and some teenagers. His rapport with the black middle class was slight. I heard him at a function organized for this king of public, which approximately recalled the atmosphere at a Golders Green bar mitzvah party, and he went dead. On the other hand, in the same town, among the 4,000 at a rock and roll dance, who treated our contingent of a couple of dozen whites politely as unpersons, his performance was sensational. The dance was in effect a secular revival meeting to celebrate sex instead of God, and even today his strongest numbers deliberately use the tried hot gospel machine for whipping up divine ecstasy, to heat the bedrooms of our imagination. 
a pure gospel number, shared between the call of Charles at the piano and the response of the four very undivine looking roulettes, and apparently about the Lord, will end with the consciously shocking words, I'm talking about my baby. Old-fashioned worldly blues singers like Big Bill Brunsey disapproved of this tearing down of moral frontiers. He's a mess, he said, with some justification. He's a crying sanctified. He's mixing the blues with the spirituals. I know that's wrong. You shouldn't mix them. He's got a good voice, but it's a church voice. At all events the congregation in Oakland reacted as though a prophet were present. There was not much dancing, merely a general, silent, mass slow heaving, broken by occasional cries of assent and release. It was an extraordinary experience, deeply moving and disturbing. The audience at the Finsbury Astoria was not like that although, since Charles has never quite captured the jukebox jury public over here, it had some affinities with Oakland, being largely an audience of jazz lovers rather than pop fans. The tension was lower, and Charles had also diluted his material with the pop market numbers which have made him such a wide seller, such as ballads and a sort of lacrimose hipster hillbilly. It was possible to judge him dispassionately for about half the time. He is, let us make no mistake about it, a very great star. His alto playing is undistinguished and his piano playing far from outstanding. Nor is he technically a great blues singer, though he is an entirely genuine one. But his voice has star quality to an astonishing degree. Since Charles is blind and therefore virtually immobile except for a few tentative jerky steps and a shifting of his dark glasses it must carry the entire burden of his communication with the audience. The big band is, or was on this occasion, nowhere near as tight and electric as such a talented group should be, and the roulettes are mere adjuncts to Ray. But the voice is remarkable, soft and furry or abrasive at will, at times high, clear and ecstatic, keeling over into the strangled frenzy of the Top Gear preacher, or full of a hot desperation. It would not be right to say that he manages it with the light, contemptuous certainty of a champion, though his professionalism with a microphone is obvious. Ray Charles exists in that border world of the great performers in which the distinction between sincerity and insincerity, between deliberate effect and living emotion, has lost its meaning. What he does coolly, plays on his emotions as well as ours, what he does in passion, comes out as showmanship. The monstrous saker is a frightening spectacle. The hunched, thin, unhappy blind man who can sing careless love, which is about something quite different, milking all the public's emotion out of the repeated, dragged out, at once ambiguous and clear lines once I was blind, but now I can see, can make even the insensitive shiver. There is no mystery about why he has maintained the full loyalty of the jazzmen from among whom he has sprung. What he sings and plays is the blues, ancient and modern, and they can comfort themselves with the thought that he proves what they have always known, that what they feel in jazz and the blues can capture the millions. There is no mystery about his popular appeal. Once the masses have become acclimatist to the idiom of the blues, as they have been, thanks to rock and roll, it is inconceivable that a man of Charles's gifts should not mow down like grass any audience with the slightest experience of adult emotions. And there is no mystery about his cult among the hipsters, for a blind orphan black, in trouble about narcotics and putting down authentic jazz, exactly fits their specifications. It must be said, however, that he is neither as original nor as great an artist as the other gods in the hipster pantheon. Unlike Billie Holiday and Parker, and in spite of the publicity, he is not a genius, and is intelligent enough to be the first to admit it. What links the audience at the Finsbury Astoria with the Oakland immigrants and the American teenage record buyers is not merely the quality of the voice. It is the idiom of the black big city ghetto, which has become, through jazz and its influence on popular music, the idiom of our modern western urban sub-civilizations. It is the nature of the song, the cry of the victim, the defeated, the outcast, the lost and isolated individual for whom nothing of real value remains except private intensities of feeling. For them the senses have replaced the sense of life, and Ray Charles is what Marx said of religion, the heart of a heartless world our own.
One must salute talent when one sees it. Charles is a star. But one cannot escape the thought that a world in which he is a star is an unhappy and a sick world. Duke. Duke Ellington has at last decided that the English are grown up, at any rate those numerous English who are prepared to cancel even their skiing holidays to listen to him. Slowly, because he is as used to morons as anyone else in the business of popular entertainment, of which he has formed part for 40 years, he has realized that London need not be fed violin solos of autumn leaves, or even potpourries of past Ellington Iana. His present program does contain one casually strung together medley and, luckily, a few of those simple, sophisticated and indestructible tunes which for many of us mean Ellington, things ain't what they used to be, superlatively carried by Johnny Hodges, Caravan, Stompy Jones. But most of his program was new, unfamiliar and, which shows an even greater confidence in the audience, highbrow. The band plays four pieces from a new and as yet uncompleted Far Eastern Suite, the product of last year's government-sponsored tour to Asia, two pieces from Ellington's incidental music to the Stratford, Ontario Timon of Athens and, above all, the rarely heard tone parallel to Harlem, a long suite which is, by common agreement, Ellington's most ambitious and successful composition. Possibly the old master has extended his admirers an unvogish assembly with a high proportion of spectacles and adults and a low quota of beards and girls a little too far. It's more like an LP, was one opinion overheard in the foyer, and the applause was sometimes dutiful rather than mad. Yet the professional musicians, students, and young technicians, the now middle-aged accountants, salesmen, doctors, and teachers, who make up the hardcore of the Duke's British public, are used to getting a sense of solid satisfaction rather than bacantic revelry from him few of them, alas, have heard him on his home ground, a nightclub stand and that certainly is what they all felt. They are wrong. Nothing but wild enthusiasm will do for what Ellington gave us. His present band, except for the reeds, is not without weaknesses on the solo side. There is no trombone voice to balance the sentimental Lawrence Brown, nor the sort of trumpet note which Shorty Baker provided so well. Cootie Williams, back in the band after many years, brings to it an intense, introverted, primitive blues cry, an echo of Golden Age Armstrong, but what he now plays seems specialized and technically undemanding. Rolf Erickson, a Swede, plays brisk but colorless flugelhorn. Yet the quality of the music and the novelty, which keeps the players on their metal, more than offset these weaknesses. The Duke, plainly, is in one of his creative periods and the band knows it. Ellington's strength and weakness is that he is essentially a pop composer. He thinks in images and memories. The word Harlem suggests the first theme of his suite, the bass walks us through our conducted tour of the place, pretty girls turn into pretty tunes. His Far East has much of the orient of cabarets called Soraya and cinema mood music. He brings to this pop world the astringency as well as the sentimentality of the man about town, a marvelous cool and skipping wit, and the entire tradition of black music, what is elsewhere mere archaeological excavation, the down-home blues, the Creole clarinet of New Orleans, the stride piano of the twenties, is the living matter of music in the Ellington Band of 1964. He brings to it his peculiar genius for orchestral writing. How many composers, live or dead, can get the precise and planned effect of the passage in the Harlem Suite in which the bass alternates first with Hamilton's liquid clarinet, then with Procope's huskier one, backed by Gonsalves, until the strong entry of the trombones precisely pointed up with the trumpets. Pop-based music does not fly high, emotionally except where the fate of Ellington's people is at stake it has its limitations, which come out in the Shakespeare scores. But his pop roots do not prevent him from writing serious music perhaps the most serious being written in the US Duke Ellington is a great man, a unique figure in the history of modern music. His orchestra will eventually die with him, and records alone will preserve his irreproducible works. Can we afford not to listen to him when he does us the honor to treat us as an audience worthy of him? New thing. The penalty of art in our time is that it is supposed to progress, and consequently to develop an avant-garde. 
the penalty of salesmanship in our time is fashion change. Since jazz has, for better or worse, come to consider itself an art, and since it has always had to sell itself on the market, it has developed both a belief in the importance of progress, and of an avant-garde, and a cycle of fashion change. You have got, as they say, to pay your dues. Jazz began to suffer the consequences of this adjustment to modern culture about the time of the Second World War. Before then its low social status had preserved its independence. There was no special prestige in being a jazz musician, for even within the black ghetto it was not a respectable, though it could be a very prosperous, occupation. The jazz musician was an entertainer, and if his private inspiration did not coincide with the taste of the public or the bookers, he would not be an artist, but merely a janitor or postman. The most eminent of older black musicians still preserve the pattern of behavior of this professionalism, though sometimes with a considerable admixture of irony. Duke Ellington knows, and knows that by now most of his public knows, that he is a great deal more than a sort of glorified musical valet of the leisure classes, as in the Cotton Club days, but his public comportment is still that of a Jeeves who humors a public of Bertie Woosters. Again, though jazz undoubtedly evolved and much faster than any other kind of music in the 20th century it is extremely dangerous to think of its changes as analogous to those of the orthodox arts. Its framework was that of working craftsmen, their object to start with perfection and not novelty as such. For a great many of the older artists, perfection came with personal maturity. Once they had developed their style, they might vary and deepen it, but they hardly thought of changing it, and when they were tempted to do so, as the great Coleman Hawkins was at one time by bebop, the results were not usually encouraging. That is why the jazz of 1935-40, when the music first reached a satisfactory stage of technical maturity, is still practiced by virtually all the musicians who had made their reputations by that period. The lessons and novelties of the later period have been absorbed, but have not been allowed to swamp the basic classical styles, Ellington is once again the great example. Fortunately, they may be heard to this day from the saxophone of Ben Webster, now on a welcome return visit to this country, from the trumpet of Buck Clayton or the trombone of Vic Dickinson, who have also come back to us, and of course from the mouths of the simpler and older blues singers like the indestructible Joe Turner. For out of the Kansas City of the 1930s, with which all these excellent visitors are associated, came the most lasting formula for orchestral jazz so far evolved. None of these artists has any bias against more modern developments in jazz, but none of them has the slightest feeling that somehow they ought to have kept up. The jazz revolution of the early 1940s changed all that, though not quite as radically as it seemed in the great days of Minton's. Dizzy Gillespie himself has quietly returned from the furthest outposts of the avant-garde to a renovated version of classic swing, but then Gillespie, a remarkably intelligent, ironic, and well-balanced artist without the slightest tendency to self-destruction, has always had more in common with the older professional virtuosos than the Charlie Parker Ramboians who set the pace for the new movement. Still, from the early 1940s there was for the first time in jazz an avant-garde which cherished its musical revolutionism as such, saw itself as doing the peasantry a favor. The novelty of the boppers lay not in the mere fact of experiment. It lay, to quote Sidney Finkelstein, in working out a conscious, sometimes rigid system from the new elements, which in turn reflected a new generation of jazz players claim to special status as revolutionary artists. Before Parker, men play jazz, sometimes in older, sometimes in newer ways. After Parker, some of them played modern jazz until new generations of rebels made them old-fashioned. The curious thing is that it took 20 years for this to happen, though not for want of trying. None of the jazz experiments of the late 1940s and 50s produced an accepted corpus of ultra-revolutionism. The most successful of them produced self-contained adaptations of the modern idiom, such as Miles Davis's or the modern jazz quartets, but not with the possible brief exception of the cool jazz of the early 1950s schools. The more deliberately progressive fell flat, though there is now a renewed interest in people like Lenny Tristano as precursors of the new thing of the 1960s. 
neither did the attempts to fuse jazz with modern orthodox music, third stream, start any general stampede in the direction of the symphony orchestra. By the end of the 1950s modern jazz appeared to have settled down, after its exploratory youth, into its own form of traditionalism hard-swinging, blues and gospel-influenced neo-bopping. What passed for novelty was often the rediscovery of long underrated artists like Thelonious Monk. Since 1960 a new official avant-garde has appeared. At all events it now has a label, the rather despairing one of the new thing, a number of young players in New York following in the steps of the masters, Ornette Coleman, Cecil Taylor, the late Eric Dolphy, a number of septics among both musicians and critics, and some non-playing champions like the militant black writer Leroy Jones, whose book on the blues has attracted deserved praise. As usual, everybody finds it a lot easier to say what the rebellion is against than what it is for. It sets aside tonality, the unwavering beat, the conventional chord structure, and improvisation that is chiefly based on chord progressions. Such definitions are no more helpful than the Sybil line statements which jazz avant-gardists have now taken over from the avant-garde painters who used to have a quasi-monopoly of such nonsense, such as, for musicians only, time is not speed, it's distance, and sound is measured motion. If the new thing lasts, we shall no doubt retrospectively discover the rules of the game, since without rules there is no game. Freedom is not a program, but simply a declaration of the intent to secede. Meanwhile those of us who do not claim to understand the new thing including this critic can merely grasp at two fairly substantial straws. The first is the fact that there is a new movement in New York, though very little of it is heard over here except on a few Blue Note or Emmy records, and not much is heard in Manhattan because the public does not want to pay for it. We are now clearly past the point when anything that sounded vaguely unfamiliar, like the gimmicky multi-instrumentalism of Roland Kirk, was hailed as a step forward, since the exhaustion of the 1940s idiom was evident. The second, and more substantial, is the sheer quality of some of the new musicians, such as Ornette Coleman and the more intellectual Cecil Taylor. There is in the best of the new music a ferocious passion, in Coleman often recognizably based on the blues of his native habitat, just as in the worst there is lots of excessively long, loud, and undisciplined doodling. There is at its best an ability to find genuinely original and suitable noises for a recognizable human predicament, so much so that the new thing has been called, wrongly, a music of social protest a musical equivalent, maybe, of Harlem Maoism. On the other hand, one must make two obvious reservations. The first is that the present school will not necessarily turn out to be the main vehicle for the new departure in jazz. Some of its stars may have neither the technical nor the emotional staying power to hold a movement together, neither Ornette Coleman nor Sonny Rollins, for instance, have returned audibly better than before from their self-imposed retreats into silence and rethinking. Some of the more widely publicized new thingers, like the saxophonist Archie Shep, have yet to prove themselves. Still, it is a promising sign that there are new saxes, for the history of modern jazz can almost be written in terms of a succession of boss reed players. Older innovators, who somehow just missed being elevated into Chef's diacal, like Mingus or Bill Evans, may retrospectively turn out to be equally important. Finally, the new thing won't determine the future of jazz until the ordinary non-avant-garde players absorb its innovations. Unlike the painting avant-garde, which rests on the prices fetched by individual works, and on patronage, the jazz avant-garde cannot yet be parlayed into prosperity by a few dealers and critics. It has to sell records, and it has to attract a paying public, and so far it is doing neither. Above all, it has to be played by the craftsmen, the way modern jazz was played by the frustrated musicians in rock and roll bands. Perhaps it will be, perhaps not. But it does look as though, for the first time since Parker, a fresh phase has begun. 13. From the New York Review of Books, 1986 to 1989. Playing for Ourselves. Sometime in the 1950s American popular music committed Parryside. Rock Murder Jazz. Count Basie describes a moment of the murder in his autobiography. 
there was a heck of a thing going on at a theater down on 14th Street somewhere, and we used to get down there at around 11 o'clock and you couldn't get near the place for the crowd. I remember this and I also remember how things went. The first acts would go on, and the kids would all be jammed in there having a ball and applauding and whistling. Then when it came time for us to go on, just about all of them would get up and go outside and get their popcorn and ice cream and everything, and we just played our act to an almost empty house. Then when we finished our set they would all come back in. No kidding. So we would just go downstairs and play poker till it was time to go on again. That's the way it actually went. Those kids didn't care anything about jazz. Some of them would stay and come down front and stand and listen and try to hear it as long as they could, and we would try fast and slow, and it made no difference. That was not what they came to hear. To them we were just an intermission act. That's what that was. It didn't mean anything but just that. You had to face it. If anyone wanted to turn Good Morning Blues into a play, this image of the aging band leader stoically accepting a deeply resented defeat might make a good curtain. But Basie's career continued for another 30 years, though his memoir rather races through them. He did not quite see the current resuscitation of jazz as the American classical music of the professional middle class and the dinner music of lower Manhattan yuppie restaurants. One can hardly speak of a real revival until the music ceases to rely primarily on survivors of the days before the 1960s. These last decades before he died in 1984 were not the most distinguished in the career of what was not the greatest big band in jazz. Basie himself constantly stresses the supremacy of Ellington but was, in many ways, the quintessential expression of the populism of jazz, and jazz remains much the most serious musical contribution of the United States to world culture. Basie is a central figure both in the golden age of the music which coincided with the New Deal years and in the discovery of jazz, hitherto a music of unrespectable poor blacks and hip flask swigging white dancers, as an art to be taken with the utmost seriousness, and a breeding ground of great artists. The discovery was largely the achievement of political radicals who devoted themselves passionately and selflessly to the joint cause of the blacks and their music, without, as Basie underlines, exploiting them. Point one in the debates about the history of the American left in the Roosevelt period that are now raging, this achievement in music of the Reds and fellow travelers of the time has not been sufficiently appreciated. Until it loses itself in the repetitive details of touring and personnel changes, Good Morning Blues is therefore of considerable interest to anyone who wishes to understand the evolution of one of the few 20th century arts that owe nothing to middle class culture. And the original Basie band, recognized as the purest expression of big band swing as soon as it roared out of Kansas City, owed less to the middle class and intellectuals than any other except, of course, its discovery and training for fame. It was not much of a reading band at its best. In its heyday it used little except head arrangements. I don't think we had over four or five sheets of music up there at that time, Basie recalls. It was not a respectable band, even by jazz standards. The arranger Eddie Durham, used to the college men in the Lunsford band, found Basie's group too much for him. They didn't believe in going out with steady black people, in the words of Gene Ramey, whose sketch of the Kansas City atmosphere in Stanley Dance's invaluable collection of interviews, now republished, is one of the best. They'd head straight for the pimps and prostitutes and hang out with them. Those people were like a great advertisement for Basic they didn't dig Andy Kirk. They said he was too uppity. But Basie was down there, lying in the gutter, getting drunk with them. He'd have patches in his pants and everything. All of his band was like that. This is not the image stressed in Good Morning Blues, a notably reticent work in many ways, though in fact the attraction of the milieu of gambling, good times, women, and, not least, whiskey, constantly shines through the cracks in the autobiographical facade of the elder jazz statesman. His book brings out, perhaps more clearly than any other memoir, both how attractive and how important to the development of the music was that floating, nomadic community of professional black musicians, 
living on the self-contained and self-sufficient little islands of the popular entertainers and other night people a street or two where the action was, rooming houses, bars, clubs which were scattered like a Micronesian archipelago across the U.S. For that is where players found a milieu that accepted the overriding importance of professionalism, of getting the music right, of the strange marriage between group cooperation and ferocious competitive testing of individuals, which is analogous to the milieu of that other creation of working class culture, professional sports. Once again Basie's understatements and exceptional indeed for the autobiographer excessive modesty muffle his account. The most he allows himself to say in the way of hype is I don't mean to pat myself on the back, but that band was strutting, really strutting. He is much more likely to record occasions when he suffered or evaded defeat than to exult in public. The band's true sound of locker room triumph is to be heard elsewhere. We were only Count Basie's band, and we got out of a ragged bus, but when we got on that bandstand we started jumping and showering down. We put a hurting on them that night and washed Lunsford out of the dance hall. The trumpeter Harry Sweets Edison, quoted in Stanley Dances the World of Count Basie. The conviction of the early Basie band lay in this capacity to exult. For the professional musician of Basie's day, as he himself puts it, playing music has never really been work. It was more even than a way of having a good time. It was, as sport is for the athlete, a continuous means of asserting oneself as a human being, as an agent in the world and not the subject of others' actions, as a discipline of the soul, a daily testing, an expression of the value and sense of life, a way to perfection. Athletes cannot use their voices to say this, but musicians can, without having to formulate it in words. So the working class athlete's conviction produced a great art in the form of jazz, and, thanks to the phonograph, a permanent art. Basie's strength as a band leader lay in his capacity to distill the essence of jazz as black players felt it. That is why this inarticulate dropout from New Jersey was doubly lucky to find himself stranded, in the mid-twenties, in Kansas City. First, because it allowed him to recognize his vocation. Till then he had merely been a poor black youngster who liked playing piano and chose the only form of freedom available to his kind, the gypsy life of show business. Liberation and not money was the object, I don't think I ever came into contact with any rich entertainers when I grew up, and he neither made nor kept money. I liked playing music and I liked the life. Good Morning Blues is a superb evocation of the underside of black showbiz in the 1920s. The casts of burlesque shows like Hippity Hop thirsting for some action in the desert of Omaha, Gons L. White, and her big jazz jamboree slowly foundering as she sailed along the Toba circuit of black vaudeville theaters, finally sinking in KC. After the wreck Basie drifted into full-time jazz without quite being aware of the big change I was making. It was his first stroke of luck. The second was finding himself in Kansas City, capital of that apparent cultural desert southwest of the Missouri which even blacks bypassed en route from the Delta to the bright lights of Chicago and Detroit, and which even the black vaudeville circuit still wrote off. KC was long its westernmost point, which is why shows like Gons L. White's disbanded there if not turned around, rerouted, or reformed. Kansas and Oklahoma were not meccas of showbiz. Apart from KC and Texas, the entire Southwest had only small and scattered black populations. The first tour of the newly formed Basie Band was a row of one-nighters through places like Tulsa, Muskogee, Okmulgee, Oklahoma City, and Wichita. Yet this was the region that produced two major developments in jazz. It fused the down-home blues with popular dance band music, and the arranged performance with the jam session, to create both the classic swing band and the most powerful experimental laboratory of jazz. Kansas City produced not only Count Basie but also Charlie Parker. Much has been written about this apparent paradox. Most of it has concentrated on the peculiar character of Kansas City, Missouri, in the wide open, free-spending days of Boss Pendergast, whose gang-run nighttime municipal Keynesianism kept KC in the depression an oasis where black musicians could at least eat. It would be too much to call the players life of hot dogs, plates of beans, jugs of whiskey, perhaps with a little subsidy from a girl, prosperity. 
But in fact, though Good Morning Blues makes little of it, there was little regular work in Kansas City. As one of Basie's pioneers puts it, the work was around, out on the road, though in Kansas City itself there was an enormous amount of ill-paid casual gigging with tips, and even more unpaid jamming. Most of the talent seems to have come out of the territory, with relatively little direct recruitment from the Deep South and even less from the East. Walter Page's Blue Devils, the foundation and inspiration of Basie's team, was a territory band working in Oklahoma. And the down-home blues that Kansas City integrated into band jazz was not a big city product, nor, at this stage, were band-accompanied male blues shouters, who became Basie's trademark, of any interest to a white public. The KC musicians, in short, played what came naturally to southwestern blacks and largely what a segregated audience wanted. The blues was imposed on them by the ghetto. Independently, Basie and Jimmy Rushing observe of each other that in the mid-twenties Basie couldn't play the blues then, and Rushing, who could, wasn't really a blues singer in those days. Ten years later they sang and played little else. The gems mined in the dance halls of places like Muskogee, were cut and polished in the countless nightclubs and after-hours sessions of Kansas City by an unusually large community of professional musicians. But in spite of the KC myth which insists on battles won with visiting stars, and admiration from outsiders, this community thought of itself as in some sense marooned. We were really behind the Iron Curtain. There was no chance for us. So there was nothing for us to do but play for ourselves. The great drummer Joe Jones, quoted in the world of Count Basie. It could have been said about the Kansas City scene as a whole. It was said about its most characteristic product, the Basie Band. Yet at first sight Basie himself had few qualifications for eminence. By jazz standards he was not a top-class pianist, especially when compared to the New York stride piano giants in whose style he had been formed and against whom he constantly measured himself to his disadvantage. As one of his arrangers said, he knew he couldn't challenge Fats Waller or Earl Hines. He didn't have the same kind of gift from above. Nor was he a particularly literate musician, unlike most of the big band leaders, who tended to come from a schooled black background. He came into the big time with little more than a number of head arrangements and blues, not only because he did not lead a reading band, but because he himself was not a writer or arranger in the ordinary sense. Even his ideas had short breath, he'd only go about four measures, says his arranger Eddie Durham. His provincial ignorance, even within the limits of commercial dance music, was startling. In 1936 he risked his booking in a great New York ballroom because, he claims, I don't believe I even knew what a goddamn tango was. There was nothing original about the format of his band, except perhaps using two saxophones in contest. And any reader of his memoir will wonder how this easygoing, frequently drunk, tongue-tied man managed the job of holding his team together. In short, on paper he had no qualifications to be anything except another adequate jazz player. And with the modesty, or honesty, which is his trademark, he says as much in his tribute to John Hammond, who heard his broadcast from the Reno Club on a shortwave car radio in 1935 as he drove through the Middle West, was bowled over by it, and made Basie into a national figure. Without him I probably would still be back in Kansas City, if I still happened to be alive. Or back in New York, trying to be in somebody's band, and then worrying about getting fired. But what was it that Hammond, and later the rest of the world, recognized in Basie? Once again, the best descriptions come from others. He was and is says Harry Sweets Edison the greatest for stomping off the tempo. He noodles around on the piano until he gets it just right. Just like you were mixing mash and yeast to make whiskey, and you keep tasting and tasting it. Freddie Green and Joe Jones would follow him until he hit the right tempo, and when he started it they kept it. That tempo was the clue to Basie, and Good Morning Blues begins with his discovery in, of all places, Tulsa, Oklahoma, of what Albert Murray elsewhere calls that ever steady, yet always flexible transcontinental locomotive-like drive of the Kansas City 4-4-2 in Walter Page's Blue Devils,
who are by common consent the pioneers of that lovely, easy, lilting rhythm both driving and relaxed. They were to form the core of his early band. Having set the tempo, Basie would next set a rhythm for the saxes first, then he'd set one for the bones and we'd pick that up. Now it's our rhythm against theirs. The third rhythm would be for the trumpets. The solos would fall in between the ensembles, but that's how the piece would begin, and that's how Basie put his tunes together. Dickie Wells, trombonist, quoted in the world of Count Basie. The great waves of ensemble riffs, hitting the audience like Atlantic rollers, were therefore initially at least not stylistic tricks or ends in themselves. They were the essential groundswell of the music, the setting for what the musicians themselves, in the great days, did not see as an ensemble band, but, apart from the self-effacing members of the stupendous rhythm section, as a company of creative soloists. Alas, it eventually declined into an ensemble band in response to the public. Self-effacement was also the secret of Basie's minimalist arrangements and his increasingly sparse piano interventions, whose purpose was entirely to keep the music moving. Whatever the origin of an arrangement, it was whittled down into the Basie version by ruthless selection and cutting. Basie, who never wrote down anything on paper, composed by editing, in other words by fitting his numbers to his musicians. But unlike Ellington, who had precise musical ideas and picked his players to fit them even if some had originally been suggested by listening to other musicians the less articulate Basie was fundamentally a selector. What he heard in his head was the shapes and patterns of numbers, the rhythm and dynamics, the stage mechanics and effects rather than the plot or words of the play. I have my own little ideas about how to get certain guys into certain numbers and how to get them out. I had my own way of opening the door for them to let them come in and sit around a while. Then I would exit them. But none of this became real until he heard musicians play and recognized in the sound what he had in mind. Listening was his essential talent. That is how the Basie band in its prime between 1936 and 1950 came to be built up and shaped by apparently haphazard recruitment and playing. The only time during this period that Basie groped and showed uncertainty was when he came into the big time and his booking agent, the devoted Willard Alexander, told him that for commercial reasons he had to double the size of his band. He floundered, and almost failed. Fortunately both his backers and other musicians, Fletcher Henderson generously gave him his own arrangements, were so convinced of the band's merits that he had time to adjust. Consequently the Basie Band was a marvelous combination of solo creation and collective exhilaration. It attracted and held a remarkable collection of individual talent. The intense joy of being in the early Basie Band, a band of brothers, shines through the reminiscences of hard-bitten and jealous prose. Some of that joy was owing to the temperament and tact of the leader who led, as it were, like the headman of a traditional Russian village commune, by articulating and crystallizing consensus. Even more was owed to the player's sense of equality, fraternity, and above all liberty to create, controlled only by their own collective sense of what sounded right. And to the end of his days Basie liked to present himself not as leader or driver, but as the fulcrum of his band, the small still center, keep your eye on the fellow at the piano. The Sparrow. He don't know nothing, but you just keep your eyes on him and we'll all know what's going down. It was not entirely an affectation. Those who were young in the 1930s and first heard the unanswerable sound of the early Basie band rolling across continent and oceans are tempted, like Yates with the Easter Rising, to call the muster roll of heroes, Basie, Page, Jones, and Green, Herschel Evans and Lester Young, Buck Clayton, and Harry Edison, Benny Morton, Dickie Wells, and Jimmy Rushing singing the blues. But in retrospect these were not only men who produced remarkable music and helped to create what is in fact the classic music of the US, but who did so in an extraordinary and unprecedented way. Good Morning Blues and the world of Count Basie are not works of cultural sociology. Perhaps luckily, Adorno wrote some of the most stupid pages ever written about jazz. Nevertheless, they should be read by all who want to explore the obscure zone that links society with the creation of art. 
Stanley Dance's book is a collection of interviews by one of the oldest and most knowledgeable jazz lovers in the world. Good Morning Blues is more than a ghosted autobiography. Albert Murray, a distinguished black writer who worked with Basie on the book for years and backed it as all good oral history should be backed by research far more extensive than the actual interviewing, deserves credit for a remarkable achievement. He has, like his subject, effaced himself to let someone else speak as he would have wanted to, but, without his help, could not have done. He has respected Basie's reticence, and neither concealed nor disguised the limitations of a man of great gifts, but with all the reluctance to commit himself publicly that one would expect of a black entertainer who grew up in the days when they were still called sepia. The man who emerges is a man to respect. Basie was always good at finding others to voice his ideas. Good Morning Blues is his last success in doing so. The Jazz Comeback Until recently jazz has occupied a curiously marginal position in the official culture of its native country, and even within the black community. The public for it has been tiny, far smaller than the public for classical music. Record producers, who probably contain a much higher proportion of jazz buffs than the American people at large, can hardly be expected to invest much in music that nowadays sells less than 4% of discs and tapes. Point one. The jazz public is enormously serious, even a public of connoisseurs. Since the 1930s it has certainly contained a considerable number of intellectuals with wide cultural interests. And yet official high culture in the US was extraordinarily slow to take note of what is probably the most serious homegrown American contribution to the 20th century arts. Hayden Carruth, poet, professor, and, since the early 30s, an informed and thoughtful jazz enthusiast, observes that, As a poet I never met another poet older than I who understood jazz as music. Among poets of my own age I have met one or two who love and understand jazz, but none who has written intelligently about it. Most of my contemporaries have only a kind of nostalgic feeling for the swing era. Only when I come to poets whose musical education began after 1945, do I find any number, though still comparatively few, who write about jazz with understanding. For some in the baby boom generation the beginning of jazz is the work of Charlie Parker. For most it is the work of Miles Davis.2. Not that jazz was hard to find for 20th century urban or, through radio, any, Americans. Its sound was familiar and not difficult of access, at any rate for those who first heard it in their teens. The problem was exactly the opposite. Jazz, or more generally the music of North American blacks, was and is so deeply embedded in popular entertainment in the cities of the US that it was almost impossible to separate it out as a special kind of art. Even in the black ghettos it had no separate existence, except for the communities of professional players who, like all professionals, whether physicists, economists, or musicians, live by and for peer judgment, even when they are being paid by people who cannot tell the difference between trumpet and trombone, or who think Kenneth Arrow makes shirts. As Carruth observes, even the late Malcolm X, who was a champion ballroom dancer in Boston and New York in the late 1930s, does not in his autobiography speak of the jazz to which he danced as music. He treats it as a cultural adjunct. A striking example of the impossibility of recognizing the jazz threads within American popular culture is Kitty Kelly's scandal-mongering biography of Frank Sinatra, who was in his day undeniably an excellent jazz singer. This is not surprising, since he learned his craft in the big band swing era, when jazz briefly became the mainstream of youthful pop music, and began his career as a vocalist in the Harry James and Tommy Dorsey bands. In fact Miss Kelly, though primarily interested in her subject's non-musical activities, is sufficiently conscientious to record how Dorsey instructed him in jazz phrasing. Yet it is evident that Sinatra, raised among New Jersey working-class Italian immigrants, came from a milieu that had about as little relation to black music as it was possible to have in urban America. He showed no interest in jazz as such, few jazz names appear in the ample index of his way. He was simply a young Sicilian of some talent and boundless ambitions who wanted to make the big time as a singer of sentimental songs, and did so, 
thanks not least to a sexual magnetism that attracted audiences at all distances. Luckily for him, and for Sinatra's admirers, the jazz idiom, to which a young man in the Hoboken of the 1940s took as naturally as he would to the company of Italian mobsters, gave sentimentality an interesting musical edge, and a sort of offhand distancing. Ten years older, and he might with equal conviction have sung O Sol Mio. Moreover, for all his immersion in jazz, for most of us Sinatra is no more primarily a jazz artist than was Bing Crosby, whose superb and relaxed jazz phrasing Dorsey urged Sinatra to imitate. His phrasing survived and protected him to some extent from the vocal erosion of age. He deservedly became and remains a star of show business, and his songs have probably accompanied and subsequently recalled more seductions than any other singers. But his relation to jazz is peripheral. The very omnipresence of the jazz element in American popular music, and especially dance and show music, after the First World War meant that for most Americans it had no precise location or independent existence. It also meant that jazz was more easily recognized as an original form of art, and its practitioners as original artists of serious stature, by a public which came to it as to a foreign land, the Europeans. The fact that jazz was thus taken seriously in Europe earlier than in the US has always rankled in its native country. It still does, if the American critical reception of Bernard Tavernier's moving film Round Midnight is anything to go by. Pauline Kael's grumpy reaction, the French are pretty hard to take when they celebrate just how much they love American art, is not uncharacteristic. But what is hard for Americans to take is not the self-congratulation of Europeans, but that in this instance they have something to congratulate themselves about. For it is undeniable that, from the early 1930s on, musicians who were seen by official high culture in their homeland as vaudeville acts or something to dance to were in Europe acclaimed by intellectuals, artists, and high society. Hitler destroyed the central European avant-garde that was attracted by jazz, and the early links between Soviet culture and jazz have only lately been disinterred by the scholarly labors of the president of Oberlin College.3 But nobody who knows anything about French culture will be surprised that Cocteau compared jazz to Stravinsky, while Stravinsky drew on jazz, that the man who started the world's first pure jazz magazine, Charles Delaunay, was the child of Cubist painters in the heyday of the École de Paris, and that Jean-Paul Sartre, though seeming no more likely to tap his feet than his cousin Albert Schweitzer, knew that he ought to take jazz seriously. Perhaps because Boris Vian, as avant-garde as the next man, doubled as a Dixieland trumpeter in Paris clubs. It is equally undeniable that the first book to survey and assess the leading jazz artists and put jazz on the map in Europe and in its own country for was written by a 22-year-old Frenchman, Hugues Panassi, in 1934, or, for that matter, that then as now the European public, small as it was, could at times be the only public for which it was worth producing American jazz. A leading producer of the stateside jazz avant-garde's records today is in Milan, and 70% of his modest sales go outside the U.S.5 for that matter, why did we have to wait for a Frenchman to make the first full-length feature film which takes a black musician seriously as a creative artist, and, what is more, casts a black jazz musician in this role Dexter Gordon, whose performance in Round Midnight is astonishing, more moving than his music. None of this alters the fact that, then as now, the U.S. is where the action is, and where a jazz musician would want to be, appreciated, or not, so long as he could earn a living there. As it happens, Tavernier's film raises a more interesting question. Like almost all we know about jazz except the sounds themselves, it is jazz from the fan's point of view, naturally enough, cameras are not instruments through which musicians express themselves. Indeed, Gallophils will recognize the special flavor of the French intellectual jazz fan, always ready to discover a poet modded even in blackface, loving jazz not only for itself but because it leads him to Rambo, and flattered by the proclaimed taste of older jazz musicians for Debussy. No musician would make a film essentially about his relation with an admiring fan, but that is the central theme of Round Midnight. It is based on the case of a real Frenchman who did his best to protect the great but declining bebop pianist Bud Powell against himself in Paris.
Tavernier's protagonist takes in a famous but alcoholic sax player, briefly nurses him back to respect and creativity through selfless care and immersion in the slow rhythms of French family life, perhaps seen here as unduly reticent and gentle, but he cannot prevent him from returning to New York where he dies. It is almost certainly the best feature film made about jazz, and illuminating both about the people and the music for jazz fans are equally interested in both. However, the fan sees his hero in a retrospective sentimental haze. Bud Powell in Paris was an altogether more frightening and inaccessible phenomenon than the gentle somnambulist self-destroyer whom Dexter Gordon plays so well. The present writer, who saw Powell in Paris, speaks from personal memory. The film combines the fans' resentment at the world's failure to accept the greatness of jazz with their reluctance to share it with outsiders. It is full of esoteric references to Charlie Parker's wife, to Lester Young's tricks of language whose very opaqueness confirms the aficionado's monopoly. Tavernier, justifiably, makes no attempt to distance himself from sentiment and cliché which are essential to fandom. But then, neither did he do so in that other splendid film about art, artists, and, not incidentally, fathers and daughters, a Sunday in the country. But the jazz fan, however knowledgeable, is fundamentally a lover. While old-style pop music, as everyone knows, crystallized and preserved the relation of human beings in love, their playing our song, jazz, more often than not, is itself the love object for its devotees. The Czech novelist Joseph Skvorecki has compared its initial impact to the first love of teenagers in the era when such emotions, however fleeting, were still supposed to be unforgettable. It had begun as a love affair like the others. This is the description of how jazz was discovered by Dr. Dietrich schultz -Kohn, who occupies a small niche in the informal pantheon of jazz lovers' history as the German officer captured at St. Nazir in 1944, whose first question to his American captors was, do you have any Count Basie records, six the metaphor of love or falling in love keeps pushing its way into Mike Zwerin's enthusiastic but superficial account of jazz in Nazi-occupied Europe, itself a work of autobiography, sentiment, and piety rather than scholarship. Accuracy came first, but when there was a choice between poetry and journalism, I picked poetry seven. Few jazz fans are in a position to make films, though they have, in jazz photography, created a library of marvelous images. A number of young white men and a small but growing number of women also graduate from fans to players, though opinions about the musical interest of their activities have generally been divided. Fortunately a modest number have, over the years, compensated for the lack of commercial and institutional interest in jazz by turning themselves into impresarios or record producers. The recently repolished Blue Note label, founded and long maintained by two German refugee jazz fans, is a case in point. But what do they do with words? Relatively few fans write poetry to or about the beloved, and when they do, it tends to rely excessively on the magic of names which vibrate only for other lovers. Oh I loved you Pete Brown. And you were a brother to me, Joe Marsala. And you too, sweet Billy Kyle. Eight rather more of them, belonging to the large underground of jazz lovers in academia, now write books of serious scholarship about the object of their passion. Characteristically, most of the books noted here are published by university presses. But very few indeed practice the extraordinarily difficult art of communicating in prose what musicians are and do. Probably the only writer who has actually succeeded is Whitney Belyatt of The New Yorker, whose American Musicians collects together 24 years of jazz profiles. As a writer of New Yorker profiles he is distinguished but not exceptional. His unique strength as a descriptive writer on jazz lies in a musically informed combination of watchful, precise observation with ear and eye, a sort of Audubon-like impartiality, and an uncanny instinct for words which not only are but sound right. Very few listen and observe as exactly as he does, and nobody reports more exactly. Belayat's descriptions of solo improvisations he is particularly good on drummers are, as nearly as is possible, translations of the movement of music into language, as can be verified by checking his report of, say, 
Jess Stacy's famous 1938 piano solo at Carnegie Hall against the record. After a Goodman, Jean Krupa duet, there was a treading water pause, and Stacy, suddenly given the nod by Goodman, took off. The solo lasted over two minutes, which was remarkable at a time when most solos were measured in seconds. One wonders how many people understood what they were hearing that night, for no one had ever played a piano solo like it. From the opening measures, it had an exalted, almost ecstatic quality, as if it were playing Stacy. It didn't, with its Debussy glints and ghosts, seem of its time and place. It was also revolutionary in that it was more of a cadenza than a series of improvised choruses. There were no divisions or seams, and it had a spiraling structure, an organic structure, in which each phrase evolved from its predecessor. Seizing middle register chords gave way to double time runs, which gave way to dreaming rests, which gave way to sing-song chords, which gave way to oblique runs. A climax would be reached only to recede before a still stronger one. Piling grace upon grace, the solo moved gradually but inexorably up the keyboard, at last ending in a superbly restrained cluster of upper register single notes. There was an instant of stunned silence before Krupa came thundering back. Unlike most jazz writers, he never gushes or conceals the weaknesses even of his favorites. His range of sympathy is unusually wide, from King Oliver to Cecil Taylor, though it does not entirely include Miles Davis and Hard Bop, about which, in this book, he is very reticent. In short, he is the ideal writer for the literate jazz lover who is forced to recollect emotion in tranquility, far from records and tapes. What, except admiration for a first-class craftsman in words, he communicates to those who do not like jazz, it is impossible for a jazz lover to say. Since so much of what we know about jazz comes to us through the selfless but not unbiased devotion of the aficionados, not least as collectors, genealogists, chroniclers, or as in Danny Barker's A Life in Jazz translators of spoken reminiscence into print 9 we ought to know a good deal more about the public for jazz and its evolution than we actually do. However, writers on jazz have tended to be as incurious about the listeners as they have been endlessly fascinated by the tiniest details about the musicians. The reception of jazz, especially in the US, still has to be seriously studied, although several of the books under review do provide incidental materials for such a study. And yet, the future of jazz depends almost entirely on what happens to the public for it, as was clear during the 15 or so years from the early 1960s on, when this public virtually vanished as the mass of the young stampeded to follow the rock fashions, in this as in several other respects a disaster decade for Western culture. The rhythm and blues of the 1950s had still allowed a kind of amicable symbiosis between jazz and pop 10, the best that could be said about jazz in the early 1970s, even in New York as usual it was said by Whitney Belyatt was that it had stopped collapsing. Its condition was parlous but persuasive 11 once again, this is jazz as seen by fans or critics. For musicians who could no longer make a living by playing jazz it was the first rather than the second. In spite of the, qualified, gloom of Francis Davis, whose in the moment reports on the jazz scene of the 1980s, interest in jazz began to revive in the late 1970s with the visible exhaustion of rock music, and has been growing at an impressive pace recently. The bins are bursting with reissues and clubs are suddenly doing record business wrote a jazz journal at the end of 1986,12 and the phenomenon appears to be international. It is once again becoming possible for more than a handful of musicians to earn a living playing jazz. Long dissolved groups are reconstituted, musicians return from California studios and European exile and answer the question, where is jazz going right now, with, I don't know where it's going, but it's healthy 13 even if the revival lasts, jazz will certainly not be more than a minority taste, like reading poetry, as it has generally been but it may once again be an economically workable one. Given our ignorance of the public which is now turning to jazz, little can be said about it except that, as is obvious, jazz audiences are generally upscale in income, well-educated and more white than black, 14 nevertheless, the growing body of middle-class and professional blacks may now also consider, 
as their fathers did not, an educated admiration for jazz as a badge of race pride as well as of cultural status. Point 15. Apart from the nucleus of gnarled longtime jazz buffs, this is a new and relatively young audience, often strikingly ignorant, but, in a peculiar way, highbrow. The one branch of jazz which seems to have been left out of the revival is the simple fun music that once appealed so powerfully, especially to white youth, and that resisted the decline of jazz longest, Dixieland. In New York itself, those strongholds of white middle-class males recalling their youth, Eddie Condon's and Jimmy Ryan's, have now gone even as new locations for more advanced live jazz multiplied and flourished. The decline of Dixieland is clearly not due to a lack of audience appeal, but to critics and musicians combined boredom with, and contempt for, the same old 93 tunes in the standard early repertoire of New Orleans and Chicago, played in unvarying versions by fourth-rate musicians 16 moreover, to many young black musicians, traditional New Orleans music was uncomfortably close to Uncle Tom. Only perceptive and open-minded jazz lovers like Belayat and Carruth are today prepared to say a good word for Dixieland music, or rather for jazz played in pre 1940 style. Carruth, who incidentally suggests, with some exaggeration, that the number of inferior imitators of post-bop jazz today is greater by far than the number of Dixielanders, reminds his younger friends that when they hear records made by real jazz musicians trained in the modes that came before bop, whether black or white, northern or southern, they are hearing jazz, not Dixieland, and it makes no difference whether the opening and closing choruses are played in harmonic riffs or contrapuntal improvisations. Nor does he exclude the possibility that even work taken verbatim, so to speak, from old records could be done with such purity of musical devotion and such sensitivity to phrasing that it could be taken for real jazz. Indeed, Barry, Foose, and Jones's learned and instructive study of New Orleans music since 1945 goes so far as to omit all mention of what most of the world, including the tourists visiting the French Quarter, would regard as the typical sound of New Orleans. Theirs is New Orleans as represented by the Marsalis family, one of the clans of practitioners on which the popular musical life of the city is still based 17 rather than the New Orleans of Buddy Bolden's Ghost, Preservation Hall, and ceaseless clones of South Rampart Street Parade. And the success of Round Midnight, Epic of Bebop, underlines the failure, a few months earlier, of the gig, a charming film about that characteristic phenomenon of the older jazz scene, the white middle-class amateur Dixieland musicians enjoying themselves, a species still occasionally represented by Woody Allen. It came and went, not of course silently, but rather unperceived. It is mentioned in passing in Davis's book on page 86. The fact that the repertoire of the jazz revival now looks like including the noises people are told by the arbiters of jazz taste to enjoy, as well as some they actually do, may at last give a chance to the young avant-garde musicians who slogged their way despairingly through the darkness of the 1960s and 1970s, and to whom Francis Davis pays particular attention. It is at least possible that bookers will no longer give automatic priority to any of the diminishing band of veterans who can be associated with some remote and prestigious name of which even the Johns have heard, even though their only obvious merit is physical survival. And it is certainly the case that jazz musicians like the pianist Ellis Marsalis, who brought up their sons in the true faith of Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane while unbelief raged all round them, are now indirectly coming into their own. But it is also possible that the revival of some public interest in jazz has had the effect of leading some of the musicians who, in the dark years, made themselves even more inaccessible, to spite those who refused to listen to them anyway, back toward a mainstream music genuinely capable of appealing to audiences, or at least not actively alienating them. Such integration of musical revolutionaries in the mainstream was what created the last golden age of jazz between 1955 and 1960. Francis Davis notes, not without melancholy, that the flag carrier of the 1980s revival, the young trumpeter Wynton Marsalis, is a resolutely conservative musician. There are times today when the world saxophone quartet not only sounds like Ellington, but actually tries to. Some will welcome this development. 
In these circumstances it is possible that jazz may finally be adopted into the postmodernist American establishment as part of the cultural ambience of the new graduate professional classes. It has become intellectually respectable. Its players are likely to be formally trained in music, or even, like Wynton Marsalis, equally distinguished as classical and jazz performers. It can be readily combined with other consumer expenditures, as has been recognized in the now familiar bonding of jazz and cookery in Manhattan supper clubs and restaurants. Practicing gastronomy to the accompaniment of what good authorities claim to be the classical music of the 20th century U.S. is culturally reassuring, even when one is not listening to it closely. It is even, in a modest way, a guarantee of economic exclusiveness, at least so long as the size of the jazz public and the capacity of clubs make it cheaper to buy a modest opera seat than to hear a live set in the village. However, among the many whom the new respectability of jazz excludes are those who made this music in the past, and on whom its creative future must rest, young men and women from the black ghetto. Not many of the very young have yet been drawn into the jazz revival in its native country. The degree in jazz and contemporary music recently inaugurated at the New School in New York is now taught by a predominantly black faculty of distinguished older musicians to a largely white student body. For every black student who has joined the course so far there are six whites. Jazz may have established its cultural credentials, but the real rejuvenation of the music has a long way to go. Slyest of the Foxes Of the great figures in 20th century culture, Edward Kennedy Ellington is one of the most mysterious. On the evidence of James Lincoln Collier's excellent book, he must also be one of the least likable cold to his son, ruthless in his dealings with women, and unscrupulous in his use of the work of other musicians. But there can be no denying the extraordinary fascination he plainly exercised over the people he mistreated and was loyal to at the same time, including those who allowed him to establish power over them, i.e., most of his colleagues and lovers. There was nothing blatant about what must strike impartial observers as his appalling behavior. He was the opposite of the short-fused brawlers who briefly joined so many bands of his time, including his own, though his habit of stealing his musicians' tunes and, occasionally, their women, must have put a strain on even the more placid among them. However, the only people who actually took a knife or a gun to him, so far as the record shows, were legal or de facto wives, who had more than adequate provocation. In fact, nothing was obvious about Duke Ellington the man, except the mask he invariably wore in public and behind which his personality became invisible, that of a handsome, debonair, and seductive man about town, whose verbal communications with his public, and very likely with the startlingly large numbers of his female conquests, consisted of vapid phrases of flattery and endearment, I love you madly. The autobiography he wrote shortly before his death, Music is My Mistress One is a singularly uninformative document as well as a mistitled one. For while he probably despised and tried to subjugate his lovers, indeed all women except his mother and sister, both of whom he idealized and regarded as asexual at least this is the view of his humiliated son to his relationship to music was entirely different. Even so, music was not his mistress in the original sense of someone exercising dominion. Ellington liked to keep control. Here, in fact, lies the heart of the mystery that James Lincoln Collier has tried to elucidate in his book. For Ellington, who has been called, with Charles Ives, the most important figure in American music three utterly fails to conform to the criteria of the conventional idea of the artist, just as his improvised productions fail to conform to the conventional idea of the work of art. As it happens, unlike most of his jazz contemporaries, Ellington saw himself as an artist in this sense and took to composing works for the concert hall, where they were periodically performed. In the black middle-class milieu of the Ellingtons, which Collier rightly insists was important, the conception of the great artist was familiar, whereas it was meaningless to someone like Louis Armstrong, who came from a less self-conscious and entirely unbourgeois world. When Ellington, on his triumphant visit to England in 1933, discovered that for British intellectuals he was not just a band leader but an artist like Ravel or Delius, he took to the role of composer as he conceived it. However, 
hardly anyone claims that his reputation rests on the 30-odd ill-organized many suites of program music, and still less on the sacred concerts to which he devoted much of his final years. As an orthodox composer, Ellington simply does not rate highly. And yet there is no doubt that the corpus of his work in jazz, which, in Collier's words, includes hundreds of complete compositions, many of them almost flawless, is one of the major accomplishments in music any American music of his era, 1899-1974. And that but for Ellington this music would not exist, even though almost every page of Collier's admiring but demystifying book bears witness to his musical deficiencies. Ellington was a good but not brilliant pianist. He lacked both a technical knowledge of music and the self-discipline to acquire it. He had trouble reading sheet music, let alone more elaborate scores. After 1939 he relied heavily for arrangements and musical advice on Billy Strayhorn, who acted as his alter ego in running the band and who became something like an adopted son. The musically trained and immensely sophisticated Strayhorn was better able to judge from a score how the music would sound. Apart from some informal tips in the 1920s from formally trained black musical professionals like Will Votary, Ziegfeld's musical director, he learned little except by a process of trying it out in practice. He was too lazy, and perhaps not sufficiently intellectual, to read much, nor did he listen intently to other people's music. He did not even, if Collier is to be believed, make any special efforts to find the right kind of musicians for his band, but accepted the first vaguely suitable ones to fill vacancies, though this does not account for the majestic brass and reed lineups of the Ellington band between the later 20s and early 40s. He was certainly not a great songwriter, if we follow Collier's demonstration that of all the songs on which Ellington's reputation as a songwriter and his ASCAP royalties as well is based, only Solitude appears to have been entirely his work. For the rest he was at best a collaborator, at worst merely the arranger of a band version of the tune. And at least one of his sidemen told him, at a characteristic moment of mutual irritation, I don't consider you a composer. You are a compiler. Last, and perhaps most damaging of all, is Collier's justified observation that he neither had the talent, the raw natural gift of other great jazz musicians, nor was drawn, indeed driven, to jazz by an intense feeling for the music itself. Unlike many other great jazz musicians, he showed little promise until he was nearly 30, and he did not start doing his best work until he was 40. Here lies the chief interest of Collier's book. In broad outline his judgments are not new. It has long been accepted that Ellington was essentially an improvising musician whose instrument was a whole band, and that he could not even think about his music except through the particular voices of its members. That he was musically short-winded and therefore incapable of developing a musical idea at length was always obvious, but conversely it was already known in 1933 that no other composer, classical or otherwise, could beat him over the distance of a 78 RPM record i.e., three minutes. He has been called by a critic of both jazz and classical music arts major miniaturist for Collier's comments on particular works and phases of the Ellington Obra are, as usual, knowledgeable, perceptive, and illuminating, but his general judgment could hardly differ from what may be regarded as the general consensus. Only through jazz could a man of Ellington's evident limitations have produced a significant contribution to 20th century music. Only a black American, and probably a black middle-class American of Ellington's generation, would have sought to do so as a band leader. Only a person of Ellington's unusual character would have actually achieved this result. The merit of Collier's book lies in showing what the music owes to the man, but its novelty is to see the man as formed by his social and musical milieu. The peculiarities of Ellington's personality have often been described with varying degrees of indulgence. He saw himself, with total and unforced conviction, as uniquely gifted by God, uniquely guided through life by some mysterious light, uniquely directed by the divine to make certain decisions at certain points in his life, and consequently entitled to total power. The critic Alexander Coleman tried to sum up Ellington's inner thoughts as follows, I must be able to give and to take away. I command the world because I am ever lucky, 
careful beyond compare, the slyest fox among all the foxes of this world. 5. This is substantially also Collier's reading of the man, though the present book insists less than it might on the imperatives of street smart survival and success that the Duke the name was given to him early in life acquired as a smooth young black hustler, the deviousness, the refusal to give anything about himself away, the power strategies of manipulation, the godfather-like insistence on commanding respect. In this regard Mercer Ellington's memoir of life with his father may usefully supplement Collier's book. In short, Ellington, as he himself recognized Six was a spoiled child who succeeded in maintaining something of the infant's sense of omnipotence throughout life. In Washington, D.C., his father worked his way up from coachman to butler in the service of Dr. M.F. Cuthbert, reputedly a society doctor who tended Morgenthaus and DuPonts, according to Collier. From this family background and from the relatively large number of politically sheltered or college-educated blacks he knew in his parents' Washington milieu, he acquired self-respect, self-assurance, and strong pride in his race and a sense of superiority within it. I don't know how many castes of Negroes there were in the city at that time, he once said, but I do know that if you decided to mix carelessly with another you would be told that one just did not do that sort of thing. He preferred not to have a racially mixed band even when this was possible. The charisma that surrounded him derived largely from the consequent, and very striking, air of being a grand seigneur who expected to be deferred to, and this impression was reinforced by charm, good looks, and an indefinable magnetic quality. However, the spoiled child began as an idle and ignorant failure at school, looking for a good time, who never acquired the knack of learning, hard work, or self-discipline, yet never abandoned his sense of status or his ambition. Music, which he seems to have seen originally merely as an adjunct to having a good time, became an obvious as well as an easy way of earning a living, given the enormous demand of the jazz age, and the position of blacks in the dance bands, which was still strong, in spite of the influx of whites. If educated and college-trained blacks made their way as musicians often becoming band leaders or arrangers, as did Fletcher Henderson and Don Redman it was even more natural for a middle-class NEER do well without qualifications to do so, especially one who had recently been pressured into marriage. In the early 1920s good money was to be made in music, probably more readily than by commercial art, for which the young Ellington seems to have shown some gift. It was Ellington's good luck that he entered jazz at the moment when the music was discovering itself, and he was able to discover himself as he grew into it. There is no sign that he particularly wanted to compose, until he formed a partnership with Irving Mills, who, as a music publisher, knew the financial payoff of songs in the world of show business. There is no sign that Ellington wanted to be more than a very successful band leader. His band moved from the rough and ready syncopated music played by an army of nondescript young groups into hot jazz in the middle twenties, because that was the general trend. Indeed the typical Ellington style may well have been worked out for commercial reasons by means of the jungle music that fitted in with the expectations of the Cotton Club clientele. During one period at the Cotton Club, Ellington said, much attention was paid to acts with an African setting, and to accompany these we developed what was termed a jungle-style jazz. This had the advantage both of building on the talents of some valued members of the band and of providing the band with an immediately recognizable sound or trademark. Collier also argues that the size and instrumentation of the band grew, because Ellington's competitors had more brass than he. The models for the big band were white. The arranged music they used was built around what Collier calls a saxophone choir, a coordinated reed section pioneered by Art Hickman and Fared Grove around 1914 and developed by Grove and the King of Jazz Paul Whiteman in the 1920s. Fletcher Henderson and Don Redman created a black version by means of a complex interplay between soloists and band sections. Ellington thus became a composer because the future of successful bands in the 1920s lay not with freewheeling small groups of blowers but with larger bands playing arranged music. He was in no position to imitate Henderson, whom he admired and from whom, Collier argues, he took over the system of punctuating, answering, supporting everything with something, 
because he was incapable of writing complex music and his men could not read complex orchestration. On the other hand the combination of jazz rhythms with harmonic devices taken from or similar to those of classical music, which Whiteman had pioneered, was easier to follow, and came naturally to a man who lived and breathed the atmosphere of New York show business, and, in fact, did not much like being called a jazz musician. As Collier rightly points out, the real triumph of symphonic jazz is not Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, commissioned by Whiteman, but the band music of Duke Ellington. Once Ellington found himself responsible for his own band's repertoire, he was forced to discover himself as a musician. His personal method of creating compositions is well described by Collier. He would begin by bringing into the recording studio or rehearsal hall a few musical ideas scraps of melodies, harmonies, and chord sequences usually clothed in the sound of particular instrumentalists in the band. On the spot he would sit down at the piano and quickly rough out a section for, 8, 16 bars. The band would play it, Duke would repeat it, the band would play it again until everybody got it. Years later, the pianist Jimmy Jones said, what he does is like a chain reaction. Here's a section, here's a section and here's another and, in between, he begins putting in the connecting links the amazing thing about Ellington is that he can think so fast on the spot and create so quickly. Along the way, members of the band would make suggestions. As a piece was developing, it would frequently be up to the men in the sections to work out the harmonies, usually from chords Duke would supply. When the trombonist Lawrence Brown came into the band, to make a third trombone, he was expected to manufacture for himself a third part to everything. I had to compose my own parts, you just went along and whatever you heard was missing, that's where you were. It is obvious that Ellington brought something to this mode of music making beyond his usual disinclination for planning and preparation. He brought natural and growing fascination for the mixing of different sounds and timbres, a growing taste for pushing harmony to the edge of dissonance, a tendency to break the rules, and a great deal of confidence in his unorthodoxies if they sounded right to him. He also brought a tonal sense that is usually compared by Collier also to a painter's colors, but is better thought of as a feeling for show business effects. Ellington, an unabashed composer of program music, seems not to have thought in colors, which occur hardly at all in the titles of his records, except for the non-pictorial black and blue, but to have drawn on a sensory experience, a physical memory, as in Harlem Air's Haft, Daybreak Express a mood, as in mood indigo or solitude, or sentimental stories, like those preferred by traditional choreographers as in black and tan fantasy or many of his longer pieces. None of this would have amounted to much except in and through a group of creative musicians with independent personalities and unmistakable voices, in short, except in jazz. Unquestionably every piece of Ellington's music was or is unmistakably the Duke's, whatever the composition of his band at any moment. Indeed he achieved the same, or analogous, effects through very different combinations of players, even though the band benefited from the long presence of certain quintessential Ellington voices, Cootie Williams, Johnny Hodges, Joe Nanton, Barney Bigard, Harry Carney. But they developed their style because of what the Duke heard in them. Moreover, it is undeniable that the musical impressionism that reminded classically educated listeners of Debussy, and the consistently brilliant form of the band's three-minute recorded pieces beyond that length they tended to sag or fall apart are Ellington's alone. Nevertheless, his music is important above all because of the way it was made. Duke, the devious manipulator, knew that each musician in the band had to make the music his own. He might do so by being left deliberately without instructions, discovering on his own what Ellington had intended him to as Cootie Williams was made to see himself as the successor to Bubber Miley's growling trumpet. Or he might be needled by Duke's deliberate insults into showing what he could really do. There was a method behind the apparently chaotic indiscipline of the band. Conversely, Ellington was nourished by his musicians, not only because he drew on their ideas and tunes but because their voices were what gave him his own. He was, of course, lucky in his time. Being mostly untrained as well as highly competitive, players developed individual voices, 
which made possible the most exciting and original combinations. Collier and just about everyone else agrees that the discovery of one such voice, Bubber Miley's, began the transformation of the Ellington band, and enabled Duke to form those endlessly varied liaisons between the rough and the smooth, the raw and the cooked, which are among his characteristics. It was lucky that the masters of the new hot jazz so often came from New Orleans Sidney Bechet himself briefly joined the band before it officially became Ellington's. This almost certainly gave Ellington the taste for mellow and sinuous reeds, the sounds of the saxophonist Johnny Hodges and the clarinetist Barney Bigard. But Ellington's dependence on his musicians is most convincingly demonstrated by the fact that he kept the band going to the end of his life although it lost money. Whether with better management it could have paid for itself is unclear, but there is no doubt that Duke poured his own royalties into keeping it on the road. It was his voice. Ellington showed no interest in making or keeping scores of his works, not because he did not have their sound and shape in his mind but because his numbers had no meaning for him except as played, and, as in all jazz, they varied with the players, the occasion, and the mood. There could be no such thing as a definitive version, only a preferred but provisional one. Constant Lambert, an early classical admirer, was wrong in arguing that the record was Ellington's equivalent for the straight composer's score point seven. It is evident that works created in this manner do not fit into the conventional category of the artist as the individual creator and only begetter, but of course this conventional pattern has never been applicable to the necessarily cooperative or collective forms of creation that fill our stages and screens, and are more characteristic of the 20th century arts than the individual in his studio or at his desk. The problem of situating Ellington as an artist is in principle no different from that of describing great choreographers, directors, or others who impress their character as individuals on team products. It is merely rather unusual in musical composition. But this undoubtedly raises serious questions about the accepted definition or description of art and artistic creation. Patently the term composer fits Ellington as badly as the term author fits the Hollywood directors to whom it was applied by French critics with the national penchant for bourgeois and Cartesian reductionism. But Ellington produced cooperative works of serious art that were also his own, just as film and stage directors can, and unlike the megalomaniacs he knew himself to be engaged in a genuinely collective creation. Collier asks such questions, but is sidetracked by his understandable conviction that Ellington allowed his talents to be diverted from what he did best into music in emulation of models from the past, which in many cases he did not really understand, and which was not very good. Whether this drew him away from developing the form he was at home with is less certain. After all, by this book's estimate, he produced upwards of 120 hours of recorded jazz, which is a large enough corpus for most composers, and he developed and innovated to the end of his life. If he produced fewer masterpieces after the age of 50, the pull of Carnegie Hall is less to blame than the business troubles afflicting his instrument, the big band. All the same, Ellington will live through music like K.O.K.O. and not through compositions like the Liberian Suite. But Collier is surely wrong to contrast jazz, as a sort of Gebrauchsmusik to accompany dancing, to support singers or dancers, or to excite and entertain audiences, with art as a special practice with its own principles existing in the abstract, apart from an audience, and not created out of a wish to act directly and immediately on the real feelings of people. Whatever the relation of the accepted conventional arts to the public, which has undoubtedly been a difficult one for avant-garde artists since the beginning of this century, this oversimplifies the relation of jazz musicians to their audience, even if we leave aside the musicians who, since the birth of bebop, have defied the audience to follow them. For while it is quite true that Ellington's finest work was created for cabarets and ballrooms, for the purposes of much of the audience schlock music would have done just as well or better, and in fact the same audiences were content with third-rate bands. Like most jazz organizations of its generation, the Ellington band earned its living playing dances, but did not play for the dancers. The band members played for each other. Undoubtedly their ideal audience accepted their kind of music and was excited by it, but above all it did not get in the way. The present reviewer, at the age of 16, 
lost his heart for good to the Ellington Band at its most imperial, playing what was called a breakfast dance in a suburban London ballroom to an uncomprehending audience entirely irrelevant to it, except that a swaying mass of dancers was what the band was used to seeing in front of them. Those who have never heard Ellington playing a dance or, even better, a supper room of sophisticated night people where the real applause consisted in the falling silent of table conversations, cannot know what the greatest band in the history of jazz was really like, playing at ease in its own environment. On the other hand the people who expected Ellington to act directly and immediately on the real feelings did get in the way. In his later years most Americans and all foreigners heard Ellington live only on concert tours. The hushed or applauding halls full of fans waiting for the revelation rarely brought out the best in the band. They brought out the Ellington who knew that enough honking, mostly by Paul Gonsalves, would bring the house down. Nor is it sufficient to say, as Collier does, when jazz becomes confounded with art, passion flies out and pretension flies in. The reason why jazz is important is not that it is passionate and unpretentious. So is most romantic fiction. It is not that, unlike the art Collier dislikes, millions of people care about it. It is and has always been a minority art, even by the standards of classical music and serious literature, let alone the real public of millions. It is certainly not a mass art in the US, where New York jazz clubs, like British theater managers, count on the tourist trade as well as the local jazz audience. Jazz is important in the history of the modern arts because it developed an alternative way of creating art to that of the high culture avant-garde, whose exhaustion has left so much of the conventional serious arts as adjuncts to university teaching programs, speculative capital investment, or philanthropy. That is why the tendency of jazz to turn itself into yet another avant-garde is to be deplored. More than any other person, Ellington represented this ability of jazz to turn people who are unconcerned with culture and pursuing their passions, ambitions, and interests in their own way, into creators of serious and, on a small scale, of great art. He demonstrated this both through his own evolution into a composer and by the integrated works of art he created with his band, a band containing fewer utterly brilliant individual talents than other bands until the late 1930s perhaps only one, Hodges but in which extraordinary individual performance was the foundation of collective achievement. There is no other flow of musical creation by a collective to compare with it. Certainly he, and they, acted directly and immediately on the feelings of listeners, but this itself does not explain why, as Collier notes, their music was so much more complex than that of other jazz groups. In short, the author is at times tempted into populist theory of the arts, by which the artist not only rejoices to concur with the common reader, to use Dr. Johnson's phrase, but takes the common reader's preferences as a guide. That the theory is inadequate is shown, among other examples, by comparing the American to the German phases of the careers of both George Grosch and Kurt Weil. However, Collier is entirely right in the belief that the great achievements of jazz, of which Ellington's music is in some ways the most impressive, grew in a soil quite different from that which produced high art. It was a music of professional entertainers of modest expectations, made in the community of night people with folk roots. It was not supposed to be art like chamber music, it did not benefit by being treated as art and it tended to get as lost as the high arts when its practitioners turned themselves into yet another avant-garde. Its major contribution to music was made in a social setting that no longer exists. It is difficult to imagine that a great musician of the future will be able to say, like one of Ellington's major soloists, all I wanted to be was a successful pimp, and then I found I could make it on the horn. Today's jazz, played largely by educated musicians, often with classical training, essentially for a listening public, by a generation whose links with the blues are largely mediated through rock and musically impoverished gospel sounds, will have to find another way, if it can, to make a mark as great as the jazz of those who grew up in the first half of this century. But all of its players, without exception, will continue to listen to the records of Ellington, about whom Collier has written the best book we have, spare, lucid, perceptive about the man, good criticism, and good history. The Caruso of Jazz 
he was the first among the players of the barely baptized jazz to be identified as an artist of genius. Very few jazz musicians are as well known as Sidney Bechet, especially among people not particularly familiar with the music. No one has a voice more easily and immediately recognizable. Within months of his death in 1959 a statue of him was unveiled on the French Riviera and, thanks to the labors of his biographer, we now know that his face is on postage stamps of the republics of Chad and Gabon. The poet Philip Larkin wrote about him. On me your voice falls as they say love should. Like an enormous yes. Equally to the point, in the 1920s Bechet was admired by other musicians, including men of considerable discernment like Duke Ellington and Benny Carter. And small wonder. He was, after all, one of the first, if not the first, to turn the saxophone into a major jazz instrument. Why is it, then, that the career of Sidney Joseph Bechet, 1897 to 1959, is, or rather became, peripheral to the mainstream of jazz development. He was strategically placed, and had more than enough originality and talent to become a model and inspiration for other musicians, or a permanent model for those playing an instrument, like Louis Armstrong, Coleman Hawkins, Django Reinhardt, Charlie Parker, Charlie Christian, John Coltrane. Yet, while he had inspired Johnny Hodges of the Ellington Band, his impact during his lifetime is otherwise hard to trace except on White Dixieland Disciples. When White fans launched the Bechet Vogue in the late 1930s, he was not even particularly well known among the musicians themselves. John Chilton's book, one of those monuments of devoted and scholarly data collection which jazz has so often inspired among its loyalists, probably provides as much material for understanding Bechet's isolation as we are now likely to get. It certainly replaces the romances that passed as Bechet's autobiography One it will provide the indispensable basis for any subsequent exploration of an extraordinary life, which will sooner or later find its way onto film or television. For how many men can claim to have been expelled from both Britain and France, the former after an arrest for rape, the latter after a gunfight in Montmartre, to have had affairs with both Bessie Smith and Josephine Baker and a long, passionate, if intermittent, relationship with Tallulah Bankhead, to have been the toast of Moscow in the mid-1920s after having taught the clarinet to the man who is supposed to be the original for James Bond's M. He also, later, played a couple of seasons at a communist summer camp in the Berkshires, oblivious to the warnings of Willie the Lion Smith, who could not stand it for more than a week, on the grounds that it was the most mixed-up camp I ever saw or heard about the races, the sexes, and the religions were all mixed. Unlike most other jazz musicians of his generation, Sidney Bechet was essentially a loner and, in the opinions of those who had business with him, which almost invariably ended in acrimony, a man to handle with great care. At the more egomaniacal end of the entertainment business, where a number of jazz musicians are also to be found, those who have dealings with artists are inclined to regard them, privately, as monsters rather than human beings, but the critical consensus about the difficulties of life with Bechet goes well beyond the complaints of bookers and managers. He was dangerous if he thought you didn't like him, observed Sammy Price, the Texas blues pianist, who came from a milieu where mere shortness of temper would not necessarily warrant this adjective. He could be a fiend admits his biographer. A very difficult person to work with, self-centered and inconsiderate of others, and never happy to share a spotlight, observed one of his many bookers. Even his admiring pupil Bob Wilbur concedes that he could be evil and, it's not too strong a word, paranoic sick. Others were constantly conspiring against him on at least one occasion, he was convinced, by witchcraft, against which he took appropriate action by setting the 23rd Psalm to music. He was so worried that he did so without payment. In short, as in Cocteau's joke about Victor Hugo, Sidney Bechet was pretty close to being a madman who imagined he was Sidney Bechet. In both cases the illusion was justified by the man's undeniably extraordinary talents. Moreover, in both cases illusion became reality. The French reopened the Pantheon for the dead Hugo and they put up a statue to the dead Bechet. Bechet took this for granted. 
My most durable memory, wrote a musician of a week's gig, is of seeing Sidney sitting backstage, as though he were a king on a throne. He received his loyal subjects, and there were quite a few, with imperious acknowledgments. Alfred Lyon of Blue Note Records came and faded Sidney with champagne, which he accepted with an egocentric but regal bow. These characteristics are probably enough to explain his musical isolation. By and large, in the structured and expensive forms of stage and screen entertainment the excesses of solipsism were, until the rise of rock and roll, kept under some control. And jazz is a democratic art, shaped by those who play together, which imposes limits on all participants, no skater, however brilliant, has as much scope for personal display in a hockey game as in figure skating. But Bechet, while naturally recognizing the collective nature of his music, seems to have resented any version of jazz which did not either build the collective round his central and dominant voice, or at least provide him with a regular virtuoso showcase. Indeed, he switched from his original instrument, the clarinet, to the soprano saxophone, in which hardly anyone else specialized in his lifetime, most certainly because of its greater capacity to lead, or to impose itself on, an ensemble. Bechet could not stand trumpeters who took the lead which conventionally belonged to their instrument, especially not those like Louis Armstrong, who might have outshone him, and of whom he was acutely jealous. He worked best with good and even-tempered partners who did not compete for first place, like the trumpeters-slash-cornetists Tommy Ladnier and Muggsy Spanier, with both of whom he produced ravishing records. In such cases he made adequate room for their solos. He was even more at ease with instruments that complemented his, such as the piano, as with Earl Hines in the famous blues in thirds. However, basically he had the instincts, but not the talents, of a commanding officer, or perhaps of the old-fashioned actor-manager who took it for granted that his shows were about him. That is why in later years he felt at ease with young, less talented and less experienced French musicians, for whom he was the honored sensei or master, even when he cut out the solos of those who had eyes for the girls he fancied himself. But Bill Coleman, the delicate expatriate trumpeter, was unfair to accuse Bechet of being only happy when he can bark orders at amateurs. The most one can say is that he needed more control than he liked or, usually, got. His finest work was done in small groups of players who took each other's talent, and, above all, professionalism for granted. He played some marvelous sides in 1949 with the bop drummer Kenny Clark, though neither had much sympathy or feeling for the other's music. He was even better when he shared the basic ideas on format and procedure with his partners, as a former sideman recalled. Bechet and the bass player Wellman Broad arrived wearing big old coats and hats, I think Bechet had a beret on. They sat down opposite one another and exchanged pleasantries. It was like an ancient ritual between chieftains. Muggsy Spanier joined in whilst he was warming up same sort of approach. Being used to the razzmatazz of his swing band preparations I wondered what was going to happen, one, two, three, four, and wham. This music explodes all around me. However, Bechet's isolation was not only personal but also geographical. Jazz is, among other things, diaspora music. Its history is part of the mass migration out of the Old South, and it is, for economic as well as often for psychological reasons, made by footloose people who spend a lot of time on the road. It would certainly not have become a national American music as early as it did if men with horns had not physically brought it into places where it had not previously been known. Joe Derensberg's autobiography Jazz Odyssey illustrates this diffusion of New Orleans jazz excellently, and in doing so it throws light on the pioneer generation to which Bechet belongs. It takes its hero in the 1920s from Baton Rouge via Los Angeles, Mississippi, Tennessee, St. Louis, and Harrisburg, Illinois back to the West Coast and up to the Pacific Northwest which he helped to open up to jazz. In the history of this music, cities like Seattle, Portland, and Spokane have hardly counted for much, but Derensberg demonstrates that at least social historians of jazz should take the Northwest seriously. Word spread round among musicians that you could make money in Seattle. It was a money town, 
Derensborg says. Nevertheless, most migratory jasmine stayed in the U.S., which was, in any case, the place where the action was. Bechet belonged to the minority who, from the start looked to the global market for black artists, women like Josephine Baker, who was discovered by Paris, men like the pianist Teddy Weatherford who, from the mid-1920s, operated mainly in the great Asian port cities like Shanghai and Calcutta, or the trumpeter Bill Coleman who lived mainly in France from the early 1930s. Bechet himself spent only three years of the 1920s in the U.S., 1922-1925, and the rest in England, France, Germany, Russia, and a number of lesser European countries, which explains both why he recorded much less in that decade than musicians of lesser talents, and why, when he returned to the U.S. in 1931, younger players thought of him as passé, compared to influential sax players like Hawkins and Benny Carter. A great deal had happened to the fast-evolving music in the almost six years since he had left. Probably a lot of the younger musicians of the swing era continued to think of him as a strong but old-fashioned player, if they thought about him at all. Indeed, Bechet's position was so marginal that he and Tommy Ladnier left full-time music to open a clothes repair and cleaning shop in Harlem in 1933, unsuccessfully, like all business projects of Bechet who mistakenly saw himself as an entrepreneur, and as late as 1939 he considered quitting music again to open a hash house in Philadelphia. In short, the man who had been a major figure and influence in the early 1920s, at 42 seemed an exhausted talent, an impression reinforced by his looking older than his years. Admittedly he returned to the U.S. at a bad time for jazz. It was not so much that the slump knocked the bottom out of the market for jazz records, which were hardly yet money spinners for sidemen, as that hot jazz, somehow tied to the mood of the Roaring Twenties, fell victim to the depressed atmosphere as well as the money problems of the slump years. The shift of public taste away from the fast and loud and toward dream landed has not been much noted by jazz historians was international in the early thirties. German music critics observed it mainly with satisfaction, between 1931 and 1933. Chilton demonstrates that it was equally marked in Harlem. In 1932 Rudy Vallée pulled in 2,800 customers a night in a leading ballroom, but Ellington only a quarter of that, Guy Lombardo 2,200, but Cab Calloway 500, Ben Burney 2,000 but Louis Armstrong 350. Bechet was not the only player for whom the times were out of joint in the early 1930s, but it must have been particularly hard for a man so conscious of his gifts to lack both money and reputation among his peers. What saved him was the strange and unexpected phenomenon of jazz antiquarianism in the form of the search for the true music of New Orleans by impassioned groups of young white fans for whom jazz was not only a music but also a symbol and a cause. The Dixieland Revival which grew out of this search, has been dismissed, in the New Grove, as the longest-lasting movement in jazz but, the only one to have produced no music of value too however, if it had done no more than to recover Bechet for the main jazz tradition, it would have justified its existence. Bechet had always attracted the musical conoscenti. Ernest Ansermet wrote his universally quoted panegyric in 1919, when Edward J. Dent, the champion of Mozartian opera, also singled him out favorably from among the rest of the southern syncopated orchestra, which he otherwise considered nightmare entertainment. Ansermet's forgotten praise, I wish to set down the name of this artist of genius, as for myself, I shall never forget it, it is Sidney Bechet, was given general circulation after 1938 when it was republished in the French, L.E. Jazz Hot and the British, Melody Maker.3. The small but select group of knowledgeable jazz lovers had no trouble in recognizing his quality, but few others listened to fugitive groups like the New Orleans Feet Warmers of 1932 to 1933 and the half dozen sides they recorded. After a market for jazz developed again in the mid 1930s, these aficionados managed to get Bechet a few small group sessions, which for the first time brought him before the main jazz public and made his reputation the 1937 tracks on the Variety label, initiated by Helen Oakley, supported by Bechet's old admirers Ellington and Hodges, 
the classic 1938 Bechelatnier records organized by the French pioneer critic Hugues Panassi, and, of course, John Hammond and New Mass's famous 1938 Carnegie Hall concert from spirituals to swing. These inspired the 1939 recordings of Bechet by a recent refugee jazz enthusiast from Berlin, Alfred Lyon, which established the fortunes of his new Blue Note label as well as confirming those of Bechet. While Bechet's Euro-American rescuers appreciated the New Orleans tradition how could any jazz lover fail to do so, and were always anxious to bring back unjustly forgotten artists, they were not New Orleans buffs. Even the Bechet-Ladnier sessions which, it has been claimed, had more to do with the Dixieland revival than any others were distinguished for their artistry more than their authenticity. Yet behind them an obscure tide of nostalgia was rising, especially among young middle-class whites, for the pure, the beautiful, the only true music of jazz which had somehow been betrayed when Storyville was shut down and the players moved up the Mississippi, though the survivors of the 1920s doing their own thing in small groups were better than nothing, especially if they were black. Dixieland or the New Orleans revival was essentially a non-musical phenomenon, though it was to enable vast numbers of amateurs to enjoy themselves playing muskrat ramble and similar numbers. It belongs to cultural and intellectual history, which is why it deserves the serious investigation it has not yet received. It was a purely white movement, though naturally welcomed by aging Creole musicians, especially those down on their luck. New Orleans became a multiple myth and symbol, anti-commercial, anti-racist, proletarian populist, New Deal radical, or just anti-respectable and anti-parental, depending on taste. In the US and other English-speaking countries, its ideological center was unquestionably located on the borders between the New Deal and the Communist Party, though for most of the young fans it was probably just something that spoke straight to even uninformed hearts. The internationally influential book Jazzmen of 1939, the first American history of the music based on research, which established the Up the River from Storyville version in its purest form, was co-edited by a music critic on The Daily Worker. Revivalism linked the cause of the blacks and the minority taste for jazz with folk song and folk music, ancient and modern, which were and long remained the central pillars of the left wing subculture that merged into the New Deal culture. So Bechet, a man of Catholic musical tastes, found that he had somehow been swept into the Dixieland world. For him, Dixieland was in the first instance the key to recognition. The 1940 recordings on which he shared the bill with Louis Armstrong were the proof that he had won it, and, granting his late restart, with remarkable speed. From then on no short list of the jazz greats would ever leave him out. In the second instance, the Dixieland movement gave him a license to go on doing what he had done all along, since he had told Ansermet in 1919 that he followed his own way, without taking much notice of others. His age made him an undeniable founding father of New Orleans jazz, and his style was therefore ipso facto beyond criticism. In fact, Bechet felt quite at home within the limited Dixieland format, for he was primarily a linear improviser and melody ist, and not much interested in harmonic games as such. In any case he was only too pleased that his strong, fluent, looping, and pulsating ropes of beautiful sound, a jugful of golden honey Armstrong called his tone, were easily accessible even to the non-musical, except for those they always existed who found his striking vibrato intolerable. He was not, and did not have to be, a purist, but neither did he have to keep up with the times, this did not stop him from playing superbly with any first-rate musician irrespective of style. How far did Dixieland provide him with a living, the question that was undoubtedly uppermost in his mind? It is certain that he relied heavily on the public for the rediscovered small group jazz of the 1920s players, which found a Greenwich Village home at Nick's and its public relations man in Eddie Condon. He clearly also relied on the left-wing connection for gigs, though it is not clear how far this was purely commercial. Still, in spite of suggestions of communist sympathies, and his undoubted fond memories of Russia, it is hard to see Bechet as a political figure, still less a red among black jazz players. As for the New Orleans revival, 
he recognized its potential for a certified charter member of the Crescent City. Whatever the motives, his 1945 partnership with Bunk Johnson, an ancient trumpeter disinterred by the purists and turned into an icon of authenticity, showed the fans where he stood. Like earlier partnerships, this one also ended in bad feelings. Yet none of these jobs provided him with an adequate income at the level Bechet thought appropriate to his standing, though by the late 1940s he now had reasonable record royalties. What finally solved his problems was the invitation to France in 1949. In that country, where jazz had enormous intellectual and cultural prestige and resistance associations, he discovered what he had always dreamed of a vast public for whom the man with a French name and sponsored by French critics was a certified genius of jazz, and a community of young fan musicians whose hearts beat faster at the very thought that he would honor them by stepping into their cellars. France became his permanent home. He became a cultural mascot as Josephine Baker had been. It did his music little good, but his finances no harm at all. It removed him from the personal and entrepreneurial frictions that had always complicated his life in the U.S. He lived out his life as a happy expatriate. The man who emerges from Chilton's admirable researches was both a typical product of New Orleans and a very odd character. As a member of the Creoles of Color, members of the Francophone, Free Mulatto Artisan and Lower Middle Class, pressed back toward the blacks by post-Civil War segregation, he acquired the musical and professional skills of his community. Throughout his life he could do tailoring and cook, although he refused to be apprenticed to a craftsman's trade as most Creole players were. But then he also, and quite uncharacteristically, refused to learn to read music, initially no doubt because it seemed unnecessary for so brilliant a natural musician, later out of rebellion, in the end perhaps out of defensive pride. He shared the New Orleans Creole social courtesy, their taste for dressing respectably, their justified pride in the city's musical tradition, and perhaps the unusual lack of interest in race relations that seems to have been characteristic of New Orleans musicians. From Joe Derensberg's autobiography it is impossible to discover whether he was white or black. Bechet himself frequently said he was more interested in a man's musical talent than in the color of his skin and apropos of Mez Mesro, a white champion of black superiority, that race does not matter it is hitting the notes right that counts. And perhaps the intense interest in classical music that he had a chance to develop in Moscow on free days he would regularly go to symphony concerts before hitting the nightclubs was based on the pre-1914 musical culture which lower middle class Louisiana Creole families shared with James Joyce's Dublin equivalents. Caruso, from whom Bechet claimed to derive his vibrato, was part of both. At all events Bechet, a great man for the Espressivo, put a quote from Pagliacci into a solo as readily as he put Beethoven's picture on his wall. And yet, there can be no denying that he was a man who stood at a fairly acute angle to his universe. Jazz players are more tolerant of the vagaries of human behavior than any other group of people, but while nobody who played with him failed to admire his marvelous musicianship, the general view about Bechet from the band stands was distinctly unenthusiastic, whether he was with or without the dog and the knife that often accompanied him. Even his admirer Ellington, who seriously considered bringing him into the band again in 1932, in the end chose not to. He must plainly have been a hard man to get along with for any length of time, although with women he found it easier to maintain his soft-spoken and courteous New Orleans charm. He remains an extraordinary figure in jazz, a role player who was not good at choosing his roles, a man often living in a world of fantasy, a wayfaring stranger who rode into and out of town, nowhere at home except on the throne he thought of as his right, loyal to nobody except himself, but he was an astonishing, unforgettable artist, utterly original in spite of remaining firmly within an obsolescent tradition. After his death he acquired a reputation even among the modernists, as shown by the spread of the soprano saxophone among them. It had been virtually Bechet's monopoly. Coltrane took to it from 1961. He became a posthumous classic. And yet, if it were not for the handful of jazz intellectuals who rescued him, the small jazz labels of the late 1930s, the white kids in basement clubs, 
the French who made his dreams come true, what would have happened to him? He would not have fitted into the big swing bands. He would have been around, but why should younger musicians have made space for an old man with a voice from the past who seemed to take no interest in new ideas, and had the reputation of being a self-centered, truculent, and tight-fisted son of a bitch? Perhaps after his death some musicians might, by sheer accident, have discovered the forgotten six sides from 1932 and, listening to that astonishing maple leaf rag, have felt what Coltrane said apropos of the same session, did all of those old guys swing like that? No, but Bechet did. Thanks to middle-class whites we do not have to recover a handful of old 78s from beyond the grave. We were lucky to recover a classic while he was still alive. There is some justification for the jazz fans after all, even the ones who don't know much about jazz. When they heard it, they had no trouble recognizing the eloquence, the lyrical passion, the swinging joy, and the blues that came out of Bechet's horn whenever he blew into it. Fans do not always fall in love with the best in the arts, but this time they did. Some like it hot. It seems quite clear today in retrospect, writes Gunther Schuller, who was at the time entering his teens, that the Depression years and their aftermath were culturally and artistically the richest this nation has experienced in this century. Probably many more people would today agree with this proposition than would dissent from it, but not many would be convinced by the author's comment that this was so because, with financial and material acquisition virtually at a standstill, those lean years forced most Americans to turn to themselves to rely upon and appreciate more their own creative imaginative instincts and impulses. Self-expression, whatever personal form it might take, became almost of necessity more important than commerce and career. For the American arts and culture that in retrospect we regard as the glory of the 30s were essentially commercial, if only because the huge apparatus of patronage and public subsidy, which has made so many writers and composers into dependence of the system of higher education in the late 20th century, was not yet in place. Federal money undoubtedly became important in the Roosevelt years, but how much of the extraordinary achievement of that period would be lost if we imagined that everything financed, say, by the WPA, suddenly disappeared from the record? True, the work it sponsored was substantial, and the creative talents it helped to keep alive were numerous and impressive, but even in the field in which public patronage made its greatest impact, in the recording of folk culture and folk music, notably by Alan Lomax at the Library of Congress, its essential function was conservation and salvage rather than construction. Even so, if we would not have the work of Lead Belly but for Alan Lomax, and his father, John Lomax, who found him serving his prison sentence in Angola, Louisiana, we would still have the likes of Robert Johnson, who was recorded by a commercial company. The major cultural achievements of the 1930s undoubtedly belong essentially to a box office culture, if only because in the U.S. there was no alternative to it. This applies not only to the arts for which variety made itself the spokesman, then as now concerned with grosses rather than immortality, but to serious literature, to an extent that surprises observers accustomed to the self-contained literary milieus of the old world and of contemporary America. Moreover, whatever the state of the U.S. economy, show business generally was anything but depressed, though like American society as a whole, it rested, and still rests, on an unusually deep foundation of marginal, insecure, expendable men, women, and styles. Since students of jazz history have been largely concerned with black performers, most of whom, by the nature of their skin, lived, as Bessie Smith's Backwater Blues put it, in permanent danger of submersion, Incidents like the temporary collapse of the jazz and race record market in the early 1930s have attracted much attention. Nevertheless, by and large, as readers of Studs Terkel's marvelous hard times will recall, poverty, and insecurity, and prosperity for entertainment went together. This does not mean that the box office can claim responsibility for the cultural accomplishments of the period some of whose most striking glories Gunther Schuller analyzes in the second volume of his History of Jazz, The Swing Years. The net effect of subordinating creation to commerce, then as now, was to degrade, to corrupt, 
and to infantilize, as a product of the search for what would appeal to the widest public. That is no doubt the reason why jazz ceased to satisfy both its creative musicians and its devoted lovers almost from the moment it briefly became mass popular music as swing, the most interesting musicians, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and Thelonious Monk among them, advanced toward what would become bebop, many jazz lovers, barely noticed by Schuller, retreated to Dixie. Schuller, who notes how the swing band succumbed more or less rapidly to the lures or pressures of the market, knows better than most what that sort of market does to art. As he points out, strings in commercial music do not have to sound soggy and syrupy, but in jazz slash commercial arrangements they do, unlike any of the several 100,000 classical symphonic pieces from Corelli to the present, none of which even those by, say, Rachmaninoff, Ravel and Delius, sound remotely like that. It is no mystery why even writers who were quite happy to write for less money for commercial magazines apologize to each other for accepting the gold line degradation of Hollywood script writing. Yet this does not explain why serious and self-respecting work emerged on this commercial scene or was compatible with it, i.e., why artists found themselves able, with all qualifications, to do their thing at least partly within the system. They had not yet accepted its incompatibility with artistic creation by the public gestures of defeatism and abdication that pictures of Campbell soup cans, and indeed all Warhol's career, exemplify. Here Gunther Schuller provides some more positive if imprecise suggestions. What he detects in this era is the special identity between a people and its music, which, he argues, has since been fragmented by the complexities of the post-war period, not to mention the disunity and strife brought into our national experience since then by a Cold War, McCarthyism, the Vietnam War, various crises relating to minority self-identity. This former unity he associates not only with past innocence, that familiar illusion of those who are growing old, but also with the fact that the 30s were for many people a new beginning, not least for black musicians, who could, for the first time, see jazz as a profession. On the reason for this sense of new times, the author is nebulous, except for the suggestion that the Vogue for Swing attracted a good many talented musicians. Did the growth of jazz and its audience in the 1930s take place despite the Depression or perhaps because of it? Where does the Roosevelt era fit in? Nevertheless, it is clear to him that this remarkable period in the development of American jazz, with its unexpected musical sociological alliances, cannot be adequately analyzed in purely musicological terms. Mr. Schuller's book is an implicit call for a social, economic, and cultural history of jazz in the New Deal years. However, this is not where the author's heart lies. Though his book derives its value from his own theoretical and practical expertise as an instrumentalist and composer, he approaches the subject mainly as a fan. Those whose memory of jazz enthusiasts goes back to the years when this young classical horn player acquired his passion will recognize the characteristics of the period to which he belonged and about which he writes. Aficionados were and had to be self-taught, or taught from one or two books, like Hugues Panacea's Hot Jazz, which introduced many an American to this music, this writer included. They developed their often impressive erudition by talking at length to musicians or anyone else connected with the business, by unceasing and sometimes polemical debate with other real jazz fans the ones who would not be seen dead dancing to a jazz orchestra but above all by concentrated and repeated listening to every 78 RPM record available. No close reading of poems in English literature classes can compare in intensity with the scrutiny of every moment of those magic three and a half minutes. Like its distinguished predecessor early jazz, the swing era will bring back the mood of early jazz writing and criticism of jazz, the weighing of bands and soloists against each other, the attention to every line written by other pioneers, the preoccupation with impassioned debates about what exactly swing is, and precisely how vital blacks or African influence are to jazz. Above all, like the earlier literature, but on an incomparably higher level of musical competence, the book is addressed to a readership as passionately involved in the subject as the author, and ready to follow him through more than 850 pages. Essentially Schuller has written a series of monographs of bands and artists under classificatory headings, 
the great black bands, the great soloists, the white bands, small groups, etc. They range in length from the 111 pages devoted to Ellington, through the 40 or so for Basie, Armstrong, and, more surprising, if historically justifiable, Goodman, to 10 to 20 each for most of some 50 others. The general format is a chronological critical commentary on the recorded obra, preceded by general observations, and concluding with a brief and firm judgment. The argument is addressed to the musically literate. Some readers may be tempted to regard this book as a work of critical reference for the moments when one is expected to show more knowledge of the likes of Claude Hopkins, the Mills Blue Rhythm Band, and the Casa Loma Orchestra than is reasonably expected in anyone not yet a senior citizen. A work that fails to take an interest in boogie woogie, country and city blues, and gospel can hardly claim to be encyclopedic. Certainly this is not a volume likely to be read at one sitting, or designed for this purpose. The numerous musical illustrations are ideally intended to supplement the actual records from which they are transcribed. Yet the swing era should not be interred on the reference shelf with the fanfares, in this case justified, that usually greet the publication of any musically literate book about jazz. For what makes this book important is not the author's erudition there are others who are equally learned about jazz or even his critical discrimination, formidable though that is. There are other musically expert critics, even though few will want lightly to disagree with Schuller's considered judgments, even when, as in the case of Art Tatum, he shows less enthusiasm than most of us. What makes Schuller invaluable is, first, that he writes as a man equally versed in classical music and jazz after all, he is best known for championing a fusion of both in the 60s under the name Third Stream and, above all, that he is a lifelong, professional, practicing instrumentalist as well as a composer. He played the French horn with the Miles Davis Nanette of 1949, which recorded the birth of the cool. The uniqueness of Schuller's books lies in his awareness, based on his practical experience, of what musicians actually do on the bandstand and how they see their problems. The insight is central, since it is the democratic community of musicians that, after all, made and developed jazz, powered, as Schuller sees so well, by each artist's desire to learn and improve, so powerful that new ideas, were gobbled up and digested in no time, everyone eager to push ahead to still newer discoveries. He knows how much work was necessary to reach competitive instrumental supremacy, and what a strain the high FS were on even Armstrong's embouchure. He appreciates the desire to excel, to reach unclimbed peaks of virtuosity, and at the same time to create, the basic problem of the improviser being that he cannot command the highest flights of his imagination, but can only bring his capacity for instantaneous invention to such a high level that it is never less than adequate unto the task, all the while hoping for, and occasionally being able to count on, those special days when he is particularly articulate. It takes a practicing musician to recognize what it means for a creative jazz singer to learn, rapidly and impeccably, hundreds of songs, most of them in the 1930s hot off the press. For it is not possible to so thoroughly recompose and improvise upon that many songs without knowing them completely. You can only intelligently deviate from something, if you know it deeply. How does the repertoire of standards for improvising musicians come into being? Schuller immediately shows, by listing the songs Armstrong recorded in 1930 to 1931, that his taste was virtually infallible, considering the temptations to be otherwise, and apparently his choices were made rather instantaneously. Of the right songs he missed a few Gershwins but not for me and Embraceable You and Porter's Love for Sale but not many. Only musicians do not need to be told that by playing virtuoso eight-note solos at top tempos, one can hide one's tone deficiencies, which explains why excellent saxophonists who wanted to play like Coleman Hawkins but couldn't were tempted to become speed players. Schuller's experience in the business enables him to show that many stylistic characteristics of early jazz were imposed by the technical limitations of recording, or ballroom acoustics and noise. The sharp ear of the bandstand readily tells the difference between players with a genuine bent for improvisation and those who, having created a satisfactory composition, 
stick to it? Billie Holiday did not really improvise, in the truest sense. Her performances were fixed beforehand. Deviations from a first take will invariably be infinitesimal, cosmetic. Such observations, often incidental or even in footnotes, not only are among the chief pleasures of Schuller's book, but give it its special value. Hardly anyone else can write on jazz with this authority. The swing era is indispensable to serious jazz lovers. If any are in doubt about this, Schuller's 20 pages on Billie Holiday, a model of what first-rate jazz criticism should be, will decide the matter. However, the book is not what it claims to be, namely a study of the development of jazz from 1933 to 1945, though it contains a good deal of material for such a study. For this we would need to be told much more about the music business and its changes, the transformation of the record industry, including the rise of specialized aficionado labels, about the college and non-college dancing public, the rise of the specialist jazz-slash-pop press, and a number of other matters which are assumed as background information by those of Mr. Schuller's generation, but cannot be taken for granted perhaps even by those who rely on their memory. Above all, such a study calls for an inquiry into the political and cultural milieu of the Roosevelt era, which shaped the development of jazz to a considerable extent, often in a concrete way. Take, for instance, the late John Hammond, the most influential, non-performing, individual in the field, whose name and good deeds on behalf of jazz will run like a constant thread through this entire history. And so they should. But how was it possible for any single person, however devoted to the black cause and to jazz, however well-connected and with however amazing a nose for talent, to exercise so much influence single-handedly? Because Hammond placed himself at the point of intersection of four forces, black popular music, the New York-centered, and politically open, music and record industry and its associated structure of bookers and agents, the Europeans, who formed the first nucleus of a specifically jazz record market, and above all, the culture of the New Deal progressives and the left, to which he passionately assented. For Hammond unquestionably saw his major contribution as bringing black talent out of the ghetto, and to win for it not simply the honor that was its due, but work and careers in a white, or ideally an integrated, world. But to convince white musicians to play or even record publicly with black ones, to open integrated clubs like Cafe Society as metropolitan showcases for, black, talent, even to get a roughneck band from Kansas City like Basie's accepted by a major agency, took more in the 1930s than merely artistic or commercial decisions, even once it had been demonstrated that black swing was saleable. And even this, as Schuller shows, had been partly engineered by Hammond, who persuaded Benny Goodman whose band became the show window of so many later discoveries to take over the material of the Fletcher Henderson band, which was to help make his fortune as the king of swing. For jazz to go so far, it needed impresarios and entrepreneurs also committed to a cause, like the late Barney Josephson of Cafe Society, later driven out of business by the witch hunt. It required a certain public relaxation of an apartheid far stronger than we can now imagine. It needed the political and cultural populism so characteristic of the New Deal era, which generated a paying public for what could be publicized as coming from genuine poor folks, the musical equivalent of Steinbeck's readers. It needed both selfless and expert enthusiasts, and welcoming receivers of the gospel like those who filled Carnegie Hall for the famous Spirituals to Swing concert. In short, as the career of Billie Holiday demonstrates, the artistic development of jazz in the 30s cannot be separated from its political and social setting, and Schuller's book itself makes this clear. For whatever the mass success of a few big bands and singers, most jazz appealed to a specialized minority. But for John Hammond's commitment, and, of course, discernment, Billie Holiday would never have been discovered in a Harlem dive singing for tips in the intervals between hustling. But for disinterested guidance and help from sympathizers, she would not have been recorded adequately, or perhaps at all. But for a New York middle-class public with intellectual and populist inclinations, 
she would never have become a cabaret star in a politically hip Greenwich Village room run by the brother of a come and turn agent, and attended by the sort of writers who asked her to sing about lynching, a subject every commercial agent would have warned her against. Strange Fruit, which haunts everyone who has ever heard her sing it, may have tempted her into excessive later mannerisms. Here Schuller and Hammond agree. But it transformed her standing in the world, as well as among the left-wing and Park Avenue liberals, Greenwich Village intellectuals and bohemians who idolized her, while most middle America white swing fans never heard it and went on discovering Glenn Miller instead. Which discovery has lasted better? If this unique artist is today universally recognized as a genius, it is in part because of the particular constellation of political and social tendencies of the late 1930s, without which none of us would even know that such a woman had ever lived. Gunther Schuller, of course, knows all this. He has simply chosen to write about something else. To say that the swing era is not much of a contribution to the social and cultural history of the US or of jazz is not to criticize it, though one hopes that the author may one day find time to recall his memories and impressions of the musicians he plainly knew and observed so closely. The genre of the jazz profile has its pitfalls, such as the temptation to string together anecdotes, but such a book by Schuller would be enormously rewarding. In the meanwhile Jean Lee's lively Meet Me at Jim and Andy's, though dealing mainly with a later period, overlaps with the swing era with its portraits of Artie Shaw and Duke Ellington, the latter exceptionally perceptive. No doubt others will write the history of the swing era, on which much remains to be said. Others will provide the balanced encyclopedic survey to which this author, with all his knowledge, prefers his personal choices, in deference to critics who pointed out the virtual omission of Red Nichols's kind of jazz from early jazz, Schuller has added some appreciative but anachronistic pages to the present volume. The swing era is a labor of learning, of critical discernment and respect, of profound knowledge of how jazz and jazz musicians work. Together with the volume on jazz since the bop revolution that Schuller is now preparing, early jazz and the swing era will stand as a monumental contribution to jazz literature. What more, except readers, can any author hope for? Appendix 1, The British Jazz Fan, 1958 A few thousand young Britons, of whom about half live in London and the home counties and 30% in the London postal area, belong to the National Jazz Federation which undertakes various activities designed to foster jazz. It is reasonable to regard them as a cross-section of the community of British jazz enthusiasts, though not necessarily of the larger marginal jazz public. Thanks to the foresight of this organization, intending members are asked to state their occupation. The following information is based on a random sample of 820 filing cards. I am greatly obliged to Mr. Harold Pendleton of the NJF and to his colleagues for making these invaluable records available to me. Only about 60 out of the 820 sample jazz enthusiasts are girls, the public of enthusiasts is overwhelmingly male. The remainder of this analysis is therefore confined to the boys and young men, for though no ages are given, it is evident that virtually all NJF members are young. There are too few girls to allow us to draw any conclusions about their occupations and social classes, but as we might expect, the majority seem to be office workers and shop assistants, with a sprinkling of students, nurses, and technicians. Occupation for most jazz fans means future occupation, since so many of them are still being educated, apprenticed, or trained, and many are in military service. Where a precise civilian occupation is indicated, I have listed it, i.e. when a card says soldier, civilian occupation clerk it has been counted as clerk, when it says architectural student it has been counted among architects and not students. However, this still leaves several imprecise occupational labels, e.g. student, which may well include a number of school children or the troublesome engineer, which may indicate anything between a fitter's mate and a future civil engineer. The following table, which lists the main occupational groups in order of size, is therefore rather rough and ready. Since this book is not addressed to specialist sociologists, I have cut technical notes and explanations to the minimum. Occupations of male members of NJF I 
Total number. 758. 2. Unclassifiable. 1. Schoolboys and students. 91. 2. Occupation unstated. 59. 3. National Service and Armed Forces, A. 39. 3. Classifiable occupations. 4. Engineers and electricians, B. 120. 5. Clerks, including bank clerks. 105. 6. Other skilled workers, printing trades, C. 33. Building trades, D. 23. Other skilled workers. 1773. 7. Draftsmen, surveyors, etc. 36. 8. Business and commerce, E. 32. 9. Transport, F. 25. 10. Scientific workers, G. 23. 11. Semi and unskilled workers, H. 25. 12. Technologists and technicians, I. 21. 13. Higher engineering, J. 17. 14. Artists, writers, journalists, advertising, etc. 15. 15. Civil servants, local government, etc. 12. 16 accountants. 11. 17 mining, iron, and steel. 9. 18. Post and telegraph, K. 9. 19 photographers. 6. 20 articled clerks. 5. 21 teachers, social workers, librarian. 5. 22 agricultural and forestry. 4. 23 policemen. 3. 24 doctors and dentists. 2. 25 miscellaneous. 11. Appendix 2, Jazz Language. This note does not set out to provide a glossary of jazz terms or jazz slang. Such lists may be found elsewhere, e.g. in Feathers Encyclopedia, and are almost always out of date by the time they are printed. Rather, it asks how the jazz vocabulary is formed. It consists of three rather different things, a, technical terms, b, jive talk, and, c, names. Since the founders of jazz were mainly illiterate, at least musically, their technical and critical terminology owes little to orthodoxy except the names of the instruments and of certain elementary musical concepts such as keys and chords. Technical terms either duplicate existing, but unfamiliar, ones e.g. slide, smear, for glissando, slapping for pizzicato playing, changes for the harmonic progression of a tune or they describe things for which no proper academic equivalent exists, e.g. shake, an extreme form of vibrato, chase, a series of choruses by two or more players each playing several bars in turn, breaks, open passages in the performance when the rhythm is suspended, more generally, solo passages, or blue notes. Most of these terms are formed by analogy, except a few of obscure origin, such as gig, a casual job, notably a one-night stand, or riff, a repeated two- or four-bar phrase. A virtually self-explanatory term from ordinary language is given a specialized meaning, or else a simple metaphor is used, e.g. dirty for a kind of instrumental sound. The vocabulary is utilitarian and, until recently, when musicians have begun to use musical jargon, unpretentious. The earlier jazz musicians did not feel the need to call themselves by a socially more respectable name, as undertakers call themselves morticians or press agents public relations experts. Louis Armstrong had his hot five, not his hot quintet. An orchestra was and is a band if large, a combo, combination, when small. A melody or theme is, or was, a tune, a composition and arrangement, a band's repertoire, its book. Its leader is the front man, 
its members sidemen. Pretentiousness only began to creep in since the later 1930s when the trios and sextets arrived. This simple method of forming technical terms will not do for more complex concepts such as musical styles. These cannot be self-explanatory, though bop, bebop or obs rebop, is said to copy a rhythmic phrase. Mostly the names of jazz styles have been formed in exactly the same way as those of the Lake Poets, the Euston Road School, or the Fav, i.e. by association, Barrel House, Boogie Woogie, Dixieland, Kansas City. The formation of a technical vocabulary for critical appreciation, value judgments, and other imprecise concepts is even harder. Since the only jazz critics were for long the musicians and the public, neither very articulate in words, the critical vocabulary is simple and adapted from non-musical experience. It has been argued that the terms which express success in playing jazz, or the player's sensation when he thinks he is playing well, or the appreciation of both, are borrowed from the most pleasurable sensations of ordinary life. Sex is an obvious source, as in jazz itself, apparently a delta word for coitus, in to send, to induce ecstasy or orgasm, OBS to sweep away the listener, or perhaps in hot, which has well established sexual associations. Drink and drugs are others, their sensations being in some respects more suitable analogues of jazz experience, since they provide continuous exaltation rather than periodic climaxes, not to mention the fact that they can be combined with playing. Perhaps the modern, but uninviting, fashion of using terms taken from mental derangement for praise, crazy, insane, nutty, is merely an extension of the metaphors taken from drugging, real gone, out of this world. Perhaps it marks the increasing turn of certain schools of jazz from normality, the rise of antisocial jazz. At all events the fashion cannot be traced back beyond the later 1930s. In a more general sense the terms for emotion were formed by metaphor, e.g. by the widespread practice of equating joy with height, exaltation, and grief with depth, or with the colors red and blue, or with fast and slow. Thus the quality most desired in the old blues is that it should be low down or dragging. The modern term funky smelly compares with the orthodox earthy dot. On the other hand hot and cool have the associations, excited and relaxed. Much the most difficult linguistic job is to find words for the two connected but indefinable things, the right mood when the playing goes well, and the rhythm. Rhythm, and since bands depend on it, the playing of the entire band, is described in terms of two kinds of movement, to and fro and forwards. A band moves or drives or just goes, it swings, jumps, or rocks. It moves and stays in one place, which is the essence of good jazz rhythm. The metaphors for the right mood of the band are merely ways of expressing approval, it may be real hot or real cool, depending on style, solid, groovy, OBS in the groove, or merely right. Obviously this critical vocabulary is very feeble and crude, though less so than the modern inarticulateness of the fans for whom criticism is exhausted in a few mumbles, the greatest, the most, wild. This poverty is not only due to the fact that words are not the instrument of jazz musicians, but also to the fact that, being both players and critics, they are merely an ancillary to instrumental demonstration. The following passage by a famous New Orleans drummer sounds vague enough to the layman, but much less so to musicians used to playing in front of drummers. Each man has a solo, I give him a different beat. It may sound to someone that's listening close by the same, but it's not. I would say it's a different sound to it, because I give every man a chance of his opening. In other words, like a guy is going to come in, I give him something for him to come in on, and it makes it different from the fellow that's got through. Even if it's piano or trumpet or clarinet, I give some kind of indication that something's coming, and that a lot of drummers don't do, because you've got to think. Quoted in The Jazz Makers, Ed. Shapiro and Hentoff, P41. The second kind of jazz language, jive talk or hipster talk is not a technical terminology but an argo or cant designed to set the group apart from outsiders. Its foundation is the distinction between those who are hip or in, and the squares who are not. 
The player as such calls his instrument a clarinet, which identifies it well enough, qua hipster he may call it by some name which only the initiate can understand, e.g. the OBS gobs tick. In the past most such private argos have relied on a fair amount of isolation, and thus maintain themselves fairly easily. But the hipster is not set aside from the rest, and since the later 1930s the publicity boys have constantly broadcast his exclusive terms to the world at large, on the perennial advertising theory that exclusiveness can be sold ready-made to the millions. Thanks to the swing craze localized Harlem terms like jitterbug became nationally familiar to American teenagers, and internationally familiar enough for the late Neville Chamberlain to commit a memorable howler by using them. Naturally, therefore, Jive Talk protects itself against the seepage of its secrets to the uninitiated by constantly changing, or else by finding expressions so ambiguous, elusive, or untranslatable, as to be beyond the reach of the squares. More than other argos, therefore, Jive Talk puts a premium on linguistic creativeness and slipperiness. It contains all the fancy dress devices of private languages, rhyming slang, Jack the Bear for Nowhere, the Double Disguise, Bread for Dough for Money, and the like, the never-ending substitution of new passwords into the group for the old codes, e.g. new names for marijuana reefer, muggles, weed, tea, grass, muta, Grefa, charge, gauge, hemp, hay, pot, the use of neutral and general words for highly specific things, e.g. on the stuff, or simply on for drug addiction. But it also contained the deliberate use of language as a game, or perhaps, to use the obvious parallel, as a joint and collective improvisation, rather than a simple means of communication. Hence the odd, lilting, rhyming phrases some of which have been made familiar through the rock and roll craze, which has had similar effects to the swing craze of the later 30s, see you later, alligator, in a while, crocodile, or zoot suit. Hence the peculiar poker-faced phrases which, depending on the situation, may mean the opposite of what they say, he's terrible, he plays some awful horn. Hence, among blacks, the constant, half-defiant, half-self-deprecating, entirely anti-white allusions to and improvisations upon the theme of the race and its internal stratifications. CF the OBS gate-mouthed, shortened to gate, which used to be a mode of address among earlier hipsters, taken from the loose, half-open mouth of the black lounger. In the nature of things a glossary of jive talk is invariably out of date and incomplete. The most accessible description of one of its phrases is in Mesro and Wolf's Really the Blues. The following passages may be quoted, though partly out of date and a little colored up. First cat, hey there, Papa Mez, is you anywhere? Me, man, I'm down with it, stinking like a honky. FC, lay a tray on me, old man. M, got to do it, slot. Gun the snatcher on your left raise the head mixer laid a bundle his ways, he's posing back like crime sure pays. FC, father, grab him. I ain't paying him no rabbit. Jim, this jive you got is a gasser. I'm going up to my dummy and dig that new mess pops laid down for Oki. Various dictionaries of jive talk were published between 1938 and 1945, mostly compiled and tricked out by press agents and the like, the New Cab Callaway Hepster's Dictionary, NY 1938 and later editions, Dan Burley's original handbook of Harlem Jive, NY 1944, Lewis Shelley's Hepcat's Jive Talk Dictionary, Derby, Con, 1945. Their discrimination and value is uneven. I know of no specific dictionary of hipster slang for the 1950s, perhaps because the jazz fellow traveling adolescents of the hipster type have reduced their vocabulary to a few dozen painfully imprecise words. In so far as jive words are not made by analogy or metaphor, or some similar technique, their derivation is often very obscure. It is probably best sought in the specialized argos of the black ghetto, and the borderline zone between entertainment, petty crime, prostitution, drug pushing, and the like, in which musicians earn their living. How far musicians, as distinct from hipsters, use this slang except for its original purpose of jiving, 
i.e. kidding talk, wordplay, and the like is another question. Asterisk. Two other aspects of jazz language are worth a brief mention, the names of musicians and of pieces of music. Musicians have two sorts of nicknames, their own and the ones publicity agents give them. Nobody who plays with Louis Armstrong ever calls him Satchmo or Satchel Mouth, a label much fancied for advertising purposes. He is merely called Pops. Musicians' real nicknames are no more interesting than anybody else's and are almost invariably non-musical, Rabbit, Johnny Hodges, Bubber, Miley, Prez, Ident, Lester Young, Bird, or Yardbird, Charlie Parker, Dizzy, Gillespie, Kluke, Kenny Clark, Bean, Coleman Hawkins, and so on. Of the publicity names only one group is really interesting, the Namstegare of the old-fashioned blues singers, which have the battered concreteness of the anonymous tramp, or the Homeric grandiloquence of the old-fashioned circus Barker and Mississippi Boatman. A list of them makes inspiring reading, Pine Top Smith, Cow Cow Davenport Montana Taylor, Speckled Red, Cripple Clarence Lofton, Alabama Slim, Arkansas Shorty, Big Masio Kansas Joe, Creole Gano, and in a more splendiferous mood, Easy Papa Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, Lightning Hopkins, Homer the Great, Bat the Hummingbird, Red Hot Shake and Davis, Devil's Daddy-in-Law, Lead Belly, King Solomon Hill. The women can rarely compete with the Black Ivory Kings, Bumblebee Slims, and Black Spider Dumplings. Normally they merely change their names, though there are a few proper examples of war paint, Big Sister, Cryin' Ellen, the Yas Yas Girl. The naming of pieces of music is a specialized activity, halfway between jive talk and the naming of race horses. There is rarely any particular reason why a piece should bear one name rather than another. On the other hand musicians and others in the business are under constant pressure to find names for an unceasing flow of new numbers. A great many are named by association with places or people, Royal Garden Blues, Mahogany Hall Stomp, Moton Swing, after Benny Moton, a Kansas City band leader, Sir Charles at Home, after Sir Charles Thompson, pianist, without benefit of honors list. Increasingly musicians have taken to giving such pieces elusive slang names, often obscure to the outsider, sometimes funny, sometimes obscene, sometimes merely sounding good. The modernists, as might be expected, have been particularly drawn to Puzzle Corner, often inventing meaningless or trick titles, Compulsory, Blue Room, Zek, Elusive, Somber Intrusion, Biddy Diddy, Chazanova, all by Thad Jones groups. In recent times a disagreeable tendency towards pretentiousness has also been observable among the avant-garde, Purple Heart, Gregorian Chant, Eulogy for Rudy Williams, all by Charlie Mingus. There is really very little to be said about the principles of inventing jazz titles except that they are increasingly the same as the principles of inventing brand names for products, advertising slogans, or other words and phrases designed to stick in the memory. Older readers may recall that he used jitterbug for a frightened or panicky person, presumably on the analogy of jitters. It merely meant somebody who danced in a particularly active manner or liked to jive in the aisles during a jazz concert.